So good morning. Ah, there we go. And the door is closing. So good morning, everybody. Um, bright and early, um, as we say in German, der frühe Vogel fängt den Wurm. The early bird catches the worm. So I'm very happy that all of you are already here this morning. Welcome to our German-American Trade and Tech Conference. And I'm welcoming all of you here um, on the ground in the uh, wonderful representation of Baden-Württemberg, um, who is our host and also strong partner in this endeavor. And I'm also saying good morning to everybody who joined us online this morning. Um, and maybe you still have the opportunity to hop um, in onto your bike or into your car or into a bus to join us uh, during the day, because I can promise you that we again have a wonderful agenda set up for today. So what we are going to start out with is first a big thank you again to our sponsors and supporters, without whom we would not be able to do this conference. Um, a big thank you to Baden-Württemberg, to Bavu for hosting us. A big thank you to our media partners, um, without whom we also wouldn't have the coverage um, within Berlin, but also internationally, and also to our speakers. And you have seen yesterday, we had a wonderful lineup and are going to have that today as well. And certainly also to our team who barely made it home yesterday night to again hop onto the bike and bus to be here this morning um, again. Um, we are going to have a wonderful program and starting out with a discussion which is a little bit uh, different from what you might usually encounter because you will be asked to participate. But uh, we are going to hear a little bit more about that in a second. We also have breakout sessions today, so if you haven't signed up for them, please do so um, at the reception. And then we have um, wonderful keynotes coming up as well um, and panel discussions. So our first segment is going to uh, be taking a look at the, or taking the pulse of the transatlantic relationship. Um, and for this, um, we have a wonderful moderator. Henning Hoff, could you come up um, and join me up here? <laughs> And, uh, and who was with us yesterday already, um, you know how the spiel works. Um, I always um, ask also our moderator a question, because I think the moderators are doing so much work and the preparation and the moderation, and usually they don't get a lot of applause afterwards. So you de deserve the applause right now. Give him again an applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I haven't done anything. Yeah, yet, I know. So. No, well, well, well. Um, uh, Henning, you are responsible um, for the Internationale Politik, a Politik journal, and for the English-speaking arm of this. Where can all our audience read that? Well, we're in a uh, very happy position to offer our, our all our journalism free, free of charge. So you can 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 check uh, on our website ip-quarterly.com uh, and and read. Uh, four issues a year and also um, uh, various articles which are, are sort of we run in between. Um, we are just sort of putting the final touches on, on our spring issue, which is uh, on the European elections and uh, the EU's future. So um, if, you, if you check now or check next Monday, then you have a whole new magazine uh, to, uh, to peruse and, 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 uh, and read through. And is there anything about the European elections you want to share? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we, we have um, we, are, we are focusing on, on this this current uh, split between uh, France and Germany. Um, it's very damaging. Um, looking also into the further future, whether whether France or Germany or, or possibly both can can actually get their act together and lead Europe in a more efficient way. These are sort of topics we, we are touching on the next mm. issue. And uh, may also say sort of how happy we are to be associated with this conference. I think we are a uh, media partner since uh, 2018. Um, that was the year also when we had uh, artificial intelligence for the first time on our cover, uh, sort of discovered as a, as, as, a, as a topic of international affairs. And um, we, are, we are glad to, to be here. And so it's an honor to, to, to chair the first session this morning. And we are certainly very glad that you are su such a good partner, um, you personally, but certainly also the international politics um, as our media partner. And with this, I hand over to you and to your trusted hand, our panelists. 
Thank you very much, Stormy. Um, good morning also um, uh, from my side. We are doing something which is called a fishbowl, and I don't know whether, whether all of you are familiar with this. This means I have two panelists, and I, I ask them to the stage in a moment, but we also have a couple of you also as panelists joining us where the mic is. Uh, just for a few, few moments, a few, few, few minutes, put your, your, your comment, your question, your observation to the panel, and we, we try our level best to, to address this as well. But um, before we do that, uh, let me uh, ask to the stage um, our two panelists, um, Anna Winger and Stephen Erlanger, please. So, um, the fishbowl is, as, as Tommy already mentioned, on the future of the transatlantic relationship, which of course is a very big beast, um, a, a, a multifaceted relationship, maybe, maybe the one, the most intense one we have uh, on Earth. So it's, uh, we try our level best to, to, <laughs> to, to gauge that, um, but it's of course uh, always only a sort of um, um, a part of the whole which we can, can actually touch on. Um, I think what, what's, what's generally uh, agreed is um, that 2024 is, is, a, is a possibly um, momentous year for the transatlantic relationship. Everyone is looking um, with some worry towards the US presidential elections uh, on November the 5th, um, and the outcome of which might, might uh, have quite, quite a big consequence for transatlantic relations. Um, to discuss this, um, uh, two panelists I would like to introduce to you. Um, um, we are very honored um, to have um, uh, Anna Winger with us, um, an American-British writer, novelist, producer, and creator of global hit television series, including Deutschland 38, um, sorry, 83. Okay. <laughs> Big difference. It was you do 38. I, I do, do apologize. <laughs> Deutschland 83, unorthodox and transatlantic which is honoring or sort of focusing on, on a figure, um, Varian Frey, who's, um, if you pass Potsdamer Platz, you, you heard the name, at least, and Transatlantic is sort of, um, is about his efforts to, um, uh, to rescue uh, Jewish, um, uh, Germans in particular, to, to the United States. Inter alia, Anna has received an Emmy, a Peabody, and an Adolf Grimmer Award for her work. She's the founder of Airlift Productions and lives in Berlin, and since we are doing a fishbowl, I wondered what kind of fish Anna could be, um, and I turned uh, to an expert on these things, uh, my son. And after summarizing Anna's CV, he said that she would be a parrot fish on account on right. its amazing colorfulness, signaling extraordinary creativity. So welcome oh, to the fishbowl, so Anna. Nice, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we're also um, uh, honored to have uh, Stephen Erlanger with us, who is chief diplomatic correspondent in Europe for the New York Times now based in Berlin since uh, last August, after six years in Brussels, starting in 2017. Before that, he was the New York Times Bureau Chief in London from 2013 to 17, after five years as Bureau Chief in Paris, and before that, four years as Bureau Chief in Jerusalem. And this is not his first time in Berlin. He previously served as Berlin Bureau Chief too, also as Bureau Chief for Central Europe and the Balkans, working out of Prague, Earlier, he was chief diplomatic correspondent based in Washington, D.C., and before that, he was reporting from Moscow in the early 1990s, after stints in Southeast Asia, and I could go on for a long time. Um, this is all very impressive. Um, he has uh, two Pulitzers under his belt, in addition to various other honors and awards, which include having been made a Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur in 2013. And if he were a fish, <laughs> my son's verdict was blue shark ah. on account uh, of the blue shark being one of the fish with the widest range across the globe's oceans to be found almost everywhere. So welcome to the fishbowl, Stephen. <laughs> Danke sehr. Before we start and, and, and involve you as well in the fishbowl, maybe let's start with very briefly trying to gauge the transatlantic relationship as it, as it is today. When Joe Biden came in um, in early 2021, there were high hopes in, in Europe, in Germany in particular, um, of a revival of the transatlantic relationship after the nightmare of the Trump years. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's a mixed bag if you, if you look at, at uh, expectations and, and what has been achieved under, under the Biden presidency and also with Europe responding to, to what um, America had to offer. And uh, maybe starting with you, Anna, sort of what is your your feeling, your take of the state of the transatlantic relationship? Well, I think, you know, I'm seeing it from within my own industry and my own uh, creative life. And I have, 
you know, I'm sort of in my work, I sit on a bridge between Germany and the United States in the way um, the projects that I'm making. And I actually feel like there's a very close relationship. There's a lot of openness to what we're doing here. I would even say that there's more openness on the American side to what we're doing here than ever before. There's a lot of American projects that are being shot here. Um, uh, movies and television. And, um, and then, you know, there were three Germans who were nominated for Academy Awards this year. The Oscar season really featured them. Um, I feel like there's a kind of excitement about what we're doing here and a kind of discovery on, the, on their side. So, and I see that also, frankly, in the art world. So it's, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not arguing with you, but I, I would say there are also positive things happening, mm. certainly in, in my part. And what's your explanation? World. Why is, 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 is Europe, why is Germany sort of more interesting today than it might have been earlier? That's an interesting question. Like, why now? I mean, part of it, um, of course, specifically in my industry, um, there was a lot of, there was a big, there was two big strikes in the United States last year in, in Hollywood. Uh, there was an actor strike and a writer strike. And I think there was this uh, sort of many months of time in which people had the time possibly to sort of think about what was happening elsewhere. So that might have contributed to it. Um, but obviously there's also global streaming. There's, there's a, the change in the way we consume TV and movies, which has maybe made, um, there's even a difference. I mean, it's gonna sound so simple, but the fact that people meet over Zoom levels the playing field in terms of who, you, you know, you don't have to be living in Beverly Hills to have a meeting with someone in Beverly Hills, right? So that, I think there's ways in which creativity, you know, people are always interested in what each other are doing if they have access to it. And there's been more and more access to, and that creates opportunities for cross-pollination creatively. Thank you. Um, Stephen, do you agree, sort of, what's your take on the temperature? Um, I agree on the art world. I mean, I think <laughs> things like, Netflix have made, you know, people like me and, and, and others who are interested in more niche things or more interesting things and don't want to watch cartoon characters on screen all the time. It makes it much more interesting, to be sure. And Anna's been one of those people who have fed that very, very nicely. On the political side, I think it's not so schlimm. I think you, you know, what's changed is the Ukraine war. Um, and the Ukraine war has brought um, Europeans, I think, to understand again that America matters to them. Um, we're always going to have tensions. Um, I always th think of the Churchill line, it's better to hang together than hang separately unless that was Ben Franklin. I, I, it was one of those people that everyone misquotes all the time. Um, but I do think um, when you look at this German government, um, its connection to Washington is extraordinarily strong. Um, in a way, there's an enormous agreement between Schultz and Biden on Ukraine, on Russia, on how far to push what to be worried about. Um, there are trade issues that are always going to be a problem. I mean, Biden has kept the steel tariffs that Trump put on, bizarrely enough. Um, there's disagreements over China. Obviously, Germany has a very different uh, understanding of its national interests toward China than we do. I mean, we're a Pacific power. We worry about Taiwan. We worry about Japan. Germany is an export model, and, and, and China is crucial to it. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's no reason to think interests have to be the same. But I think, in general, we share um, a very strong view that the Western world is, is shrinking in size and in influence in a much more complicated world where there are real challenges from, I would call them regional imperialists, whether it's China or Turkey sometimes, certainly Russia. Um, the Mideast is an issue on which the US and Germany actually share very strong views, um, both about the survival of Israel, but also about real doubts about how the war in Gaza 
is actually being exercised. So I think the relationship is actually quite good, um, and we both share, I think, you, you know, a rising kind of strange right-wing movements. I mean, every right-wing is different in every country, and you wouldn't say that Georgia Maloney is anything like Donald Trump or, or unlike the AFD, but I mean, there is a challenge, I think, to our assumptions about how democracies work got, um, going on here in America, in France, in, in the Netherlands, uh, let alone Russia. So it's a complicated world, but I think we see ourselves as very strong allies. Mm. Before we can come to the sort of the, the, the right challenge, um, uh, in both both in America and, and, and Europe, um, there's also sort of been talk for some while that, that American society is changing. And that um, you already mentioned, America is a, is a Pacific power. There was under the Obama administration there was a pivot to Asia, which <clears throat> is still sort of let's put it politely incomplete. Um, um, but is this something which sort of structurally turns the United States sort of automatically away from, from Europe? Or, or would you say um, there's no such automatic? Um, no, it's not automatic. It's just that we would like Europe to take care of itself, you know, because we can't take care of everyone all the time. And yet, you know, as much as we try to encourage this, actually, on Ukraine, it's been America that's had to pull it together with help from the EU, from Ursula von der Leyen, etc. On um, Israel Gaza, it's the US again that's had to pull it together. And I think the US has other fish to fry since we're in the fishbowl. And um, it would like to share more responsibility. And Europe talks endlessly about doing more. So I'd like to see it personally do more. It is doing more, obviously, particularly since 2014 and the annexation of Crimea. That was the great wake-up call. Then there was the invasion of Ukraine, which really set the alarms off, but I think people have hit the snooze button. And um, this is what worries me very, very much. So, yeah, I mean, also the United States, I mean, just last thing, I mean, it's, it, it, Demographically, it's a very different country than 30, 40 years ago. It's it's minority white now. It's 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 not a European country. Full stop. Um, and in terms of racial relations, in terms of Hispanics, in terms of migration, I mean, it's just it's different. So, you have, so even the Republican and Democratic parties are radically different from what they looked like 50 years ago. Um, and that has great implications, I think, for all of us. Mm. And do you also see this in your field, that that um, sort of changing US, changing US society, changing, I don't know, values sort of also impact um, the world of film, television production? It's interesting. I hadn't thought of it the way you just described it, that it's no longer, the United States is no longer a European country. Um, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. I, I think that you know, the United States still sets the bar in a way for in the industry. So there's a lot of ways in which the United States influences what is done creatively in Europe in terms of film and television specifically, um, but, not, but also in terms of how um, questions of identity politics are, are raised and dealt with. I mean, I think there is a very open discussion in the United States that does, does transfer here um, in, in the kind of stories that people are telling that's actually, it's a, in, in a way, I think the United States sets a positive tone for exploring all kinds of things on fil in film and television mm -hmm. in, a, in a good way. Um, but of course, I see what you're saying about, about politics. I mean, that we have similar, in, in, we have similar things going on in both countries mm -hmm. in terms of the development of the the right. It, maybe it plays out differently because our societies are different, but we're grappling with similar issues at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's about time to, uh, to, to uh, invite a, a few <laughs> guest fishes to our podium. I've already seen some, some, some volunteers. Uh, okay. Rachel Tausendfreund is one. Maybe you, you want to join us um, 
And uh, um, while Rachel is coming on stage, maybe one quick question: sort of, how worried are you, um, looking looking forward to um, uh, to the elections? How much? Of a, I'm of a completely stress? neutral. You're completely neutral. What can neutral? I tell you? No, I mean, it's. I, I honestly don't think we'll know until October how it's going to go. Hmm. I think we should stop making ourselves crazy. Okay. Mark Rutte said the other day we should that Europe should do what it knows it needs to do for its own sake that is not really mm. about Trump, but it's about more defense spending, it's about yeah. waking up more to a generational threat from Russia, from uh, Xi Jinping in, in China, to a digital transformation of industry, to decline of, of a certain kind of exports. I mean, these are things that have nothing to do with Donald Trump. Mm. And I think people forget that, you know, after Obama, it was Donald Trump that brought an American tank brigade back to Europe that Obama had pulled out, and that it was Trump who gave Ukraine weapons, which Obama refused to do. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a simple-minded picture. I mean, in some ways, the words are scary, and we don't know, you know, if he's going to be reelected or not. I, I, I don't bet on it. Again, I think we have nine months before we have to know one way or another, and we shouldn't make assumptions. Mm. Do you share this, Anna? So I agree. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's really very unclear what happens next, mm. and we have to wait and see. Mm. And now, uh, Rachel Tausenfreund, uh, who is, uh, full disclosure, um, my predecessor, actually, <laughs> editing uh, uh, a previous incarnation of, of uh, the English edition of International Politik. Uh, Rachel now is uh, um, senior fellow uh, at the German Marshall Fund of the United States uh, with the geostrategic geo strategy team. Yes. And um, so, Rachel, please join us. Thanks, Henning. Yeah, so Henning's going to be nice to me. That's the disclosure here. But. Um, so I have, a, specifically for you, Anna, because you are a parrotfish in, in these circles, right? We talk all, all day about transatlantic relations from a sort of political angle. Um, but, you know, cultural policy, there's, you know, culture has actually a very strong role in politics. And I have a two-part question for you, and that way you can skip one if you, oh, yeah. if you want. Um, but, I mean, all of your projects have been pretty transatlantic. I mean, now the last one obviously even bears the name. Um, is that just by virtue of you sort of, you know, being an American in Berlin, or to what extent do political questions involved in the art interest you? How much do you think about it when you're thinking about a project? In term and you know, I specifically think about this with transatlantic. I mean, there's a there's one can read a lot of really important political messages into what is also a very fun show, um, and I just wonder, do you think about that at all? Related second part of the question is because uh, we were talking about the pivot to Asia, and there's a lot of talk about sort of Hollywood focusing now a lot on the Chinese market. Oh. Um, your projects are obviously, you know, slightly more niche, maybe one could say. Do you think about the different audiences? Do you have a sort of European audience in mind, American audience in mind, or do you, I don't know, you know? Um, okay, so first part, I think I'm a total news junkie. I mean, I, I've read so much of Stephen's work, it's kind of crazy. I, 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 um, I, yes, so I do think about the politics of the projects that I'm attracted to. I'm, I, think I'm, I think even when you're writing about the past, you're writing about the present. Um, I'm, what I'm writing, you know, with whether it was Deutschland at 83 or Transatlantic, of course, is informed by what I'm Current, what we're currently experiencing, uh, um, what, I'm, what I'm thinking about while I'm writing it about contemporary life. Um, and wait, the second part of your question was? The audience. The what audience. audience do you think? I don't actually think that much about the audience in terms of geography. I don't, I just don't see it like that. I feel like the, sort of the great thing about Netflix, for example, as a broadcaster or a streamer is that um, the, the, pro the project can find its audience where the audience is, you know? And I don't, I don't think that we see, as audience members, as a viewer, I don't see it only through my national, through a national filter. So to me, you know, the sort of aggregate of niche audience in the whole world is a lot of people. 
And it's kind of a miracle as someone who's creating content to be able to find those people wherever they are, whether they're in you know, Japan or Saudi Arabia or Argentina. It's the people who respond to the work you know, it's just incredible that they can see it and that they can respond to it also, you know, whether it's through social media or by, or by sending notes. So, I mean, in two parts, I think it's very complicated to design something for an audience, you know? And I, I don't personally do, do it like that. I think if I'm interested enough in something and if it feels relevant enough to me, that there must be other people who feel that way as well, you know, and, that I, I, and the goal is always to... Um, to find them, to make it entertaining enough, but substantive, substantive enough that they can relate to it. Thank you. Um, Thank there you. was another fish uh, volunteer over there, and then there's a lady over there. And since I don't, don't know you as well as <laughs> I, I happen to know Rachel, please introduce yourself. Sure, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm pretty happy to be up here now. And um, my name is Markus Schwenke. Um, I'm from the German Federation of Wholesale and Foreign Trade. Um, that's a pretty big federation representing 138,000 German uh, trading companies, importing companies, and exporting companies. And. Um, I think it's quite obvious that I want to reroute the, 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 the topic back to trade. And um, for our members, um, the United States obviously is, is a very, very important market um, f for, for um, selling products, but also a very important sourcing markets. And that's, that's why uh, our members also depend heavily on, on market access. Um, they depend heavily on uh, free trade and the WTO. Uh, rules and uh, we, are, we are a bit worried. Uh, we are in a worrying modus for or mode for the last uh, years, and um, we are now, of course, looking very closely at what's happening at the election. And um, you ask about the state of the of the of the relations, and um, I, I think the temperature is rising a little bit. I can I can feel that and. Um, I was wondering, and this is maybe a question to, to, to both of you, um, because you have deep insights. Um, um, when Donald Trump uh, was president, uh, we saw the steel and aluminum tariffs. Our members were heavily uh, impacted by the balancing measures of the European Union or the countermeasures, um, because they are importing a lot of products. And at that time, we realized that there was uh, some opposition in the United States. There were a lot many downstream industry uh, companies that that um, that said that these uh, these uh, tariffs on European products and other products uh, they would be also harmful for them um, because they need to the prices were rising and they needed to produce uh, maybe cans or other other products. Um, so w where's this opposition now? Um, I, I don't hear anything anymore. Is there a significant opposition uh, to to the uh, protectionist lobby? Um, and is, will they play a role in the, in the upcoming election? Steve, um, I'm not a trade expert, and I'm not there. But the one thing I do know about Biden and the Democratic re-election campaign, um, he said he wanted a foreign policy for the middle class. That was his line. And he was very eager to restore the faith of trade unionists in America in the Democratic Party and in their relationship to traditional industry. So I guess that's why he kept these tariffs, though to me they made no sense. I mean, they were aimed at China, not at um, Europe. I mean, I talked the other day to the DG for trade in, in Brussels, Sabine Veyon, who's very, very smart and knows what she's doing. And she's very worried about how security has become the new prism for regulating trade. I don't think that has much to do with cans, but it has a lot to do with AI and chips and other things. And she's very worried that this will produce a new protectionism. Um, again, probably first aimed at China. But you see, you know, the American pressure on the Netherlands, for instance, with ASML. I mean, 
other issues. So I think this is going to be around. I mean, the, the, the security prism uh, will stay, and the WTO is not really functioning, right? And, and, it, and part of the reason it's not functioning is because of climate issues, and India doesn't want to discuss climate issues inside the, the WTO, which frustrates the EU. So I think these tensions are real, and um, God knows I have no idea what a Trump would do. I mean, it depends on what his stomach tells him that particular morning and what person he puts in charge of trade. I mean, we do know he seems to have an abiding, strange dislike for Germany. I don't know whether it was because of Merkel or whether it because of his grandfather who wasn't allowed back into the country, a Herr Drumpf. I mean, but for whatever, or maybe it's because he hated all the German cars on American streets. There are lots of reasons, and he certainly felt Germany for a long time was free riding on, a, on American military spending. So if I were Germany, I would, you know, look at a Trump re-election with some concern, uh, people talking about it. But on trade, I think it's all, it's really more about China, China, China. Mm. But, but if you talk to, to, to people in the chancery, they will tell you that um, the, their, their line of argument will be, well, we, all the complaints uh, Trump put forward in his four years, um, we have now good answers to them. Sort of, if you look at the 2% spending goal, we, this has been fulfilled in the, for the first time now. Trade deficit um, no longer there, also, or, or not as pronounced as it was. The German economy is, is weaker. Um, do you think these, these kind of um, arguments will convince? It depends on how he wakes up in the morning, frankly. Mm. I mean, you, you know, Trump is famous for saying his stomach is smarter than a thousand experts. So <laughs> I don't know what his stomach will be saying. I mean, seriously, I mean, he's, he's very unpredictable and he's mm. very transactional, mm. right? So yes, if you do this for me, I get this. Mm. Um, his, his argument about NATO was always about spending, even mm. though he still has in his brain this idea that NATO is a club that people pay dues to, mm -hmm. which is an ide fix in his head that he will never get away mm. from. But I mean, people are doing more, more, mostly because of Russia than because of Trump. But if you frame things in terms of transactional policies, that's what Trump likes. I mean, and Trump likes to feel like he's won and he likes to be flattered. So I mean, I think we know how to deal with Trump, mm. um, but which Trump arrives or doesn't arrive depends on lots of things. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe on, on, the, on the general question of trade, though, is, isn't it that this sort of, um, I, th I think the, this, it's uh, common sense, uh, both parties in, in the United States now say a sort of uh, free trade agreements, um, sort of, or, or trade agreements, the, in the old style, sort of, that's not what we want well, to do is, anymore. This has and been true for a long time. I mean, you know, mm. we now have a national industrial policy, and this mm. bothers some people. I don't know why it bothers the French. The French have had national industrial policy <laughs> for an awfully long time, mm. but this is where we are. This is the economy for the middle class and the foreign policy for the middle class, I don't think that's going to change. Mm. Is it in, 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 in terms of, of cultural relations, is, is, sort of, is this sort of openness uh, to each other, is that also an issue, or um, do you think sort of the way regulations are set uh, could be improved, or? Well, I, I, there's a funny irony in the fact that the most, um, the area that has the most unions in the United States, or like the most successful union, maybe not the most, but a big union area is film. Whereas in Germany, there are no unions, not really not active or powerful unions uh, related to what we do here. So one of the barriers for us in terms of like actually working together has to do with how do you bring non-union structure together with union structure in, in the US. So. Um, it's too complicated to get into it here, but it's like if an American show is shooting here, there's always the, there's, a, there's all these union questions, and it's ironic because the Americans are the union side and the Germans are the non-union side, right? It's like you wouldn't expect that. So I think there are definitely different ways of doing things that are that are uh, regulated that that make it. Yeah, of course, there's things that come come between us. Um, 
You know, I, I think it's very difficult to say exactly what version of a second Trump administration would look like. And I also think it's very difficult to assume right now that that's going to happen. So I, I would proceed with caution on that front. <laughs> All right. I hope that that was sort of uh, uh, um, uh, answered your question to at least to some extent. Um, it, it did. Yes. Thank you very much. Excellent. And I think I had another volunteer over there. Yes, oh. the lady over there. So if you sort of. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. And if you could introduce yourself as well, please. My name is Diana Luna. Um, I'm Latin America Policy Advisor for the Nauman Foundation for Freedom. And as you mentioned, America is not a European country anymore. And talking about migration and having the, the, the coming elections in the States, but also in the European Parliament, um, I would like to know if you see similar approaches to talk about migration. Um, my opinion, I, I am... Yeah, I've never seen that migration has taken such an important role in the American politics, especially in this election. And a lot of people thought it would be a change from Biden policy, from Biden administration, from Trump, but that has not been the case. Mm -hmm. And migration also, it's an important issue on, on the, on the in film industry, on, on, yeah. on entertainment industry. So I would, like to, you to, I would like to know from your perspective, do you see similar concerns in Europe and in the States regarding migration and how that plays a role on the coming elections. Um, yes, is the short answer. Um, but it speaks to a larger anxiety. I think we have a harder time understanding which is a world that's transforming industrially, which means the workforce is transforming, uh, where there are new religious tensions, I would say, in the world, um, where there's more anxiety about national identity. Um, it's fine to have an EU that's a kind of shared sovereignty and a melting pot, but it's a much bigger, more diverse EU than ever before. You feel the strains already in Brussels. Migration is one of the big issues because Europe is not used to this. I mean, it just isn't. It's new phenomenon, and it's going to happen more and more because of desertification, because of um, richer people around the periphery, because Europe's a very attractive place to live. It's a bourgeois paradise to some degree, and people see it on their phones, and they say, yeah, I'd like some of that. Thank you very much. And so how you control migration, because countries have to control it in some fashion. I mean, how you decide what you want. I mean, Germany wants engineers. OK, fine. But not everybody coming from Syria is an engineer. Um, and so I think still you see the impact here. And I'm a foreigner, to be sure. But you know, there's still the Wirtschaften das is still a very controversial issue here. I mean, I mean, what was the impact of this big migration, particularly of young Muslim men, to Germany? What impact has it had on politics, on the AFD, on, on all sorts of issues? And we see that in America, too, because um, um, the, the migration issue is being instrumentalized by Trump Republicans. Uh, most Americans, I think, still recognize we're a country of migration. Right. Um, and but when Trump comes out and as he said the other day that some migrants aren't people, he said, and then he said they come speaking languages no one's ever heard of. Right. I mean, you know, it's it's the tone is ugly and different, um, but it, it speaks to this larger anxiety. You see it in America. Let's see, even in the relationship between American blacks and American Hispanics. I mean, there's a lot of tension over who gets what and who's doing better. Um, and, and that's fine in a big country. But these larger issues, you see it in the Netherlands, you see it in Italy. I mean, you, you know, the right is 
the right is built on, to, to me, this is too simple-minded, but some of the right is built on anxiety and fear of foreigners and of a culture that's being changed and shifted in a way in Europe it hasn't since, you know, maybe 200 years ago. So it's, it's, I think there are similarities. It's a long answer, but it's a very complicated question. It interests me a lot. I mean, I spent a lot of time in France um, writing about the banlieue and uh, laicite and identity. And, and I mean, these are issues that really go to the heart of national culture and sense of belonging um, and the anxiety of, of maintaining a way of life when our economic models are turning upside down. I think add to this issue. So that's a long answer. I apologize for that. Anna, do you also want to come in? I mean, as, as someone who migrated to Berlin. It's true, although I'm not a German citizen because it's still too difficult to become German and American. Right. They keep promising me that that's going to be possible, but I'm waiting for, for that to actually happen. So if this is my chance to say it, <laughs> you know, I'm waiting for double the Staatsbürgerschaft to be something real for Americans, so I've lived here for 21 years. I've paid a lot of taxes. I've produced two German children, so I think I'm entitled. I've also promoted this country worldwide, um, so I, I'm, I'm waiting for, for that phone call, but yeah, so maybe that's, that's my answer to that question, <laughs> but I lived for many years in Mexico growing up. I think about Latin America a lot, and it is interesting how far away Latin America feels from, from here. It, it's, you know, when you're in the United States, it feels so close. It's so much a part of American culture and, and less so here. So it's interesting to hear your perspective. Thank you very much. We've got about 10 minutes left and there's another candidate to join the fishbowl. Thank you very much for your question. And if there's someone else who would like to join after that. Hello, welcome to the fishbowl. I've obviously never done this before because I conveniently sat myself <laughs> in the middle of a row, so apologies <laughs> for that. Uh, Brandon Bourne from the Bertelsmann Stiftung. I work in our Europe program on our transatlantic team. I have a question for you, Anna. Uh, so I came from Washington. We have an office there, Bertelsmann does. And a project that I worked on for a few years um, was uh, Transatlantic Trends, actually with the German Marshall Fund. So shout out to Rachel again. Uh, this is an annual survey publication that pulls 12 European countries, the United States and Canada. And a very worrying trend that we saw year after year was that on questions about reliability, especially um, how reliable do you view uh, the United States or Europe you know, both directions, younger generations, you know, those belonging to my generation, uh, don't view Europe as reliable as older generations do. And, you know, you can theorize on why that is um, for, for a number of reasons. The cultural connections or the connections generally that uh, older generations, especially in Europe, have with the United States and vice versa, it's just, you know, it's, it's rooted in the Cold War. The, the Marshall Plan doesn't resonate with mm -hmm. younger generations, especially in Europe today, when looking at the United States. So I'm curious, um, in your work, uh, you know, the, the, the types of products that you're, you're developing, uh, to what extent are you engaging, do you feel like you're engaging the next generation of transatlanticists? And maybe zooming the lens out a little bit, uh, to what extent, what value do you place on the cultural transatlantic connections when maybe politics at the national level are not are, are less than ideal? I mean, I, I listen, I think entertainment can be very important to, to cutting through those lines. I mean, it's, you know, we're not playing the same instruments as like, let's say the news or, you know, it's, it's, we're telling stories that are first and foremost entertaining, you know? Um, they're set, but they're still set in a political world. And it's a way, I think, of, it's kind of storytelling that I do, I think is a way of making um, 
let's say, political issues or sociocultural issues accessible to young people. So I, if that's what you're asking, I think that's important, yeah. And in terms of the transatlantic relationship, I mean, I made a series called Deutschland 83, actually for Bertelsmann. <laughs> and um, it was for RTL and for UFA. And um, it was, you know, it represented a sort of struggle for what the future would look like in Germany, and that uh, the United States played a you know, big role in that story across the series. We did 83, 86, and 89. Um, and I, but I do see this work as a kind of vehicle for exploring, also bringing um, young people into the stories of the past. You know, when we used to tell, when we used to go around talking about the show, um, for young people, it really sounds like a science fiction, right? It's like, imagine a world, Berlin is divided, there's a wall, the people in the East can't get out, you know? It just, it, it, for them, it's unimaginable, really. And, um, but to explore those stories um, in an entertaining way, in a character-driven way, brings young people into an understanding of what came before them. You know, the, when you're young, you think that it's the beginning of history. We, history begins with you. And there's, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the quote wrong, but I think it's Mark Twain said that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And it's, you know, that's something that I, that I think about a lot in, in the work that I do. So I hope that's a good answer. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I have two more hands up, I think, over there. Gentleman over there, and then there. Maybe you can move already um, closer to the, to the podium, then we um, can sort of uh, make use of every minute we have left. <laughs> okay, right. So we've got three, three more to join us. Thank Please. you. Yeah. Um, I'm Friedrich Paulsen, representative of the German Savings Banks Group. My question is, there was a slight critique on the tariffs introduced by Biden, and you framed it, you called it a middle-class focused policy. And I, I agree from the perspective of trade, it's not positive. However, I question myself, um, is there a positive political payoff to expect from these policies? Because the shrinking of middle class is um, among a lot of books and, and, and literature um, called as a reason um, for, for the loss of belief in democratic systems. Yes. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. I don't know how many of you have managed to wade through Thomas Piketty's book, Capital. It's quite big. It's quite good. Um, you may not agree with his formulas, but his charts about what's happened to inequality since the Second World War are pretty shocking, particularly in Anglo-Saxon countries more. And in a way, Germany sort of is close, it's a bit closer, but I mean, France being the European country that keeps the smallest gap still between the highest paid and lowest paid. But in America and in Britain, it's, it's, it's like this now because of the stock market, because of the tax structure. Um, and it's also true that it, um, middle class incomes have not risen nearly with inflation, that's been true of me too, by the way. My, my salary hasn't risen at all in, as it should have. Um, <laughs> but I'm not really complaining, you know. Um, but in real terms, most people in what you would call the American middle class, the people who build the cars, who, did, who work in industries, are being paid in real terms less than they were 30 years ago. I mean, where... You know, if you worked building a car in Detroit, you could have two cars, you had a house, you could send your kids to college. Mm -hmm. Your wife didn't necessarily have to work. And this is not true anymore. So, I mean, some of this is absolutely real. And it's partly, you know, I mean, I'm sure it's happening here too, but I mean, everyone, there's this whole ar argument about loss of industrial jobs. Is it because of China? Well, partly it's about China. Partly it's just because of automation. Right? I mean, it's automation's done away with more traditional jobs than, than cheap Chinese goods have ever done. Um, but there is a challenge. So, I mean, one does feel that there are, there are uh, export controls going up in lots of places, um, and particularly in, in these sort of new technologies. So I think you're right. I don't have an answer. I mean, as I say, I'm not an economist, but the the political impact is quite real. It's very strong, I think. Um, 
point. I don't know if that's what you were looking for. <laughs> that's all I can say. Yeah, and, and it's, 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 it's consensus in the US, isn't it? It's, it's not a party political issue anymore. No, mm. no, no. I mean, you know, when you look at what the Republicans used to be for, like free trade and so it's just not really true anymore. I mean, that's you know, true. when we, I mean, why did the deal I can't, I always get confused between TTP and TTIP, but I mean... The Trans-Pacific. Yeah, it failed partly because um, the political will wasn't there, but it failed partly because we have such different ideas about regulation, um, and Germans, for the large part, don't trust Americans to regulate things properly. There's a whole different theory of regulation. You, you know, in America, we kind of let things go until people die and then we regulate, and here you regulate to make sure no one ever stubs, stubs their foot. And so in some ways it, it holds innovation back, but it creates a safer world, possibly. Yeah, that was a TTIP um, project. TTIP, TTIP, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right, thank you very much for your question. We take the gentleman, and then we have the young voice to conclude. Welcome to the fishbowl. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter Patterson, um, head of trade monitoring at the WTO. Um, for non-trade guide, Stephen, I think you captured pretty much <laughs> what, what, what things, uh, how things operate these days. Um, the WTO for like 70 years were more or less built on the fact that the Europeans and the Americans provided leadership. And we have a, a vacuum right now. And I'm trying to understand, so what happened interestingly uh, during the Trump administration compared to the subsequent uh, Biden administration is that the tone changed, but the policies didn't really. Um, I've often heard from friends in the US that a good day for them uh, politically is when trade does not appear anywhere on the news. Now, are we Europeans naive when it comes to what we expect and want from American leadership? Do we, do we under, and do the, so, because we think, I think as Europeans, we think that there is a common good, and we think we know, as Europeans, what's good for the world. But are we naive about what the Americans think, and what they think is their role in terms of providing leadership? Um, actually. I mean, it's very hard to say. Um, I think everybody's naive in the sense if you believe, I'm not saying this is what you believe, but that somehow trade is not political. Trade is political. Regulations are political. I mean, um, and I tried to speak about the anxieties working class people feel all over the place, but I think that gets reflected in our politics, which gets reflected in our regulation and our export controls. I mean, we did this very good deal with Canada, Mexico, right, which I think was a, a very good deal. I don't know if it's the last one ever. I, I, I do know, I'm not an expert on the WTO, but I do know the sort of appellate court has been blocked and blocked and blocked. And, and even Sabine Veyland complained the other day to me that, you know, the problem with WTO is everyone complains about it, but nobody's putting real proposals to make it work. Um, and, you know, Pascal Lamy is kind of wringing his hands. <laughs> but, I mean, it still matters quite a lot. But, I mean, even when the Americans talk about China, you, you know, Jake Sullivan talks about putting a high fence around a small garden of, of protectionism, I think, from Europe, it's viewed as a garden the size of Texas. I mean, it's not a small garden at all. It's a big garden. <laughs> um, so naive, I think, is unfair. I think people are pretty realistic. But I think there's a lot of anger in Brussels about American policies, which you know they think are rightly a change from what America's policies were 20 years ago. Um, but as I say, I'm not sure that's going to change. Okay. Thank you very much. And our last participant. Welcome to the stage and um, introduce yourself. Please. Yes. 
Hi, and good morning. My name is Emilia Clarke, and I'm an intern with the Aspen Institute. And um, I recently did my bachelor's degree in political science and international relations in Amsterdam. And I had the opportunity to go to Connecticut for a semester abroad. And something that I really noticed was a difference in, um, in optimism and in mentality. So in the US, I felt like there was an awareness of the issues with democratic backsliding. Um, there was an awareness of the issues in, in the system as well and of the role of the US on the world stage. But there was still a sense of optimism and faith and a sense of not giving up and wanting to do the best to fix this. Whereas in Amsterdam, it felt like a lot more skepticism and um, some sort of a sense of resignation with looking towards the future of the transatlantic relationship as well. And I'm wondering if you have a similar impression and if you think we have reason to <laughs> be hopeful. Of course we have reason to be hopeful. I mean, there's always something we can do to make things, to improve things. I mean, I, of course I'm an American, but I think, yeah, I think you're right that there's a sort of predisposition towards optimism versus a predisposition towards pessimism for many reasons, you know, historical and otherwise. But um, of course we have reasons to be hopeful. I mean, I think the jury is not out on any of it, on, on how things are gonna go. And there are wrinkles in history that improve, you know, and this, we're in a tight spot, but that doesn't necessarily mean that good things aren't gonna come out of it. Do you disagree with me? Yeah, no, I mean, which part of Connecticut yeah. we win? I'm, I'm from Connecticut, that's my Rodina. So. <laughs> um, I was in STARS at the University of yeah. Connecticut. Uh, great basketball team, yeah. <laughs> and known for its optimism? Or sort of well, you know, it's a, it's a college town. No, I do think generally yeah. Americans, you, you know, lots of cliches back and forth, but, you know, Americans see the world as open in, in general, and we have a much less regulated society, which is part of what we actually spoke about. And, and I think in America, people are, I mean, you can in, reinvent yourself. I, I mean, if you basically obey the law and pay your taxes, you're an American. That's all you really have to do, right? I mean, and um, it's why I still think in many ways it is, a land of real opportunity, which is why so many people want to come there, which is why we have this problem over, over um, migration. Um, and, you know, there's always an element of, you know, pessimism, and I, we can talk about all, all kinds of reasons. Um, but in general, I think that's my impression, too. I mean, that, I mean, there's still a sense in America the world is to be made, it's not finished. Um, while sometimes here I get the impression, certainly in smaller countries, I, you know, things are pretty striated. I mean, you're trying to work within a system that is pretty strict. Um, and, um, you know, again, that's an, an exaggeration. But, I mean, just look at the amount of venture capital in America and in Europe, for instance, it gives you a very good idea of how societies look differently at opportunity and at risk. Americans are much more willing to take risks, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. That's, those are my cliches, and I'm sticking <laughs> with <Yeah>. them. <laughs> well, cliche or not, I think uh, it's, it's good to the we end on, on a slightly optimistic note. Uh, yeah. um, uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us. Uh, for, uh, everyone who came, came up uh, and, and took part in the fishbowl. Um, but please uh, join me now in thanking our two panelists, Anna Winger and uh, Stephen Erlanger. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for being such a good panel for you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I hand it back to Stormy. You hand it back to me. Thank you so much, Henning, and uh, to our two panelists as well as to all the fishes who joined us up here. Um, it's hard to follow Henning's wonderful um, moderation with identifying the fish. I've, that was ingenious. Uh, I think I'm going to... Um, 
to take that on for my next <laughs> next moderations. I also want to uh, give our interns and especially Emilia a big applause for being so brave coming up here. Because if you have an Emmy Award winner, a Pulitzer Prize winner, and a publisher, um, it is. I mean, your heart rate must have gone up. So give her especially a big applause. <laughs> And um, as next, we have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. And maybe we are going to move those two chairs a little bit closer to each other, because I, otherwise, um, I'm going to feel far away <laughs> from um, my speaker, Marion Jansen. Um, and Marion, where are you? Um, why don't you join us right here, or me, right here up uh, on the stage? Give Marion a big applause. <laughs> Marion, um, you are the director of the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at the um, OECD. Um, how would you say, what is the OECD? How would you describe it to somebody who doesn't, hasn't ever heard about OECD? Um, the OECD is an international organization of 38 members, and these members consider themselves to be like-minded. And that's an important um, element potentially of the discussion we are going to have that I think will touch on geoeconomics. What the um, countries have definitely in common is that they are all democracies. All democracies. You have worked for many international multilateral organizations. Um, you worked um, for the International Trade Center. You worked for the World Trade Organization, and you worked for the International Labour um, Organization. So you are a true multilateralist? Uh, well, I've become less multilateralist by moving from uh, Geneva to, um, to the OECD. Um, but yes, I'm a multilateralist. I uh, believe in multilateralism, and um, I'm lucky that also the current uh, management of the OECD and its members consider to believe in multilateralism, including in the, trade of in the field of trade that I'm, I'm leading. So strong support in our organization, uh, not only for working together as 38 members, but also at the uh, World Trade Organization. One last question before we sit down. WTO <laughs> seems to be a little bit different than the ILO and OECD as well. Um, and uh, do those work together, those organizations? Um, yes, the organizations do work together, and um, I can only uh, advise anybody who intends to work for IOs or is working there now to change employer from time to time. Mm. It's fascinating uh, to understand, to look at the world from different points of view uh, through um, different lenses. But uh, the important aspect is to always remember that the members of these organizations are often the same. It's only different ministries that are represented. Mm. And that's an aspect we live very closely in the OECD. Uh, the OECD, so that's maybe an additional aspect of that organization. We cover nearly every part of government with the exception of defense and culture. And that means that in the different directorates, we work through something called committees with different ministries. So I work with the trade ministries and with the agriculture ministries. Um, but I have colleagues who work with the ministries designing industrial policies. And I have colleagues who work with the finance ministries that look at industrial policy, for instance, with, from the point of view, how does this affect finance? Um, and this possibility to work across ministries and across countries within one organization, it's fascinating, in particular in current times. Oh, I am sure. Um, we are now going to sit down and talk content, but um, during the breaks, you also need to tell us a little bit more about different cultures of ministries and countries and how that works. Um, but, but please. So we talked a lot about trade yesterday um, and, um, and, and also this morning. And the discussions on trade have changed. Um, if we compare it four years ago to today, um, there seems to be much more of a security element um, in there, or maybe even five or six years ago. We talk more about 
um, French shoring, near shoring, reshoring. Um, we talk about export controls, investment screening. Um, the whole issue, and, and, and often trade is more seen as a liability than really a benefit in those discussions. And when we talk about the WTO, sorry to say that, but um, a lot of times I hear when somebody says I'm still a supporter, then people say, oh, you're so old school. <laughs> you are so naive. Um, times have moved on, or when we hear um, it's, uh, it's the end of change through trade, wandel durch handel, it has proved itself not relevant or not accurate. So the, the mood seems to have changed about uh, trade, and still trade seems to be important. Tell us a little bit about your thinking and also the OECD thinking of what smart trade policy in a different geoeconomic environment and geopolitical environment would look like or could look like. Um, we, we are very actively now looking into this question, what does uh, trade policy look like in this, um, in this new setting, but uh, maybe let me start with answering your question by um, going back to this question of why does trade look so bad. And I would make, like to make a link to the previous session and Piketty's book. Um, when you look at the reputation of globalization, how it has changed over the past 20, 30 years, the the, the benefits of globalization have been questioned more and more. But what I find very interesting is that of the different elements of globalization, I think, for instance, migration, capital flows, and trade, it is sometimes in election campaigns, it's migration that is blamed, and it's trade that is blamed. Never capital flows. And a big change in 1990s and the early 2000s was the opening of capital market markets. Trade had been open before. And if you read Piketty's book, uh, his answers lie in you changing the things book? in the... I even lectured on it. Um, the, change re uh, the changes uh, he asked for lay in the capital markets and financial markets. Um, uh, that leads me to the OECD. Uh, I believe that the BEPS agreement, the agreement on baseline erosion and profit shifting that is, is in the taxation domain, was, would have been a wonderful answer to helping the middle class. Unfortunately, implementation has also slowed down in recent years. But we, go, uh, we move ahead with this. Smart policies what do they look like? We currently look, and we will publish a, um, a, a toolkit on this next week, into what do policies look like for resilient supply chains. We accept at OECD that policymakers are concerned about resilience, uh, which was not the case 10 years ago, um, but uh, really look at, try to help policymakers to think about their role as one that is complementary to the private sector, but definitely not think that they should start to manage supply chains. Um, and second, we look uh, actively with colleagues in other directorates into what is, what is the new look at, uh, at industrial policies, what is happening in the industrial policy space and in the subsidization space. Um, and that's, of course, a topic that is very relevant also for trade. Yeah, absolutely. And we discussed that yesterday as well. Inflation Reduction Act, CHIPS Act, infrastructure bill in the US. But on the EU side, we have the uh, Green Deal um, and everything around us. So we also spend quite a lot. Our national governments do so as well. Um, and um, you are uh, responsible for trade, but also for agriculture. Um, and um, uh, everybody who's from Berlin remembers quite vividly, I think, um, all those tractors uh, on the streets and driving through Berlin after our government said that they would like to take away a little bit of the subsidies um, for uh, diesel. Um, so tell us a little bit about the thinking about subsidies of the OECD. Um, and, and industrial policy, when does it make sense? When does it maybe not make sense? And what is your recommendation also to our government? The, um, the interesting thing uh, in a place like the OECD that you see is that um, we now have committees like um, the committee that deals with industrial policies that is happily very active because there's this huge interest suddenly in industrial policy. And, uh, when I started to work for the WTO, I couldn't even pronounce that term. We were not allowed to speak about this blasphemy. Really? Yeah, no, industrial policy was out. Now it's <laughs> in. Now, um, in the trade committee, talking subsidies now is difficult. And um, 
Um, you may be aware or not that at the WTO in Abu Dhabi at the ministerial conference, there was an attempt to put uh, su the term subsidies on industrial policy into the declaration, the, um, uh, the ministerial declaration that failed. Mm. So it wasn't even, wasn't even, it wasn't even possible to agree on any type of language making reference to this. Um, so how do we look at this uh, now at the OECD? We look at it by saying, okay, we have to look at it first. We have to look at it from three, through three lenses. There are clearly currently members, our members consider there are reasons why they want to intervene more with subsidies um, in particular sect sectors. Let's look at this. Second, we continue to believe that you have to uh, look, deal, make sure that your finances are sound, so don't start spending like crazy. Um, and third, we have to look at, or we continue to believe in international markets, so you should not distort international markets too much. Currently, um, our thinking goes into the direction that um, old rules like uh, first do an effectiveness analysis, what is my objective and how can I achieve it, continues to be true. With the speed at which new policies are being ruled out now, I fear that that's not always done. Second, and that's interesting, also for the trade discussion, in the past there was a strong belief uh, from a trade point of view that policies, spending should be designed as horizontal as possible. Don't target industries, don't target particular areas, because then you may have to choose winners, pick winners, and you may end up distorting. But from a cost effectiveness point of view, how much return do you get for a dollar invested? It may be better to tailor and to target. So what we expect to be seeing in the coming months is a renewed debate on should industrial policy be rather horizontal or are there uh, arguments for it to be tailored and targeted? And if the latter comes through, then this requires in the follow-up a new discussion at the WTO on its subsidies agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and also referring to the T's, um, the good T's about <laughs> subsidies, timely, targeted, right, transformative, temporary, but the targeted is a question, right? That is the question. It's, no? it's a question. That's the one we used in particular during COVID. We focused a lot on the targeted. Um, but uh, because in COVID, you entered into a let's just spend. And that was considered not a potential ways of money. But targeted can be problematic for the WTO. Mm -hmm. And for the subsidies agreement, the existing one is not so keen on targeting. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that um, a few years ago, there was an initiative, the trilateral on subsidies, US, Japan, um, and EU, who tabled some proposals for a well, reform of, of the subsidies and countervailing agreement in the WTO. Um, it's been a little bit more quiet about this, mm -hmm. because I think they are, I mean, we are also now spending so much, so we don't want to be actionable too much. But is there any kind of idea um, in the realm of industrial subsidies to distinguish, as with regard to agricultural subsidies, between those which would be okay, so green subsidies, and those which would be not so okay? In the, in the WTO jargon, they talk about boxes, um, ember box, um, and green box, and so on. Is there a discussion or willingness at all to go into that direction? I think we have changed, um, the discussion on subsidies has changed phases over the past five, uh, four or five years and very rapidly so. The current weakness of the WTO is very much related to the subsidies topic. It was perceived by players like the United States in particular that a country like China is subsidizing heavily, but that for some reason the WTO's agreement cannot bite. Um, and this situation is one of the reasons why the appellate body then was weakened. So the whole dispute settlement system was put into question. So a reform of the subsidies agreement is, would be a key element of the WTO reform. Now, we were moving in that direction, notably with this trilateral discussion, very much with a focus on what are we not able to capture, but what is apparently important. One of the things we noticed at the OECD with our research is that uh, China was using a lot of what we call below finance instruments, um, below market finance instruments. So things that go just through the financial systems and that you cannot capture through the typical type of notifications that the WTO uses. Um, so 
But when, once we reach that stage, potentially to be ready to start talking, our own members started to use um, subsidies more and started to actively use industrial policy. So this has now put this discussion, I think, temp at halt, hopefully <laughs> only temporarily, but uh, things will not become easier. You mentioned agriculture. Do we uh, put, discuss at the same time industrial policy and agricultural subsidy? That's an old question hmm. that has um, haunted the WTO for ages. Every G20 me meeting, uh, when one country mentions industrial policies, there will be another country mentioning agricultural subsidies, and, and we will also have to open that Pandora box mm. in the future. Mm. So um, now comes a hardball question. <laughs> agricultural policies and agricultural subsidies. Um, are, are you, as the OECD, you don't take a position generally, but are you happy with your members' policies? <laughs> oh, we actually do take position. We <laughs> publish every year uh, a report called uh, Monitoring Agricultural Policy Monitoring and Evaluation. So we, we hold um, the, the, the most important um, set of data on agricultural subsidies, actually covering um, 54 countries, I, I, I think, currently. So going well beyond our uh, OECD membership. Um, and the, who subsidizes a lot has changed over time. Traditionally, the EU and the US were in the... In the um, absolute amounts among the biggest subsidizers. Um, China and India have grown significantly in recent years, um, so are definitely also now influencing global markets. Um, now, the way the concept of how do we measure subsidy was developed, was developed from a point of view of how can these subsidies potentially distort markets. Where um, we are not advanced enough, but are currently trying and uh, moving very rapidly in enhancing our understanding is how do these same subsidies affect environmental performance mm. or potentially distributional aspects? Um, so this brings two additional dimensions to the effect of subsidies, ideally um, looked at at the same time, not straightforward, but that's what our members are requesting, and this is what will be useful, even necessary, for future discussions at the WTO, where we would probably want to look at both aspects at the same time. How, dis how potentially distortive, but what is the effect on the environment? We already made a breakthrough in that sense on fisheries. Mm -hmm. We published uh, at, the end of, at the beginning of last year a categorization of fishery subsidies into more or less um, um, effective for the sustainability or harmful for the sustainability of fishing, and we hope to come up hopefully soon, with a similar <laughs> categorization for agricultural subsidies. Thank you so much. And with this, I want to open it up for the discussion, and maybe we uh, collect a few questions. Um, yes, please, the gentlemen all in the back. Um, and Hello. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, one thing that concerns uh, me quite a bit, because I have a bit of insight, is the, the unfair trade advantage of China and India and Africa uh, through corruption. Um, so we just have stand very little chances to get into mining, into rare earths, into agriculture, because we have literally no lever uh, to break the system that they have built with the Chinese and with the Indians, uh, who just move in paying the decision makers over and over again. And uh, we can stand there and complain about it, but, but nobody cares because nobody's being paid or penalized sufficiently by complaining from Europe. Um, so, do you have any idea if there could probably be something like uh, a, a demand to China that we don't buy your goods if you uh, earn them by corruption in Africa or something like that? How can we break up that system? And could you also say who you are? Uh, Sandro Geiken, founder of Monarch Private Intelligence Agency. Thank you so much. We collect a few. Yes, please. Um, Günther Tau from the company TB CTBS Berlin. <coughs> Sorry. I would like to ask you how the OECD is reacting uh, regarding the concentration process um, in the cereal market. You know, Bungie, Dreyfus, Archer, and the Chinese have nearly 90% of the power there. So um, it's a little bit, uh, we are, yesterday we were talking about the the big tech, and we have to take into account that there are big agricultural forces. And I don't know if I saw some 
But you're on that side as well? <coughs> yes, please. Galina. Thank you very much. I would like to add a question uh, regarding climate issues. Um, as the OECD um, was one of the organizations that were asked to host the um, interim secretariat um, for the climate club of the G7 countries, of the actually 38 countries uh, that belong to the club uh, at the moment. Um, can you um, share a little bit of your um, well experience or views on this? Um, is there already some kind of a progress that we do not get from media or from um, well public affairs? Um, I would like to learn a little bit more about this initiative. And with this, I hand back to you. Yeah, let me start with uh, the, the, the corruption um, uh, question. So we do have at the OECD an active agenda on uh, bribery. Anti uh, we, um, are, are the, we take care of the anti-bribery convention. We um, have also an active agenda on uh, um, combating illicit trade, and that work also goes into the uh, corruption space. And we work together with different organizations who fight uh, corrup corruption. So um, what has happened very recently is that that work has, is being upgraded. Uh, so the, and the illicit trade work has uh, become, has received a different status at OECD. And it has moved um, towards the trade discussion. So it's now under uh, my responsibility. Uh, this is because we consider this to be a theme that will move, will be more actively discussed also at the World Trade Organization in the near future. So definitely uh, pay, we are paying attention to this topic. Um, on the area of concentration of markets, this is one of the themes we look at when we deal with, um, with resilient supply chains. I mentioned the toolkit we will launch next week. Next week we will also hold um, a conference, a forum on critical supply chains. Um, where uh, different sectors will be discussed in terms of what is the risks of, um, of disruptions, what are the vulnerabilities in the chains. Agri-food uh, supply chains are one of the chains we look at, and one of the discussions in each of these sectors will be, um, are there dependencies that are such that you depend on individual producers and cannot easily switch to others. Um, so it's an area we look actively into, including for agri-food. What, however, we have uh, witnessed so far um, in the context of the Russian aggression against uh, the Ukraine is that we consider that markets had, that did adjust very rapidly. Um, and there was actually the OECD that uh, was the earliest, uh, the, the first voice out there in the public saying the, that the, the initial reaction, panic reaction in markets was exaggerated and prices uh, went up rapidly. We, uh, f we expected that markets, uh, based on the harvest information we had, stock information we had, that markets would be able to adjust quite rapidly, which is what happened. Um, but it's a space we watch. And, um, and increasingly so in the context of new networks and uh, new forums. On the Carbon Club, so climate change in an open world Dealing with climate change in open economies, if, it, if there's one priority the OECD currently has, this is the priority. And what we need to understand there very rapidly, we need to get a better sense of the trade-offs between what does the possible policy do to distortions nationally, uh, how, how can it distort markets domest in the domestic market or internationally, versus can it be good for the environment. Um, and what do different policies do? For some reasons, some members have different views on should we use carbon prices, should we rather regulate? Um, so we have to get a technical understanding, how do policies compare? And then get members to the table and discuss how can they accept each other's policies or not? Uh, this is what happens in, in the context of the Carbon Club activities, but also in the context of what we call at uh, OECD the IFCMA, the um, Inclusive Framework for Carbon Mitigation Approaches. Um, this is a complicated name, and that reflects a bit the complication of discussions. Uh, so what we hope is that um, we can um, maintain a strong dynamic in the discussions among members. We because the task um, ahead of us is not easy. I, I do expect that having initial talks among 38 countries rather than over 150 is easier. Um, but we 
take this aspect very seriously and we are moving rapidly and a, um, a large amount of our resources in the organization go in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, India is not one of your members. Um, I actually, I'm not sure why, why would they, why they joined, uh, not member of the OECD, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. But uh, you see this in this inclusive framework, like the BEPS, these are um, initiatives that include many more countries than our membership. So the, uh, the tax agreement has nearly global coverage. I think the inclusive framework for carbon mitigation, it's uh, over 80 countries. And uh, the Climate Club is smaller, but it, uh, it has recently been discussed at the, G, at the G20, so it's going beyond G7 now. Mm -hmm. Are you jealous of the WTO that they do have more members than the OECD? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, we are expanding, right? We are yeah. currently uh, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Peru, um, Argentina have accession discussions. Indonesia started accession discussions. Thailand expressed interest. Um, yeah, Peter, I don't know. Should I be jealous? <laughs> uh, I think in the, uh, in the current context, in the current context, um, I think it would be easier in our organization to provide a positive impetus, a uh, positive momentum for many of the difficult discussions that take place. Smaller membership makes things easier. And I, it's not easy neither to agree within the uh, OECD, but it is somewhat easier. And we do what we can to maintain a momentum for a positive agenda, notwithstanding the difficult geopolitical times. Mm. So we are almost at the end of our discussion. So let me end with one last question. Um, we've been talking about the US upcoming US election quite a bit. Um, so um, a brief scenario. Let's imagine um, that uh, Donald Trump is going to win again. And um, he is going to take, um, and I don't know if you all had the chance to take a look at it, but the Heritage Foundation put together a manual of policies. Um, and the OECD is actually mentioned in it um, as one of the organizations better to get rid of because there isn't any sense anymore of having it. And let's imagine that um, Robert Lighthouse is going to move into the USTR office again, and he is inviting you for a two-on-two -two chat. Um, should the US be a member of the OECD or not? They have second thoughts. What would you tell him? Well, I would tell him that um, the Currently, our collaboration with the United States is extraordinarily strong, in particular on the themes that are close to Mr. Trump's heart and, and, and Mr. Biden's heart also. I think the middle class is of concern to both. Um, resilience of supply chain is of concern to both. And um, the creation of the OECD was very much part of a plan to make the United States great. And I think we can be part of the plan to maintain, to keep the United States being a great nation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Marion. Thank you. It's always not so easy if the discussions and exchanges are going well to get everybody back in. So I welcome all of you um, back to um, the second half of our second day of the German-American Trade and Tech uh, Conference. So welcome back to all of you. I hope you enjoyed the lunch break um, and also the excellent um, food which we got um, from the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg. Thank you so much to our hosts. As always, you were a wonderful guest giver. And also welcome back. Um, to our online audience um, who could not join us earlier in our breakout sessions apart from this one. Um, but I hope you enjoyed uh, what you were able to see and that you are coming back uh, right now because I can promise you that this afternoon there's going to be another firework um, of panels and panelists and discussions. And we are starting with one which is extremely dear um, to my heart because we are now leaving the transatlantic bubble, which is is really important uh, to do. Um, I personally am lucky because um, I, through uh, the G20, the Think 20 through the International Espen Network. Um, I can travel to different countries on a regular basis, and I'm going to go to Mexico in a couple of days. I was in India a lot. Um, so I'm lucky and see that and hear 
um, different views on a more regular basis, but not everybody. And that is a risk for us, um, so that we live in our own echo, echo chamber, and we want to break through this. Um, and it was actually not my idea to do this and to integrate it um, into our conference. So, Ehre dem Ehre gebührt. And with this, I want to ask um, our moderator of the session to come up here. Give Sascha Tam a big applause. I do not deserve it. Yeah, no, you do, you do. You, do. Um, you um, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. You have an amazing uh, CV. You lived yeah. in different countries. You are yeah. responsible for different countries at yes. one thank of you. our partner institutions, the Naumann Stiftung. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, for having us all here. It was probably a collective idea that we no, have, <laughs> have this panel. <laughs> yeah, my focus during my career was mostly Eastern Europe, by the way. I was head of the Moscow office of Norman Foundation for a long time, but now I'm responsible for the Americas. We are one of the few organizations which does not divide between North and South or North and Latin. We are the Americas, like the Americans used to say. Yeah, and I deal on a regular basis with many countries when it comes to certain contents and so on. But I'm quite happy to be here and able to discuss our topic with all our experts mm -hmm. from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And do you think we as transatlanticists, do we live in a bubble? Somehow, probably, yes, <laughs> I fear. <laughs> um, I think for many countries, not everything what we are doing is really interesting. And therefore, we have to focus our interests and our views on them and, and their interests. We will not align our interests all the time but we have to know about them and to take them into, into account. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, with, as I said, without you, we wouldn't have this panel because um, you also brought two speakers over here to join us. Um, and yes. with this, I hand over to you and give you the floor and all of you the floor. Thank you very much. And please come, come all over to the panel. As an, um, and we start and I will introduce Everyone here, please Thank take you. your seat last, just like you want. <laughs> you are free to choose, like a famous liberal said. <laughs> okay. Um, great. Um, and as I've said, uh, I will introduce everyone when I ask the first question. And um, we will start with our colleagues from the so-called Global South. I do not like this, uh, this word, uh, this concept very much. At least one of us, as we found out, is really from the South. This is <laughs> Andre from South Africa. But nevertheless, we will start with GT, Mr. Tiwari, as we can call him, he said us, because his first name is a little bit too difficult <laughs> for <laughs> Europeans. And I would like, he is a politician, an opposition politician in India, and he is an entrepreneur, which is also very important in the education sector. And GT, I would like to ask you, how much for a country, how much is the transatlantic dialogue, the transatlantic relationship important for a country like India, a rising power, the greatest country in the world by population, or isn't it of any interest for you? Good afternoon. Thank you for this uh, fantastic uh, forum, as well as uh, the enriching discussions that have happened. Um, I must admit that when I learned about the topic, I had to Google what Global South is. And <laughs> so to give you an Indian perspective, um, this is the first uh, few days in this month that I haven't heard anybody speaking about Indian elections, uh, which start any time uh, from now. Uh, there are going to be a billion voters voting in the <coughs> Indian election. And if democracy was a continent, then one can imagine, and as we discuss about uh, freedom of speech, the way uh, democracy is at risk, we need to look at, in that continent of democracy, who are the citizens of, of this democracy? What is their value system? How are they getting impacted, if not with the idea of transatlantic, but what is happening in the uh, nations in transatlantic, what would happen in the US election, what's the kind of dialogue that will emerge, how technology, AI will shape that election, European Union, the tensions in uh, Russia, Ukraine, the 
confusing voices emerging from the transatlantic with respect to Israel-Gaza uh, war that is uh, very, very tragic. So from the Indian perspective, we have a nation which is very large going to, going to vote. Um, any number you take on India is a very large number. 1.2 billion users of mobile phones, 600 million users of smartphones. Uh, nearly 40% of all transactions are digital now. Um, 300 million users use digital payments. Uh, around 50 million businesses, small businesses, use digital payments for some numbers as low as 10 cents or even 5 cents. So that is the, the geography that uh, India is as part of this, this global south. And for us, what is very important is that as we look at, at mature democracies, what is the value system that exists between these two uh, transatlantic and global south? Um, when you look at press freedom, how is it reflected in a mature democracy to be able to push press freedom in India? When you look at, at uh, labor force participation for women or leadership for women, how is it reflected in transatlantic to be able to push a case for India? So at one level, transatlantic matters because uh, you are looking at values that you want to see progress in your own dem uh, democracy. At another level, there is a need from transatlantic to recognize that there is a vibrant democracy that is building up that has uh, these huge numbers. For example, um, there are around 400 to 420 million Indians which, who are under age of 14. So if you have to look at the stakeholder of the new world, um, India is a place to, to look at. So it's a, it's a dialogue between the value system, and it is based on that we would know um, how the transatlantic relationship will emerge, which is slightly different from a tech and technology dialogue alone. Thank you very much. Next, Valeria, you have a radio show on a daily basis in Mexico. How often do you discuss transatlantic stuff there? <laughs> and <laughs> the USA and Europe, mainly Europe. Well, thank you, Sasha, and thank you for the invitation to join you here. I might say never. <laughs> no, I mean, I talk about economics, so when I talk about Europe, it's not about Europe as a whole. I talk about what happened, you know, with the exchange rate or what happened with the uh, interest rate in the UK or what happened with inflation, but at very specific points. We usually don't talk about Europe as a whole. And the difference is maybe, and we were discussing this idea of the global south, this is my third time in Germany for the past, I don't know, maybe eight months. And the first time I heard Global South was here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't Google it, but I asked it, like, what are you talking about? What's the Global South? Because, and they talked to me, in, I'm Mexican, they talked to me as if I were from the Global South. And it's like, well, Mexico is in the northern part of the <laughs> hemisphere. I don't understand what you're talking about when you say Global South. Of course, now I get what you mean by Global South. And the difference maybe is that when you talk about Global South, you take a whole bunch of different countries and mix them up yep. and talk about the same values or the same ideas. And for me, that's so strange because we're, I mean, you consider Mexico and India and South Africa maybe in the global south. I can't think of more different countries maybe. Um, and when I talk about Europe, I don't talk about Europe as a whole. I usually pinpoint mm -hmm. different countries or specific countries. So the idea of you know, splitting the world into east, west, uh, north, south, I think uh, maybe, of course, it simplifies our vision of the world, but it's not real. Uh, even when we talk in Mexico about Europe, it's very different if we talk about Spain or the UK or, or mm -hmm. the UK. Last time I was here, I asked something to the security guard in the hotel, and he told me like very keenly, the UK is not in Europe. I was like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so even that we can't agree upon. So things are much more complex, and what we're seeing within the values <laughs> and the democracies that are part of these different regions are so different. I was listening to the previous panels and they were talking about the OECD and 
the, the vision of shared values in these 38 countries. And suddenly they, uh, she started talking about the countries that were aiming to join the, the OECD and Argentina and Peru. And I was like, oh, are they democracies? I, I, it's just a question. You know, it's like, it's just a question. And sometimes we try to bundle things together in order to try to explain ourselves, mm. those countries or those different values. And we're oversimplifying mm. the issues. Uh, I think reality is much more complex than that. Okay, thank you very much. Andres, you are the only person on the panel, yes. really from the south. <laughs> <laughs> from the, from the south. What's your, your perspective on, on this discussion? Because we, we all also discuss Africa as a whole here in, um, <laughs> here in uh, Germany and in Europe, also as a whole and as something which has to be helped by us somehow. Is this a perspective you like? <laughs> thank you, and thank you also for the invitation. It's a privilege of being here. And yes, uh, it's interesting to listen uh, to my co-panelists here. And now I have to put a caveat in there, because I'm from the South African Embassy. I think I must be a little bit more measured. Um, <laughs> so yes, indeed, I'm from the South, but it indeed also links, give us to try and respond to your question. Uh, from my surname, he will deduct that I actually, my great-great-great-grandfather came from the Netherlands, went down to South Africa. I think it was around, uh, around about 1790, 1786 or something around. I wasn't there. Uh, it's alleged <laughs> that was at that time. Um, so, and I also served, served in New York uh, at our permanent mission there, and there I was privileged for the first time ever when South Africa chaired the grouping that we call the G77 and China. Uh, and when the group was created, uh, roughly around the year that I was born, which I'm not going to say that now, but um, the, when it originated, it was to give countries of the South uh, that's got a, a specific developmental path and specifically also a post-colonial or at that time it was being part of the post-colonial era to give them a voice. Um, so serving in New York, I had the privilege then of South Africa uh, chairing the first time uh, the G77 and China where you will then negotiate with the global north or Europe. And yes, Mexico was not, is not part of the G77, um, but uh, we did have good relations. Uh, apart from bilateral relations, Mexico or, or was, was a good sounding board. The point I'm trying to get at is, indeed, it is not as an easy geographical uh, distinction to be made. Uh, there are lots of differences. South Africa is part of BRICS, as you would know now, the BRICS Plus. Uh, South Africa is also the only African country that's part of the G20. Um, South Africa is obviously part of the African Union. Um, and yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. I even had it myself when people come to me and say they hear I'm from South Africa and do I know his friend who's from Nigeria? So, you know, <laughs> I said, yes, yeah, just next door. Uh, see them every weekend. Um, so I understand that that uh, 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 is, is sometimes a bit confusing, but ultimately what it's about uh, and Getting back to your first part of the question um, in terms of the transatlantic, how does it influence the South? Um, for us in South Africa, we've got an open trading system at, at, at one. And as you can see, because we're part of the G20, part of BRICS, um, served on the Security Council three times now, uh, we see ourselves as being part of the global uh, community in which you would like to explain what you asked about. Do we speak en enough about the, uh, the global self? Um, do we understand the global self? And I mean, I can only speak for South Africa as much as I said, do we part of that and, and we're proud of being part of the global self. Um, South Africa would want to see a global community that is more responsive to the needs um, of the, uh, and aspirations. I'm actually glad that you mentioned that you said that it's something that you have to give to. 
uh, that you so sometimes have to help. And, and um, so, we, yes, we have our own developmental challenges, absolutely. And we're so grateful for, amongst other, my current host, Germany, for uh, the good cooperation that we have on various fronts. Um, but I think South Africa and the Global South has lots to share. Um, you know, I think uh, not only about, um, please do try our South African wine, so it's not only about South African wine and the beautiful beaches that we have, but we would like to see uh, uh, being part of a global community where the aspirations and dreams of uh, more than uh, my colleague from, from India has uh, correctly said about the number of people living in India, but if you look at the global south uh, and the BRICS plus for that matter, you're looking close to 50% of the global uh, population. So we think we have an input to make to help all of us uh, so that our children in the future can live in a world of peace, security and freedom. Thank you very much. Güde, you are a member of parliament and even a leading member of parliament as a deputy chairperson of the parliamentary group of FTP. What can Germany and what can the European Union do to improve the dialogue and to improve the economic and political relations with the global south? Are we, shall we do something alone as Germany or shall we act only as part of the European Union or as part of the bigger thing, the, the West, the transatlantic partnership? Mm -hmm. um, thank you uh, for inviting me. Thank you also for the perspectives uh, that have been maybe from an Indian and uh, Mexican and the South African perspective. Um, I'm from the very north of Germany and even the south of Germany is different to the north. <laughs> and um, in, in the light of that very broad question, I would like to um, maybe uh, pinpoint certain things I think we could do on a parliamentary, from a parliamentary perspective, but also from a, um, let's call it from a human perspective, yeah, what, yeah. what could be done. Um, I think that um, also post-COVID, we should be traveling more as parliamentarians mm -hmm. and not just to countries that we used to travel to. Um, I was um, um, chairwoman of the um, Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid in the past legislative term. And we, also, we were one of, the, one of the only committees that actually traveled to countries um, that are maybe a little bit aside from the mm -hmm obvious agenda um, um, countries um, the, the Bundestag has exchanges with. So I would say um, that should be done more. And if we are there in countries that maybe fit the frame of the global south, I don't like the frame yeah. either, um, we should be listening more. We should not be patronizing so much. And I think from a p parliamentary perspective, what comes to my mind, um, I, I have been to South Africa, I haven't been to Mexico, I haven't been to India yet. Um, so um, we need to listen in order to understand that there are always different perspectives, not from the global south. Um, and so there will always be a German perspective on things, but Germany, I think, should always be urged to put it into a European perspective mm -hmm. and maybe on, on a broader sense um, to a uh, democratic perspective. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, in these times, I think it is about uh, the concept of democracies sticking together, not sharing every single point of view, but sharing the perspective um, against the concept of autocracy and yeah. what is at stake at the moment. And maybe um, a very last point, um, it's not only about parliamentarians and politicians exchanging views, but also about people exchanging views. And as I'm also dealing with um, education in, in, um, in my current position, um, I think we should um, promote projects that um, people, students come together and um, India is um, one very good example where um, people from the educational perspective should look towards mm -hmm. because um, I think Indians do the same, but we have to counter that, um, that uh, 
narrative that we need to be interested in what India thinks, what Indian students also Many want things. for their future. And the same is true for Mexico or for South Africa and um, countries where we need to have language skills, perspective, what is happening from their point of view. And I think we should promote that also on a political level. Thank you very much. Jürgen, you have a long professional experience in, in politics, in policies, in global organizations. What can be done from your perspective on this level, on the level of global organizations, international multilateral organizations? Because one of the arguments, for example, the BRICS countries always bring forward is that they do not have enough influence there. They would like to have more influence at the IMF, World Bank, and, and so on. What's your take on that? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, I mean, there is the word in, uh, in, in, in the room, Germany is punching below its weight. Mm -hmm. This was the result of the uh, OECD review. I think that's what many resent. And um, in a way, I think we improved, uh, but um, still I think uh, it's uh, partly true. And I was struggling my whole life with that. Uh, what to do to better engage. It's not about, you know, striking on the table and no or yes or whatever. It's about engaging. It's about bringing ideas into an international dialogue. And I think there we still have problems. Uh, it's partly historical. It's partly our focus on e economic competitiveness and export competitiveness. Um, it's about our federal uh, structure. Um, and of course, a part of the problem is the European Union, where we could have more weight, um, but uh, still we didn't see the Hamiltonian moment where more competences are given to, to Brussels, in particular in the fiscal space. For example, I, I was um, executive director at the World Bank, Europe aggregate has 32% of shares and, and, and voting shares in, in the World Bank. Yeah. The US has between 16 and 70. The US, you know, when the US raises uh, the voice, everybody is listening in the management. When Europe is raising the voice, it's like, <laughs> what do they mean? And therefore, we try to bring it together. But we have to, if we want, to play a more important and positive role, we have to look at those issues. You know, it's important to travel and to engage, of course, but we have to look at those hard issues. Yeah. Yeah? And it doesn't come without trade-offs. And there are many ideas we could uh, launch then. For example, one I personally launched in the World Bank, and now the government uh, is, is so much behind this, is the reform of the multilateral development banks. And I think it's in the interest of Germany that we better prepare for crisis, we prevent crisis. So our interest is to uh, bring development and crisis prevention, global public goods together. That's our interest. And you have to change the, the multilateral landscape if you want to do that. And that's what we tried to do. And it was a good start. But I think we have to have more of those uh, initiatives. And we have to be aware that all the problems we have here in Germany, which are so dear to us, which are so important to us, climate change, loss of biodiversity, fragility all over the place, they are closely linked with development. Even, you know, poor countries, I do not talk about the, uh, the Chinas or so, the, the higher middle income countries, poor countries will emission two-fifths of uh, greenhouse gases in 2030. So we have to look at those uh, countries in all those issues, global health, biodiversity, um, uh, and, uh, and climate and other. Thank you very much. Next. Nicolas, you wrote a book about six phases of globalization. And you asked who wins and who loses, and give some answers on it. But, but what can we do that everyone or every country wins and almost no one loses? 
Well, the problem is that there are six different views, at least, <laughs> <laughs> on, that, on that question. What I just want to talk a little bit about the background to the book. When I was studying in the early 2000s, the main critiques of globalization came from the global south. They came from India, from, from other developing countries who saw the, the multilateral institutions as a continuation of, of, of essentially a neo-colonial project. And then in 2015, 2016, something really interesting happened, that the West, who had created uh, many of these institutions, who ha had been the main promoter of, of globalization, suddenly turned on its own creation. And, and you had all these different critiques emerging of globalization from the right, from the left, from the environment movement, from the security sphere of, of globalization in the West. And what's really interesting about that, that it totally scrambled uh, the debate. Um, and, and suddenly we had, for example, in 2017, we had uh, Xi Jinping in Davos, styling himself the defender of, of neoliberal globalization and, and, and the West um, being, being in retreat. And what's, what's really interesting to see in looking at the different narratives, the different critiques of globalization, is that there are many parallels in, 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 in the global south and in the global north. We have um, boosters of globalization, especially among the elites in the, in, in the, in the global south, that the same that we have in the established parties in, uh, in the West. We also have critics on the right and the left. But then there's some narratives where we have mirror images. Um, so for example, the Trump narrative the, about the decline of manufacturing, it's mirrored in Asia by an, a narrative about the rise of Asia, right? Or this geoeconomic security-focused narrative that we have now emerging, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe, it's mirrored in, in Russia and China by a concern about Western hegemony, right? So these security arguments are mostly seen um, as a pretext for protectionism or an attempt to, 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 keep, um, to keep the non-Western countries that are rising down or, or out. And there's a, a strong perception of hypocrisy on the part of the West. This idea that the West wrote the rules and as long as they serve the West well, we, we, we ask everyone to obey them and the moment they don't serve us anymore, uh, we, we, we step back from the rules. So, so the debate has been scrambled, and we see that very clearly also in institutions like the World Trade Organization. We, we tend to think of the West uh, as somehow opposed to China, but when we look at debates, for example, around the disbesettlement uh, system in the World Trade Organization, it's really the EU and China on the same side and the US is on the other side, right? So the EU and China are trying to protect the system or reform the system as it was, and it's the US that's saying this no longer works for us. And so we have to be very careful um, when we look at the lawmaking process, for example, India often stands against China and other developing countries, right? So it's, it's a very scrambled picture, very different views about what the benefits and, um, and of globalization are, and they don't necessarily align with the global north, global south uh, dividing line. Okay, thank you. One more question from my side uh, before we go to the audience. Um, we've talked a little bit about international organizations as well. I said WTO, IMF, World Bank, and so on. GT, are those organizations still important for India and for other countries? I will have the same question for yourself. Or are you looking more for alternative organizations, like, for example, in the framework of BRICS or other regional projects? What do you think? Is w, does the WTO, does the IMF, do all those organizations have a future, a good future? I think one can have where we stand uh, today in the world. One can have a gloomy view of what is happening with, with various elections and wars, but I have a fairly hopeful view. I think that uh, if we think of a future first vision for the world. It's important to let go of the, the past first vision and the nomenclatures of the past and the organizations that came from that. <coughs> future first vision would look at aspirations of youth. It will look at uh, the income mobility of poor and middle, not necessarily poor and middle income countries, but, but people who are in poor and middle income classes. It will look at the, uh, the uh, rise in values such as diversity, inclusion, uh, freedom of expression, press. When I look at uh, European Union, uh, I visited Brussels in 2014 as a EU VP invitee, and it was surprising to see uh, united in diversity as one of the, the themes at the European Union. Um, growing up in India, we grew up with the slogan that unity in diversity. So at some time, uh, we are at a stage, if we took a look at a future first vision, there are a lot of common themes that are emerging. Um, 
it would definitely require establishment of peace. And as a result, one has to be critical of the organizations that have existed in the past have, and have not been successful in at least articulating an agenda for peace in the current situation where war is going on, and even putting uh, both perspectives on table. So to your question, I think it is important that in a world where the global south, even if we adjust to that term, uh, is not a knowledge-scarce world. Now, with technology, knowledge is available uh, everywhere. It's also not a, a world which has a different value system when, when we look at democratic countries in the global south. It's the same value system that Transatlantic is talking about. It's also a, a, a space where the aspirations of the youth cannot be fulfilled without proper trade uh, agreements, uh, because there is consumer everywhere, and the consumer wants the best that the money can buy. Uh, it's a place where tech, everybody is looking at technology as a way to progress better in education. Um, you will be able to achieve education of a future generation at a, a fraction of the cost with digital content and other things. Um, with the fintech and, and uh, digital money, it's easy to distribute benefits. Corruption goes down. Clearly, India has a number of examples to show. With digital health, the access to knowledge, both uh, in this particular case, uh, countries like India would be a supplier of human capital in healthcare and knowledge in, in, in healthcare. We have seen in the COVID times that how India has led the provision of vac vaccine to the world. And today, if you look at the WTO vaccines, 70% of, if my numbers are not wrong, 70% of vaccines by WTO come from India. So I think the world is changing, and we have to build, think about, creatively think about the building blocks with a future first vision rather than a, a rear view in sight. Thank you, GT. Valeria, you are, how do you, how's your take on, on the WTO, or is everything regional much more important for your country, especially in your situation? As, GT, your was, as GT was saying, the, the world is changing, and yeah. what I see from these organizations, WTO, or the World Bank, or the IFC, or the OECD, mm -hmm. is that there are great sources of information. They're amazing in order to produce information, and we all use the information they produce, but they are very slow to adapt. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that the world is moving at a rate, technology is moving at a rate, innovation is moving at a different rate, and then the World Bank reacts, or there the OECD says something. Or, so they're very, as every institution that becomes too large, they are very slow to adapt. It's like moving very slowly. And economists from the global south, or whatever you want to call them, they're moving faster in a way, in, in different system. ways. Yeah. They're Absolutely. transitioning yeah. differently mm -hmm. than these organizations. I think that regional agreements, such as in the case of Mexico, the USMCA, our trade agreement with Canada and the US, has become much more important, mm -hmm. even for the economic structure and the political structure of the country, than what the World Bank or the IFC or these huge organizations. Our trade agreements are the ones, or our main trade agreement, which is the USMCA, is the, the one that dictates it's kind of, you know, it's, it's even more important than just trade. Because in that agreement, we have a chapter on corruption. In that, in that uh, agreement, we have a chap uh, chapter on SMEs. In that agreement, we have a chapter on gender equality. So it has become the new standard of trade agreements. It has much more included yeah. within the agreement than, quote unquote, just trade. Thank you. And Andres, your take on on this, on trade and global organizations. Thank you very much. Yes, I think <clears throat> I will once again want to raise the point that was made, uh, that kind of came out of the G20 statement in New Delhi last year, in terms of support for the WTO. Um, so South Africa is part of that group that wants to have a multilateral system based on uh, fair and basic rules that respect the inputs of everybody. Um, so for us, the WTO, the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions, um, the global institutions, uh, we're very uh, supportive of that. As a matter of fact, the last BRICS summit that was held in South Africa, mm -hmm. it was again raised that South Africa and the BRICS uh, participants at that time, it was not the BRICS plus then, but um, were supporting of the UN uh, multilateral global governance systems. Um, 
but what I need to just latch on to, to the reference of, of COVID. What is important for, for South Africa, and I think I can speak for the global south as much as we <laughs> difficulty in, 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 in defining it, but what happened during COVID, and my president did make this statement in Paris uh, at, at the conference there, where he was expressing um, the challenge that we had during COVID, which was a global, global phenomena. But what happened was that countries of the North had the, value, the, the financial means to buy the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the Global South did not have the same access to those means. And we really felt like orphans, if you will, uh, addressing a global phenomena that affects everybody. And um, from a South African perspective, when our scientists have identified the additional strain that uh, developed during that time, what did countries of the North did? They immediately slapped uh, visa restrictions on South Africa, as if the strain was in South Africa only. It's that type of thing that we want to have at the global level being addressed in a more respectful and a fair uh, uh, approach that will make the world going forward and dealing with these global challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Güde, we j just, just heard that the developing countries or many countries, the global south, whatever, is moving sometimes faster than we can, than we can do it in, in Europe or in the global organizations. And my feeling is very often that we are too slow even in small things, for example, like uh, regional trade agreements. I remember the strange story with a trade agreement with Canada and the ratification process. Now we have the Mercosur uh, issue and we have some other trade, trade issues to deal with where we can deal with on a regional level. What, what can the Liberal Party do or what can our parliament do? To, to speed up the process in a Europe where trade is decided at Brussels and not primarily at, at, uh, in Berlin. Well, still, we, we need to prepare to yeah. make Brussels be prepared for the actual voting mm. and preparedness process. But um, yeah, I think we need to be faster. I think it is not so much, um, well, within the Liberal Party, you do not find many people who are not in favor of yeah. more free trade. Um, I think sometimes it is um, the, uh, the way that um, also this coalition looks towards free trade and sometimes there is not a one size fits all mm. framework and sometimes I think we could be faster if we would focus on the actual free trade um, agreement and not so much adding yeah. more and more yeah. to the free trade agreement that then gets an overload on certain mm. other things that are all important, don't get me wrong. Um, and so far, I just talked to a colleague yesterday um, with regard to Mercosur and where we are at the moment, because it's not on my, um, on my um, 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 on table at the moment, but he said, Germany is actually done with the process. Yeah. We have been doing everything we could, and now it is Brussels' turn. And it's Paris, um, and Paris, and Paris, um, <laughs> and, and, and Paris' turn, actually, yeah. But um, if you ask us as free Democrats, there should be more free trade in order also to, and with all consequences, also for German or European companies, if that means that uh, companies from from the global south, from other countries, could um, get easier market access here, um, that should be a good consequence and good side effects because we are more intertwined um, and that actually brings more strength, I think, to the whole world economy and that's what we can shape and that's what we'd like to do more. Thank you very much. Before I open the questions to the audience, Jürgen, you wanted to to comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I can. <laughs> I mean, one thing is the European Union again, um, because I think the question in the room is also um, strengthen US, European, German relationship. But I think the US would love to see 
a stronger actor in Europe doesn't want to see, you know, <coughs> 27 voices which are not aligned very often. So I think we have to get that act together. The second point is multilateral institutions are important. I mean, when you look at all those challenges, I mean, there is no alternative uh, to, to that. What, what shall we do? I mean, just let it go. The question is more... Uh, the governance of these um, of these multilateral institutions, and uh, there, my experience at the World Bank is quite good. You know, we had, for example, with my Chinese uh, colleague, uh, when we had tough disputes in the board. Afterwards, we went down in the in the executive dining room. We had um, lunch together, and he was explaining to me what the landscape in pitching is looking like. You know, there's this actor, that actor, and, and we tried to find solutions uh, to accommodate the different. That's what we need. But we still can uh, improve. And I think a very important institution is the G20. People said uh, with Russia, now the G20 is dead. The G7, I mean, is important, but it's not a global uh, yeah. institution. We need something like the, the G20, and very often, if we have a problem in the multilateral institutions, the G20 has to take a kind of position, and then it deblocks uh, the negotiations in those institutions. I think it's difficult, um, but uh, that's, uh, that's the situation. Uh, and I think we, we have to face it. And um, there are solutions out there. I could give you some 10 possible initiatives yeah. we, we could take. You don't want me to do that. Not at the moment. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Just a very quick comment. I just found it so striking to hear what you just said, that we want more free trade. And yesterday we had in the very same chair your colleague uh, from, from, from the Greens, Mr. Audrey, saying exactly the opposite. He was saying, we need the jobs here, we need the steel jobs here, the car jobs here. So, and that's the fundamental paradigm shift that has happened over the past, uh, over the past couple of years, that, that we moved from the, yours was absolutely the majority view to a, a view where in the US and in many parts of the government, um, your colleague, Mr. Aldridge's view, is the majority view. And this fundamental paradigm shift, I think we have to be conscious of. It's, it, there's simply um, the way the Western governments think about global trade is no longer liberalization is, is great. They're much more consciously thinking about what um, is the global division of labor that we want. And the reason for that is China. So there's really a time before China when we could say, well, let's have free trade, let's compete. China has made this big jump uh, to, to, to the top of value chains, and now the West has second thoughts and really thinks, okay, now we have to intervene much more actively in, uh, in global value chains or in, in supply chains and make sure that we still get our piece of the pie. Agree directly. Yeah, just, just a quick note on, on, on China. I think the problem is that if we, if we apply the concept of free trade, um, it is not pick and choose by China, it, free trade also follows rules and has a set of rules. And I think the, the, the challenge with negotiating with China, um, everybody maybe has very own perspectives when it comes to that, um, is that they, uh, not they, China always tries to um, get the best out of a deal, but only from the Chinese perspective. and. I think when we talk about free trade, uh, we, we need to have our interests set up first and then pay attention towards the perspective of China if we, if we negotiate and that our green coalition partners have a different view on how free trade should be organized in the future is maybe one part of the, the answer to why it's taking so long sometimes. And I'm very happy that we are where we are with Mercosur. Um, but uh, Chancellor Merkel, for example, um, had um, the deal towards the, um, the CAI, uh, the, the uh, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment with China on the European level. Basically, she had it all prepared and it needed a European Parliament's perspective and the way China dealt with with international law to, to take that back. So German perspective is very, very uh, broad on, in, in a sense where, 
where do we have to sign when it comes to... Um, I, I, I'm missing the point. I just wanted to make a quick notice, but I think um, negotiating with China on a free trade level is basically not possible at the moment. But we should not apply that on every other country where these trade agreements need to be possible in the future. Thank you very much. Now, now I would like to open the floor for debates. We have two. Uh, you've been the first, probably, uh, in the last. Oh, yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, Victor Vox from INSM. A question to Mr. Lamb. You talked about uh, European hypocrisy, and you described sort of a shift where you said China and Europe are defending one model when the United States is actually defending the opposite one. Can you explain that a bit further, what that means for the future? And also um, tying in with what Ms. Jensen said in terms of getting an okay from Paris and Brussels for further agreements. Um, what's, what your take is on strategy in that respect? Thank you. Because we have only 10 minutes left, as I understand, or 11 or something, we take some questions and then ask you. Because Henning Kumba is, is next, please. And then the we go to the other half over there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Henning Krumrei, advisor for politics and economics. I remember the last visit of uh, Brazilian's President Lula uh, in Berlin, and he complained about the negotiations for the Mercosur agreement, and he said he, was, uh, he is tired of uh, European governments as well as NGOs that they tell uh, Brazil what is good for Brazil. So are we witnessing a new kind of, let's say, ecological and social imperialism? What's your take on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we take the, the other ones. Was there? The gentleman in last? Yes. Hi, uh, Tashar Shetty uh, for The Diplomat magazine in Washington, D.C. Yeah, uh, my question is, um, I think a lot of the panelists from the Global South have talked about a greater need to understand the perspectives and the aspirations of the people from their countries. And this um, organization, as well as some organizations have attended, like Atlantic Puka, have a multi-tiered stakeholder interaction between, let's say, Germany and the US. It's not just trade or development talks. It's also politicians, bureaucrats, industry associations, NGOs, et cetera. My question to those who are more familiar with the German side of things are, does that exist with Germany and countries in the global south, that multi-tiered stakeholder approach to understand each other's issues? And is there a strategy to increase that with certain countries or certain areas in the future? Thank you. Okay. Then that's it for Chris. Yeah. Let's later. Okay. Then we have a set of questions, quite different complexes. First, what we can do to convince Brussels and 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 Paris and so on uh, to push forward a little bit with free trade, so on. And then we have this c complex of questions about something like value imperialism and so and. If you know the ambassador of Brazil here in Germany, he uses those words. If he would be on this panel, he would say it. And finally, how can we strengthen, maintain dialogue between our sort of different countries? I'm, yeah, who should answer first? <laughs> Probably we start with a politician, right? Okay. Well, what can Germany really do to push for more? for more free trade uh, in the European Union towards Brussels, towards Paris, uh, and other countries. Is there even a chance to do something on the European level? Um, as I talked too much beforehand, I'd <laughs> like to just um, say a very few words. I, I think we should not be gold plating all yeah. the time. Yeah. We shouldn't be overloading every single contract that we negotiate with everything there is yeah. on the table. That's why we have different, um, different contracts and different ministries and perspectives. And um, with regard to the, the dialogue question and maybe the exchange uh, uh, question, I'm not aware if, um, of any kind of exchange framework that fits the frame as the transatlantic uh, framework or, or um, um, exchange uh, systems, young leader programs. But I think there is developing, um, um, 
there is a development into the right direction, but that's also, um, it goes both ways. So if there's no interest um, from uh, one side, it is very difficult to, ex to exchange or to establish these uh, roadmaps. But um, there are certain young leader programs, there's a lot of, um, um, a lot of um, intensified talk also with unique young leaders um, that uh, the whole world is basically uh, in these programs and not just US Americans or, or and, and, and um, Europe based politicians and I think that's the right way we should lead it. Thank you. Uh, GT, Valeria and Andres, your political elites have the feeling that the global north or the transatlantic uh, partners teach you too much and too not enough? Well, I think that uh, value imperialism would be a strong term from past. But if we uh, look at a future first vision, uh, there are some good lessons that uh, exist from the transatlantic world. Uh, the various indices, which are, which are uh, democracy, uh, freedom of press, uh, the uh, participation of women in, in labor force. The world has progressed, especially the democratic world, to be able to look at another democratic country through the different indices. That's a good place uh, to start a d discussion on values. However, when we look at values from a vision towards future, what is, uh, I'll, I can tell for India, one way India discovers how the world is looking at it is, India has extensive diaspora across the world. Uh, students who studied in different parts of the world, um, to give you a sense, in a couple of years, 10 million students from India will study in different universities across the world. Now, that is how they will understand the value system of the world vis-a-vis -vis India. And as a result, it will be a dialogue, not necessarily uh, a point of judgment by the West uh, of India. Um, similarly, uh, when we look at technology, as I said, that a lot of technology is getting integrated in the way of life uh, in, uh, for a young Indian. And in that, as AI comes in, a challenge that any democracy will face is how do we as citizens find out what truth is? Because uh, an AI-based system, a big tech-driven ecosystem can manipulate and create different versions of truth. And that's a challenge that uh, Western democracy will face, that's a challenge that an Indian democracy will face, and any value-based system will look at which democracy is able to navigate that better, maybe because of, of uh, regulation, or it is because better digital literacy of the people. Uh, so I think the, the next is innovation, and again, uh, sure, final point. Uh, with innovation, again, a number of these uh, judgment systems will change. So with that, I don't think that uh, Today, uh, there is a frame that uh, West can monopolize on value systems for other democracies. It's an evolving dialogue. Thank you very much. We are running a little bit out of time, but Valeria. Very quickly. Please, yeah. I don't <laughs> think that imperialism is the way to think about it. I think that we're, and you are, in a different stage of development. So in that way, and if we understand it like that, we can see what advantages or what things you've done right and what mistakes we can avoid. If we can talk each other to each other, we shouldn't be talking about imperialism, but about cooperation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, I'll also be short. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just very quickly, I mean, South Africa's democracy is relatively new since 1994, yeah, and our constitution yeah, has definitely got elements that we learned from the North. Uh, as much as it's a homegrown um, document that uh, South Africans developed. But I want to just quickly say two things. South Africa um, is, in terms of both being spoken to or speak with. That's why we're happy to be part of the G20. And secondly, we're very happy that the African Union is now part of the G20 as well. So we have the elements of, of uh, that engagement. And lastly, South Africa is, as far as I know, the only African country on the continent that has a strategic partnership with the European Union. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then we obviously have many parliamentarians going to South Africa and coming here. So I think there's a lot of elements that we talk to, to uh, that we have the opportunity to have, that we can talk to one another. But I think ultimately we as human beings 
um, are just that. We are human beings. We sometimes forget that we've got two ears and one mouth. So we want to listen more and talk less. Yeah. So, Nicolas and Jürgen, you have the final words, both very briefly. Just one question. Go forward one year in your imagination. We have a lot of elections coming forward in most of our respective countries in the European Union. What do you think? Uh, we are a step moving forward. We stepped forward a little bit towards a, a better world, um, a free trade world, an open world, or will there be stagnation? What's your estimate from both of you? Is possible. I think the danger is not so much stagnation, but open conflict. Uh, yeah. And and the the step, to, one step we can take to prevent that is to listen to the other side. So we we mm -hmm. tend to talk about China, we tend to talk about our concerns about security, but we don't listen to how those that is perceived in China. I mean, China has created this global champion Huawei, right? And instead of letting it flourish, uh, we are we're trying to keep it down um, at every step. And so if we don't, and that's I think the sense of hypocrisy. That, um, that, that is sometimes felt in, 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 in China and in other countries, that, that when uh, we play, apply one set of rules to ourselves, uh, we laud capitalism and freedom, and then once somebody else succeeds, um, in this case, a Chinese company, we, we keep it down. And, and it's, this is not to say that the security concerns are not legitimate, but if you're not aware of the, how it looks from the other side, we are really in danger of sleepwalking into, into, into a conflict. Thank you. Jürgen, you have the Yes, I think word. when you look at trade and investment, uh, one can see some, you know, restructuring, not re revolutionary, uh, but um, also on the backdrop of the global transformation, I think there are many opportunities for developing countries emerging, including mm -hmm. Africa, for example, in the commodity area. Yeah and uh, the supply chain restructuring, I mean, moving away from China and so on. I think that's really interesting to, to look at. But, and, and with regard to the question, um, more freer trade and the, the negotiations we have, I mean, <laughs> we are living in democracies and we have our political economy. I mean, you can wish something, but it always has to go to, through the political systems. And, for me, an important point is uh, when we work on standards or on trade um, uh, uh, agreements, we have to bring our partners in the global south with us. Um, we have to, to find possibilities, you know, not to exclude them, but to, to give them a place in that new world. And for example, uh, there is uh, the, the CBAM, uh, the, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. It's important. I mean, we have to do something like that in Europe, but we have to help those countries. South Africa, for example, we had then, uh, the, the dialogue with South Africa on that. The Czech Peace, the Just Energy Transition Partnerships. The North comes together to work with South Africa in the energy transition. I think these are approaches we, we have to pursue. Thank you very much to all panelists. Thank you for keeping it short and very precise and very, still very interesting. And there are a lot of discussions we need to do, a lot of things we have to discuss in the future. And I think this was a great input, a starting point for conversation. Thank you very much to all Thank of you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, ah, and we do a picture together in the middle. Yes, please, everyone, stay on the stage, and this gentleman will now <laughs> do a picture. So since we are already a little bit over time, but this was such an amazing panel and so interesting, um, we are now just uh, quickly changing the waters up here and making the stage ready for our next panel, which I'm also very excited about. So before all of you come up here, why don't you first take, take a seat um, if you find a little spot over there. 
Um, and uh, just to answer this one question which was asked, if there are also any kind of multi-stakeholder dialogues, as we do in the transatlantic sphere, um, bringing in the Global South, I am happy to report that we are just going to start one at Aspen. Um, and uh, we are expanding our cities project um, to um, India, um, to Mexico, and to Kenya, um, and bringing in uh, Berlin as well. So if you're interested in this city politics um, and the the future city, just talk to us as well. We are um, happy to tell you a little bit more about this. So, um, we've talked a lot about trade issues um, and export controls and investment screening and geopolitics of that. Um, and every once in a while, you also heard about capital flows, um, but not so much yet. You also didn't hear a lot about banking and regulation and stock markets um, and also sustainability issues and the financial sector. And uh, what I, this is something which is pretty usual. You have the trade crowd of people, and then you have the finance crowd of people. And they're not, I mean, I think they are not mixing as much as we or they should. And we are going to change this. <laughs> and for this, uh, we put um, up a panel and a discussion where we are going to look at all sorts of different aspects of the financial world and also geopolitics. And since this is um, also going to be a panel, which brings in different perspectives, we needed a really good moderator for this. Not just a person who moderates well, um, but also one who brings in a lot of expertise um, and can uh, bring all those different fäden zusammenbring um, to pull it all together. And uh, who would be better for this than uh, Cornelia Wolf? Um, come up here, Cornelia, give her a big applause. <laughs> the president of the Hertie School, um, and um, well, all of you who have been at the Hertie School or currently are, raise your hand. Wow, see? Um, because I also have to say, the Hertie School is one of my favorite hunting grounds for really good and well-educated um, uh, friends and um, ESMA employees, um, and um, you play a big part um, for guiding uh, the Hertie School, having done so the last years and doing into the future. Um, so we all, you weren't able to be here with us yesterday, so you don't know the spiel yet, um, but I always want to introduce our moderators by also asking a question um, to you. So why do you, why, uh, do, you, do, do you think there is actually a um, geopolitical component of the financial markets? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, so it's true, I'm a, I'm a professor of international political economy, so I see geopolitics everywhere. <laughs> Even when it was just the regular markets that people thought were neutral and boring, I, I was always on the side that I think it's very geopolitical. What I think is interesting now is that we see geopolitics in very detailed policy fields that previously felt like they were just technical areas of cooperation, and I think that's what I'm eager to tease out, and we have a wonderful panel to do that with. Absolutely. And what do you tell your students to study financial markets if they're not sure yet where in which direction they want to go? Why financial markets? So I think financial markets are a bit like if you're interested in a body, the entire system that brings blood from one end to the other. So if the infrastructure doesn't work, it's the same goes for energy. But if infrastructures don't work, then the body just dies. And so I think it's very interested, interesting to see that financial markets, to a certain degree, were probably ahead of some political cooperation projects. Um, or really behind, but in, to a certain degree, money moved across borders before um, some economic relations were that well established. And then we realized that you can do a lot of things if you want things to go badly, to use the financial system, to exert pressure, to um, create um, uh, an incentive to have politics go another way. So I'm also interested in how financial markets are used by those who are not part of the industry, but those who have political ambitions. Perfect. And so we take the pulse of the patient financial market now, yes. and I hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
So I already mentioned I have a wonderful panel of experts. I have a quite big panel to present to you, so um, give me just a couple of moments to tell you why uh, it is good that you're here with us today, because we bring people from both industry, from um, associations, and from academia together from both sides of the Atlantic. And let me present them to you in alphabetical order before I call them up on stage and we'll engage in a discussion with them. So, First up is Professor Mark Kopelovich, who is a professor of political science and public affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he holds the Jean Monnet Chair in the European Union and is the director of the Jean Monnet EU Center for Populism and Political Economy. He's also a visiting researcher at the WZB Berlin, and we're currently very um, lucky to have him in Berlin for a longer period of time. You are the Axel Springer Fellow of the American Academy this spring, where you're writing writing a book on dollar signs, U.S. financial dominance and the future of American power and democracy. So you realize Mark, like myself, is very interested in the politics of financial markets as well. We also have Dr. Anne Holzhausen um, with us today, who heads the Economic Research, Insurance, Wealth and ESG team at Allianz in Munich. He's responsible for analyzing and forecasting global insurance and pension markets, monitoring, monitoring worldwide private assets and liabilities, and assessing the impact of ESG issues on economic and capital market outcomes. Before joining Allianz, he spent time at Dresdner's Bank Economic Research, and he was also, and I'll mention this because that's my part of this universe, academia, he was an assistant professor at the Center for East Asian Studies, and you hold a doctorate in Japanese studies. So that's a very important element and to bring into our geopolitical discussion. Katharina Gnad is senior manager at Deloitte Germany, where she is co-leading the economic advisory and has worked on issues from economic policy to the industrial transition, not just at Deloitte, but previously also at Bertelsmann. And you've held fellowships at DGAP, among others, and at the European Central Bank. You also have a PhD from a very well-respected institution, the Free University and the Hattie School. So I'm very happy to engage in a discussion with you here on these topics as well. Rüdiger von Kleist is the director of the IMF and International Financial Architecture Division at the Federal Ministry of Finance, the BMF, and currently also acting deputy director for international financial relations. So this includes, and I just have to put it out there so you realize it covers the world, G7, G20, IMF, World Bank, and other MDBs, AIAB, debt issues, bilateral country relations, Africa, and climate, uh, international climate and health financing. You have a 27-year-long career at the Ministry of Finance, and before that, also a PhD in economics from the University of Freiburg. Very happy to have you with us today. Johannes Pockrand is Managing Director and Head of Government Affairs at Europe, for Europe at Citigroup. He's a member of the Europe Leadership Team, and he drives Citi's engagement with political stakeholders and institutions across 43 European countries. And when you think 43 countries, you always also can think 43 governments. We thought the EU was complicated. He also has the UK and Switzerland in it. And uh, you are managing a lot of uh, the issues that uh, City, of course, is um, facing in these markets and uh, beyond. You joined City from Deutsche Bank, where you were for eight years in different positions and countries, and have previously served as policy advisor and legislator aid to members of the European Parliament and of the European Federal Parliament, and you've also worked at the European Commission. Thank you very much for joining us. And finally, Niels Tom is with us today. He's the representative of the board of um, Group Deutsche Börse, or Deutsche Börse Group, I don't know in which order it goes, where you're responsible for stakeholder management as well as the Berlin hub, the representation that is the embassy of Deutsche Börse Group here in Berlin. He is head of communication for the trading and clearing segment of Deutsche Börse, which includes all regulated markets for securities, derivatives, commodities, currencies, and other asset classes, as well as central clearing. And since September 2018, he's also the co-CEO of China, Europe, International Exchange, a joint venture established by the Shanghai Stock Exchange, Deutsche Börse Group, and China Financial Futures Exchange. That's a topic I'm very interested in, and you know I'll ask you a question about it. You're also a member of the board of the Federation of European Security Exchanges. And with that introduction, please join me on stage so we can start with our discussion. <laughs> So 
So I would like to get us started off by hearing from industry about the geopolitics that I was asked about in the beginning, how geopolitical has the world become and how do you feel it? And I would like to start with Johannes Pockrand and Citigroup's perspective. Do the geopolitical changes that the newspapers now talk about really affect your clients and all the markets that you serve and in which ways? Thank you very much. Um, they definitely do. I mean, thinking about global politics, thinking about geopolitical trends is something we've been doing for a long time. Um, as a bank, we try to do you know, global business with and for our clients. We want to be, we aspire to be the preeminent banking partner for institutional clients with cross-border needs. And when you enter a, uh, a time that you could almost characterize as one of systemic fragmentation, then that is first and foremost a challenge for you know, us as a bank, because we, of course, have to meet very different regulatory requirements in very different jurisdictions. But it is even more of a challenge for, for our clients. And while we do think we have an advantage uh, that derives from our globality and our experience in, in, in markets, um, you know, many, many clients who think about entering new markets um, you know, face challenges. Um, I think an obvious one at the moment is a, is a much greater focus on operational resilience. Uh, we've just seen that cutting a single cable can, can put several countries, uh, you know, did, uh, disconnect several countries at once and for a, a sustained period of time. Um, when we think about trade routes, um, and we do a lot of wiring and plumbing uh, for our clients and a lot of, sort of payments uh, across, across borders, but also a lot of trade finance, um, then uh, you know, how secure these trade routes are, how resilient they are, is a, is a whole different uh, discussion uh, now than it was, than it was a, few, a few years ago. I think what's also uh, very clear, and um, Anna can, can talk about this in a much more educated fashion, but we're arguably in a time where at a global level, but certainly in the United States and in Europe, um, supply side shocks play a significant role and where monetary policy um, as a response um, is um, you know, potentially less impactful um, as it was um, on the demand side. So as, as we face supply side shocks, and I think the country uh, in Europe that I know best and that we sit in is a good example, um, as you think about economies and clients in economies that are facing supply side shocks, there's an all new discussion about fiscal space about the role of public investment. Um, and to turn my remarks into a, a, a bit more positive, that's of course an opportunity depending uh, in which business you're in. Right? So uh, in Europe, certainly we're thinking uh, about energy, we're thinking about, we're thinking about the defense sector in a, in a whole different way. Uh, and at Citi, we're pleased to see that the importance of financial markets um, you know, for energy infrastructure, for, defense, for the defense sector, um, and also other sectors is, is becoming much more topical. And the di discussion is helpful because it has a new kind of granularity. The European Commission last month published a paper where they looked at the reasons for the lack of equity financing, but not sort of globally or you know, across Europe or in European markets, but in the European defense sector. It's a fascinating read, and I think that is, that is work that is really worth doing to look at individual sectors um, and, and look at the reasons why capital market financing, why equity financing um, is, is so scarce and what the barriers are, right? And overall, I think we see in Europe, and I think it's fair to say as a response to the geopolitical situation in which we are, we see great, uh, almost unique momentum around building out capital markets. Uh, we had a very ambitious paper um, published by uh, the Eurogroup, not just Euro area finance ministers, but the Eurogroup in inclusive format, so all finance ministers of all EU member states, um, you know, defining what we need to do around architecture, around businesses, around citizens, ABC, to, to, to build capital markets out. Um, very concrete calls uh, also to incentives. Um, and, you know, in an election year here in the UK, and of course, if, as we approach November 5th in the United States, um, there's still a lot that can be done at individual member state level in the EU. So I think 
you know, in summary, um, there are difficult uh, challenges um, for, for different clients in different sectors, but there's also very, very helpful momentum um, as justifiably different governments around the world, different sovereign states think about economic security, um, but also about uh, economic competitiveness. And the latter is the one to focus on if you want to uh, you know, approach this in a, in a positive spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So economic uh, security and competitiveness and the fact that both of them are linked to a certain degree politically um, is, a, is an important point and I also take with you that the political response of the past, which was the silent monetary policy, is increasingly becoming replaced by more need for some fiscal space and I think that's something we can respond to. Let me move uh, from you to Niels Tom and ask about uh, Deutsche Börse's perspective and, and possibly have you focus on the relationship with China. It is a quite unusual joint venture to have a uh, joint venture directly um, with the Chinese uh, partners and uh, we always tend to think that China is the biggest elephant in the room that one should talk about when we talk about geopolitics. I'd like to hear if you agree and and uh, what to you the challenges are? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, uh, I, I think the joint venture I'm heading is, is even more unique because it's not based in China, but it's based in Frankfurt. Um, we are connected to the systems, trading systems of Deutsche Börse. So we, we are a German company and, and we have a German trading system, etc. Um, so that makes us unique also for the Chinese side um, uh, because they, they don't have, in a way, the direct influence on us uh, regarding supervision, etc. Having that said, I think one, one general remark to, to where we are in, in, in capital markets and a little bit uh, also alluding to what, what Johannes already said is I think capital markets in general have proven that they become more and more independent of political dynamics. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at uh, the effect that the Brexit vote um, uh, back in the days had on, on markets, um, that was tremendous. Uh, the market drop was uh, over 20% in one day. Um, I think regulation-wise and, and system-wise, um, Europe proved to be very stable and resilient, um, also because of regulation after the financial crisis. Um, but uh, so since then, um, you always see fluct uh, in a, way, a lot of volatility uh, around those events, but they're not as big as they used to be. Um, when it comes to China, I think it's 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 a, it also it's a, 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 in a way more untypical capital market uh, because it started out to be very much retail driven. So a lot of retail investors were active in the market. Um, uh, the ratio in, in, in Western capital markets um, is more 90% institutional investors. The rest is uh, retail investors. In China, it used to be the other way around. Um, since 2015-16, they have been after their, their, they had a capital market crisis. They have invested a lot in reg financial regulation. They have invested a lot in the prof professionalism of the capital market. So the ratio of institutional investors is growing. It's around 60% plus now. Um, but of course, the big difference is they're somewhat detached to the global financial markets because they've not fully opened up uh, to the global financial markets. You still have entry barriers into the capital market, but you also have, in a way, some barriers uh, of free flow of capital out, out of China, for example. Uh, so our role is more or less trying to bridge uh, between, uh, in a way, the European capital market and also the Chinese capital market by a variety of products. <clears throat> but uh, I always see there is an inherent dilemma for the Chinese because on the one hand, they realize that they need a strong capital market um, for the dual circulation and for the fulfillment of the dual circulation. Um, so, in a way, uh, on the one hand, a sovereign, more or less autonomous um, uh, economy within China, uh, w together with a strong capital market. They're trying to build that now. Um, but of course, I alluded to this earlier, is um, where they can control the, the flow of products, uh, of product uh, and, 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 and uh, 
goods and uh, etc. of trade much more because it's much more physical. Uh, it's of course much harder to control um, uh, the flow of capital once you open up. Um, so this is the inherent dilemma I'm, 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 I'm seeing and, and the pace um, of opening up the capital market uh, is of course therefore much much slower than in other areas and other industries that we have that we have witnessed over the last decades. Um, right now, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because <clears throat> I think uh, there is um, again a step m towards more opening up um, uh, as the economic recovery after the Corona crisis and and also the economic growth in general is slowing down. Um, they realize that for the implementation of the dual circulation and the strategic, uh, um, in a way, independence they are seeking for, as well as, of course, uh, not to forget the renminbi as one of the le world leading currencies they want to establish, they are starting to think about ways how to open up even more than before. So I think that's the current state I'm, I'm observing. Um, this is still, in a way, I would say, a longer route to go, and, and whether they will fully connect to the global capital markets uh, I think that will be the, the very interesting question to, to look at. Um, currently, I don't see that they will fully um, integrate into the global capital market yet. Interesting. So I can even connect uh, the two of your responses. The Europeans are building a capital market. The Chinese are trying to build a, f a capital market. And in a way, we can see who will make more progress uh, quickly in maybe some years from now. But I'll let you <laughs> respond to one another in a, in a second round. Thank you for this response. Let me move into a second set of questions on uh, more the political side, the multilateral and the bilateral side um, in uh, responses one can have. Rüdiger van Kleist, you are our government representative here on the panel and uh, have a long experience in the multilateral financial institutions. And I would like to hear from you uh, maybe a response to the discussion about China from the regulator side. Is China uh, in the multilateral infrastructure, we know, I'll just shorthand this, the Bretton Woods institutions represented in a way that corresponds to our international financial system today. What is really still to be done to not have a parallel uh, multilateral Chinese-led uh, um, financial architecture rise that will make it very difficult, not just uh, to ensure financial stability, but even sovereign stability, if you could speak to that. Uh, well, thank you very much. i start with two simple truths, and you already uh, alluded to that. I think China is underrepresented in the post-World War II Bretton Woods institutions. At the moment, we have a stalemate between the US not wanting to grant any ground to, to China and Japan, obviously, who's still second biggest uh, shareholder in both the World Bank and, 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 and the IMF, and also doesn't want China to surpass it for political grounds. But I think economically, it's pretty clear. They should be bigger. That's the first. And the second thing is whenever we talk about anything uh, uh, on the global scale where we could reach a multilateral solution, and you also alluded to that China is either the main topic or the elephant in the room. <laughs> I'll just give three examples. Uh, one is, of course, the, uh, the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine. That conflict would take a very different course if China and, to some lesser extent, India would not buy off Putin all the oil and other resources he wants to sell. So we, we are trying, you know, from, from the Western countries, we are trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, impose sanctions and, and try to cut off the financing side of the war on the Russian side. But China and, 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 and to, as I said, lesser agree, India are simply channeling any amount of money uh, uh, Russia needs to them. The second, uh, second example is uh, climate change, of course, both on the, on the volume of, of, of uh, uh, climate uh, adaption that needs to be achieved in China, but also on the financing side. We are not going to achieve any viable solution on the financing of, 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 of climate change for poorer countries if China doesn't participate. And the third example is, is the looming debt crisis in, in, in poor countries. China is by far the biggest bilateral creditor to poor countries. So there is no solution for, uh, for the poor countries in sight if China doesn't participate. So that's simply the fact. So how do we and how do the Chinese deal with it? 
the Chinese have been very, how should I call it, uh, they have been very successful at sort of playing ball in the international institutions, uh, you know, acting very multilaterally, trying to support everything, except if it comes to their own ingrained interests. And there, I think over the course of the last maybe five, six years, I mean, China used to basically just sit there and grow. I think that was the first phase. <laughs> you know, they just made sure they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, accumulating reserves, making sure, you know, they get dominant market positions in so many countries. For five or six years, they have been starting to increase the use of this uh, economic uh, strength to you know, get, uh, uh, get political leverage. And they are doing that in the international institutions as well. I'll uh, uh, take two examples again. Uh, we have the G20 Common Framework on Debt Resolution, where, again, without China, we're not going to move anywhere. We have had a stalling process with four, five or six countries where simply China is not willing to accept Accept the last step to actually achieve a debt resolution for those countries. We're talking about Chad or Zambia or, or any other number of cases, because China is not used to you know this role of okay, you made a bad investment decision, you need to pay for it. You know we've been used to doing that for for decades, but you know the Chinese are still learning to do that. But it's very slow and it's a bad bad thing for the poor countries because they actually would need a swift debt, debt resolution. Second example: the founding of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, basically as a as a as a, a move because they couldn't gain more foothold in the Bretton Woods institutions. They founded their own investment bank which Germany joined for good reasons. The US didn't join, some other countries did not join because they felt they didn't want to support this sort of Chinese bank. We feel it's completely different. We feel it's important to work together with China to make sure that this bank, like any other bank, uh, like any other multilateral bank, uh, uh, upholds high social and, and, and economic and environmental standards so that we make the world a better place, also through the AIIB and its uh, its involvement with, with with countries in need who need who need the financing. So those are just two examples. Um, maybe I'll stop here, and and you know any other example anybody wants to quote, <laughs> we can talk about that. But there are myriads of of yeah. points of contact with China. It's simply the elephant in the room yes. in global cooperation at the moment. Excellent. Those are a lot of topics, but also some pretty deep fault lines. So let me stay with some of the fault lines and get our attention closer to the transatlantic uh, cooperation and partnership. And uh, Mark Pelovich, you are here as the American in my panel, <laughs> um, but also an expert on Europe. So I would like to hear from what you've studied of international financial markets and the stability that we're also trying to achieve what are the current challenges and what type of cooperation do you think is needed to get us into a sounder or more serene financial system? <laughs> so the easy question, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest challenge right now, you have the economic challenges in terms of coming out of COVID and then you have the political challenges, right? So a lot of the, Uh, like you, I study international political economy and I see geopolitics everywhere, but really I think everybody is talking about a new era of geopolitics right now. And what most people seem to mean when you start asking them what they mean by geopolitics is there are very serious problems within domestic politics going on in the United States and in China and in, uh, uh, in Germany and in other EU countries. So, you know, I think the... The economic challenges transatlantically are that the U.S. economic recovery has been much stronger than the European recovery and the German economic recovery, and transatlantic relations tend to ebb and flow um, and are driven often by disjunctures between the economic performance on both sides of the Atlantic. So, uh, so that's a problem uh, more here in Europe, I think, than in the United States and how Germany and Europe think about investment policies and economic policies that can help uh, um, kickstart the economic recovery, which is starting to head towards what looks like another lost decade. We had the Eurozone crisis lost decade and now the fallout from, uh, from the war and the pandemic. Um, so I think economically that's the big challenge. I think politically the big challenge, um, as I think everybody knows, is rising 
you can call it populism, you can call it far-right authoritarianism, everybody has a different term for it, but both in the US and here in Germany and Hungary, in the EU more broadly, we're dealing with this problem that the two largest financial powers in the international system, who have been the bedrock of the international financial institutions that have been the heart of the global economy for 80 years now, are facing rising forces at home of parties that don't value that. They don't value the institutions, they don't value the transatlantic relationship, they don't value the cooperation. Um, and that is, of course, an even bigger problem when those things are happening in the United States. And given the structure of our political system, right, you have wild swings in policy between Democratic and Republican administrations now, which creates an enormous amount of uncertainty. Right? So the, the reason we created international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank and the WTO is primarily to reduce uncertainty, um, to have some sort of basis of rules where even if there is temporary or periodic defection, most of the time there's cooperation transatlantically and in the global economy. And that is very hard to sustain when the United States and the EU both are facing problems within their own politics of whether or not those institutions are valued. Right? And so um, the US and the EU accuse each other of different forms of protectionism and not violating and sticking to the rules. Um, but at the end of the day, for a very long period of time, there were solid majorities in both parties in the United States that valued transatlantic cooperation. And there were solid majorities of the key governments and the largest countries in the EU that at the end of the day valued transatlantic cooperation, right? And so the, the biggest uncertainty is uncertainty at home, right? And I think we talk a lot about that as geopolitics, um, but it's much more, I see it, that the problems are about domestic politics, right? And the, the geopolitics will work itself out if we can address the domestic political problems. And I think you see the same thing in China. Right, so the, the discussion uh, that has come up already about China playing a greater role in the international financial institutions, in opening up, um, removing capital controls, opening up to global capital flows, um, all of those things could happen, and on balance, I think those would be positive things for global financial stability in the international economy. Uh, but they would require Xi Jinping and the Chinese government to basically implement a set of policies which are at the complete and total odds with their domestic political incentives right now. Um, so, you know, much of, that's sort of how I view it as, a, as someone who studies international political economy, that most of what we're wrestling with and struggling with about a new geopolitical order and problems of international relations are really problems of the domestic political challenges at home. Which doesn't make me more optimistic, but nope. <laughs> I'll, take, uh, I'll take it as a, a take-home point. And I'd like to uh, maybe move our um, discussion from just the distribution of challenges and, um, uh, and the perspectives in, in, in industry and in government to the question of problem solving. Financial markets are global markets. We know the financial system is a system that provides incentives, huge incentives for economic and political action, and I would like to see if that is a way of addressing the challenges we have uh, in front of us, in particular, saving the planet and uh, making the world a better place. Somebody said, I like it, I'll, I'll take that. And uh, so the last uh, two questions um, are going to revolve ar around this um, problem-solving capacity, and I'll start with Katarina Gnad. What do you see as the challenge uh, of international climate finance for international financial institutions in the financial order more generally? Thank you, uh, Cornelia. Uh, problem solving and making the planet a better place in two minutes. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll try. Um, we have already heard from uh, Rudiger von Kleist that um, climate finance is one of the big issues uh, in, on the financial and political agenda right now. Um, and looking into the international f uh, negotiations within the UN, but also within the G20, uh, we are really seeing, and this is sort of a very clear message that has come out of Dubai of the last COP, we are seeing a huge climate finance gap right now. Um, and 
the, the sort of the challenge or the, or the, the, the task is to, to mobilize this, uh, this money and, and the funds particularly for the vulnerable countries and particularly for the developing world who do not have the public means to address both questions of mitigation but also much more increasingly questions of adaptation and, and uh, the big question of loss and damage. So what do we do? Um, I think there are sort of two parts of this, this answer and Europe, the EU and the US actually should play a very big role in this and they do. Um, and this is one on the public side. We are currently trying to negotiate internationally a new collective quantified goal on finance um, in, the, in the COP framework, if you want. And there we really need to see now from the donor countries, uh, and there the sort of North Atlantic Alliance uh, can play a role if they, wish to, uh, if they wish so, to really see commitments going forward, early commitments now towards this goal. This is going to be difficult because as we uh, have just heard from Mark, um, we face political uncertainty on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, we have election years coming up. Um, but there I really see, see a role and I also see a, a, a coordination role between uh, the EU and the US uh, going forward. And the second sort of leg, if you want, is, is really the private side. And then we're sort of coming full circle. Uh, and private sector involvement in financing this green transition, the energy transition, uh, but more specifically also uh, climate change uh, policies. Um, and there the question really is, how can we bring the private sector better in? Is it sort of, do we need further international regulation? Do we need sort of a political uh, collaborative will to uh, catalyze finance um, so that the private sector can follow suit? Um, do we need more sort of voluntary commitments? The answer is probably we need all of this. Um, but I think this is sort of one of the big challenges that we are facing uh, over, over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, at least until the Brazilian COP in 2025. Uh, and if we go back to the sort of problem solving side, um, there I would really urge the European uh, policymakers and the US even if there's an election coming up, and I, I, I know how, how difficult it is to play these topics, to really sort of make sure that, um, that these topics are not going to be um, ignored, because at the end of the day, we know many institutions have been charged with sort of looking into this climate change and, and, and um, the green transition have a stabilizing role to play or they are destabilizing if we don't do anything about it and then uh, and then we will sort of be in the territory of financial instability in the medium term which is something that we are trying to avoid thank you very much and that is almost a transition to the second and uh, question on this topic and the last i would like to ask to anna holzhausen bringing the private sector in, you monitor and you assess what happens on capital markets and uh, there's a lot of attempts to bring the private sector in through reporting standards, through other um, type of transformations and I would like to just hear your general assessment. Is it working and what kind of impact can these ESG standards have? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And first of all, I mean, we also try to avoid right now the wording ESG standards because we okay. also learned that it's a little bit wrong. It's this contested, political contested. What's, what will replace it? <laughs> we replace it with sustainability, the broader okay. concept. Because I think ESG is a little bit misleading because with these three uh, letters, it implies that this is very detailed, this is very concrete, but it isn't. Especially mm. the S is very vague. So it's better to have this kind of talking about sustainability. And then when we talk about sustainability, for sure, as an insurance company, we feel it on our both sides of our balance sheet. We see it on the liability side, we see it on the asset side, liability side, underwriting. You probably heard all about the stories that already American insurers stopped doing new business, to doing underwriting new homes in California because of NetCats, because of the frequency and severity of uh, NetCat events. So this is already, we are already very close to a situation where we see this kind of uninsurability. Mm. And that means that we clearly use our means, what we have, this is our asset side, our investment, to change things, to be on the, uh, on the one of the agents to transform, to bring the transformation ahead. And when we talk about sustainability, as Johannes also mentioned, it's not only about the climate, climate crisis, for sure, emission reduction, but it's also about geopolitics. Mm. And 
I mean, we can see it. I mean, our role also as insurer, we used to have business interruption. This was only financial indemnification after the fact. Now we are much more playing a role as a consultant with our clients, really planning ahead how we can change the supply chain, how we can build more resilient supply chains. But I mean, sure, Johannes, you said it. I mean, there is a lot of opportunity. Yes, it is. And we hope that we are on the insurance side, one of the guys that can benefit from these developments, but we should not fool ourselves. I mean, this whole thing, this reconfiguration of the supply chains, this costs a lot, this costs efficiency, prices going up. This is not an endeavor where we can say this is cost-free, this will bring us in a better world. No, we will lose a lot, we will lose a lot of wealth, and we will invest a lot. And as also I mentioned, it, that, that we now in a situation where this is this geopolitical changes, supply changes, that monetary policy is not as powerful as it used to be. It's not longer the only game in town. Fiscal policy comes into the space, and you said there's fiscal space. Very euphemistically, I would say, because in the end, what we see, we spend a lot of money. I'm not saying we waste a lot of money on subsidies to build ships factories here in Germany, to build battery factories in Ireland. So this is this renaissance of industrial policy, big time, big time. And it's really a big question if it really leads to an increase in social wealth, or is this not a way to, to waste a lot of money. And my impression is that many policymakers, politicians, still live in this kind of la-la land where they think there's capital for free. But this is the past. This was 10 years, five years ago, where you can spend a lot of money and still there was a lot of capital. The savings glut is over. We now have to compete for capital on a global level. That's also why it's so important to have a global financial market. Mm. And this means but you have to trade offs. You have to make decisions. You cannot have both. And this is the old coming back. I mean, it's now in Europe, especially in Germany, you can feel it as still not realized, but we're in a situation where we have to choose between guns and butters. This is the reality, and that means that we also have with the finance, with the sustainable finance, we are so urgently need to, to have these rules, regulation, reporting things. We have to mainstream the sustainability into the finance, because there is sustainable finance or else. This has to be in the all heads. We can no longer afford to invest things in, 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 in investment in projects that are not sustainable. And this is also, Mark mentioned, it's this domestic thing and the uncertainty. I mean, yes, there's uncertainty. We don't know the outcome, but what is very likely that we face in Europe, as well as in the US, a green backlash. And this is the last thing. I mean, you had this Institute for Populism. And I think the worst things we can afford is climate populism. And we are very close also to this situation. And this means we have to find ways where we really put it into the DNA of all the regulations, of all the laws that just cannot be moved against it again. I mean, in Germany, we have this debt break. This is in the Constitution. Maybe we should think about something similar with sustainable finance to make sure that really <coughs> capital is a scarce source and that it's really used for the right uh, projects and no longer wasted for something we cannot longer afford because we are very close to a situation where uh, sustainability or this becomes many things become unsustainable. And not only for geopolitical reasons, but also for geopolitical reasons. Sorry that I <laughs> gave a little Thankfully, bit. <laughs> thank you for the answer. Thankfully, we have 10 more minutes to <clears throat> not stop on such a depressing analysis where we not only have to compete for capital, but are in a situation where the <coughs> populism at home will both create a backlash against the green transition and against any sort of globalism is the word, I think, now, so that I think kills capital markets altogether. So let's, uh, 15 minutes left, oh my God, <coughs> a, a lot of time, that's wonderful because I'd like to get you to respond to some of the things you heard. And I see uh, Johannes already had his hand up that uh, there are topics that have overlapped, so please come in. Thank you. I, I just want to, you know, bring the bring the ESG or sustainability discussion back to something that I think is is realistic and achievable uh, and equally important, right? And that is disclosure, um, because uh, uniform, standardized, um, aligned disclosure requirements highlight a lot. They bring transparency in the game, right? They show you risks and opportunities. The political debate will then be about what's a risk and what's an opportunity. But first of all, it's about aligning reporting requirements. And I think it's an interesting uh, to keep in mind, as a global bank, for example, we are a preparer of ESG reports, 
but we're of course also a consumer. What our clients disclose helps us to better understand how they plan, how they adapt to a transition to a low carbon economy. So it goes both ways, right? I think the important thing is that element of harmonization. This is a transatlantic conference and investors need comparable data, right? Because investors are global. So if you have different subsidiaries of international companies disclosing different kinds of information in different jurisdictions, that isn't terribly helpful for investors. And I think there, you know, the European Union has uh, the ESRS and then the US, you know, we've had that recent SEC climate rule and we have the ISSB in Frankfurt now, the Sustainability Standards Board, which a whole set of other jurisdiction looks to looks set to follow. That isn't, that isn't the most helpful development from an investor perspective. But if you look at what's happening, the European Commission and the IIS, ISSB just decided, okay, let's map our requirements against each other and let's see, you know, let's compare and contrast. So there's, there's helpful developments there. And I think just, just one last sentence as a wider point on, on the transition to the low carbon economy. Um, I think it's important governments and regulators understand that move from voluntar to voluntary to, regula uh, to a regulated reporting is tough. Uh, it requires investment in skills, in data and technology, not just for industry or our clients, also for auditors. Um, and then I think second, even more of an overarching theme is the importance of policy certainty, right? And investors, it's about, de the game is about deployment of capital. And you don't deploy capital unless you have certainty, policy certainty. That may be financial support for de-risking and early stage technology. It may be, yes, it may be tax breaks. U.S. is our home market. This is, you know, a personal remark, but the Inflation Reduction Act is not going so badly. You, could, you, you, pick, you pick your way, you pick your policy as a sovereign government, but policy certainty is, is important, right? If you don't have that, investors won't deploy capital. And if you do invest in being able to follow certain reporting standards, you don't want to change six months later to do the other one. There you go. <laughs> Niels Tam. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, fully subscribe to what Johannes just said. And, and I think there, the risk is that currently, because you have the political uncertainty, you have the divergence in regulation that investors become more and more geographically looking at what is the system here and what's the system there and, 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 and transatlantic wise I think uh, we need to move closer together again to harmonize it because disclosure is key uh, definitely uh, on the other hand I think also what what uh, the war in the Ukraine has shown is you also need an adaptive system right because uh, under anyway strict ESG rules uh, none of the defense industry would get money um, but they need it, right? So, and if you look at one of the big, uh, the last biggest IPOs at, at Deutsche Börse, they were all from the defense industry, Rheinmetall, Rank, et cetera, mm. right? So I think that is also something where uh, systems need to be adaptive because capital markets are adaptive to trends and, and they need to be adaptive to trends. And one last point I think is we are talking about transition. So um, as an exchange, if we, for example, Deutsche Börse would, would say listing criteria as of the next in, in five years is if you're not fully uh, compliant with ESG, you're being delisted, um, that would be causing quite an upheaval to, uh, to, the, to the capital markets. Plus, we would lose a lot of uh, industries that are in transition, right? Because it's, it's, there are industries which are now growing and, and, and being established, which are sustainable right from the beginning. Um, so, so you have a lot of startups who develop sustainable uh, technologies or technologies to enable sustainability, etc. cetera. Um, but of course, you have also a lot of old industry which is in transition to a more net zero economy. And those, those who are listed on an exchange need the capital to do that. And, 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 and that is uh, not to be forgotten also in, in, in this debate that we should not, in a way, uh, lose parts of the industry who are able to transform, but who need the capital also to do it. Thank you very much. Rüdiger von Kleist. Uh, yes, thank you. Let's talk about solutions. 
I think uh, what we need, and I completely agree, you know, trust in the system, the future of the system, uh, in the future of the system, which means we have two guardrails in, in German politics, German financial politics, which is no new debt because we have a constitutional rule and no new taxes because I think everybody in the room probably feels the same. We are over, no, probably not over tax, I'm the <laughs> Ministry of Finance. So we are perfectly taxed, <laughs> but we shouldn't go any further. It's not helpful. If again and again and again people said, oh, well, we could loosen the debt break or we could, you know, impose more. No, no, it's not helpful. I think, I think we are in an excellent fiscal position compared to everybody else. We're the last G7 country with a AAA rating mm -hmm. that saves us billions of euros every year because we have those guardrails. So it's not helpful to scream for new money. And that, of course, goes to climate finance. There will not be new money for climate finance. Full stop. We don't have the money. And that means we will have to find other sources. Those other sources are other donors, part as we like to call them, or they like to call themselves, part one countries, and of course the private sector. And what do we need for the private sector? We need a, a orderly, ordnungspolitisches Rahmenwerk. Unfortunately, there's no good English translation for this. <laughs> you know? But we need reliability, we need rules which don't change every day, and we need to give private companies the room to breathe, to actually make money, and while making money, provide jobs, pay taxes, and make sure the world is a better place because they keep the regulations. So I think that, that's the solution. Make sure that the government provides a sustainable, stable look out to the future and give private private industry the room, and then we will also get, uh, get, get climate finance. You know, because a lot of countries with, who cannot afford uh, the, the climate transition, they could afford a lot more private investment if they wanted to, and that would raise the necessary money from domestic resources to actually pay for the climate change and not rely on donors. But when I talk to my colleagues, for example, I mean, there is a lot of private capital waiting at the sidelines. The problem is often there are no projects. We need a pipeline of projects we can invest in. This is also where the is a little bit of a bottleneck. That we talk a lot and talk a lot, but the approval and the, you know the bureaucracy, not only in Germany, all over the world, is a little bit slow. So this is one one thing that really is now seen as one of the most highest barriers for private capital to deploy it at large scale into this climate phase. But I agree also with Claudia. There's there's, there's some positive developments. Katarina. Um, I want. I want to agree, and I want to. <laughs> I want to agree that, and for sure, policy certainty is very important. Policy stability is very important for investment. Um, I don't think Ordnungspolitik will get us where we want to be fast enough, and that's that's really my worry. Um, that we are sort of in a stalemate. And I understand there's there's not enough fiscal space uh, in Europe um, to to commit to new money publicly. We're sort of waiting for new sources. Um, we, we know the counter arguments from, from, from other countries. Um, and my, my big worry is that, uh, the, that the sort of the focus on, on the policy framework and the stability that the policy framework provides will not get us to where we need in terms of financing the green transition. That is my big worry. No, I also fully agree, but my point is not that we do not need public money, but we have to make sure that the public money has the right priorities. And right now in Germany we increase pensions, but curtail, but do not not enough for subsidies for green projects. This is now the choice is taken in Germany, and this is, I think, not sustainable. Hopefully, that is, you can agree with that. <laughs> We're in the heart oh, discussion. I also have Mark uh, Kopelovic who would like to come in. Uh, yeah, I think so. Cornelia mentioned I'm the American in the room, so I, I guess <laughs> I, I, I'm obligated to give a little bit of the American perspective, which is it's important to remember that this discussion about there's no more money and there's trade-offs between guns and butter is entirely political discussion. Right? The, Johannes mentioned how successful the IRA has been. You know, the U.S. is the issuer of the dominant international reserve currency, has effectively unlimited fiscal capacity. And we can talk about the merits of higher debt and whatnot, but in a world where global capital flows have increased by a factor of 40 over the last 50 years and debt has increased by a factor of three, hmm. that there's a lot of fiscal space, right? And the EU as a whole through the ECB could choose to issue an enormous amount of debt. The fact that it's not is 
political constraints with, you know, at the European level and here in Germany and in other countries as well. So I think it's, you know, it, it's important to, to think about what the obstacles are and they're primarily that people don't want to do that and there's not political support for governments to do that. Um, not that the country is going to run out of money or that we, we couldn't borrow if we wanted to. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a case that that would be the right thing to do. But if the EU wanted to do that, or if the German government wanted to do that, it would be possible to make that happen. But the fact that, that it's not as about domestic politics. So I like politics, but doesn't it also have to do with the fact that we don't hold the uh, informal reserve currency of the world? Well, the euro holds the number two role, and it's not even close to who's number three. Okay. Right? So, you know, when I think about global finance, you're talking about transatlantic financial power between the US, uh, the dollar and the euro. Um, those are the two games in town, and if we're thinking about policy, certainty matters, and it does. With all of the uncertainty in American and European politics, there's more certainty in American and European politics um, about the safety of our financial investments than there is anywhere else in the world. Just, sorry, yes. if I may, just one point on that. I mean, the, the interest rate burden is just starting to feed its way into the American budget. Mm -hmm. And the way, you know, you have the, the political division within leadership, once your, I don't know how many trillion your debt is at the moment, but you could, could continue issuing debt and interest rates will stay high. Mm -hmm. You will face a problem not of well, issuing debt, but of actually paying the interest rate. And uh, because, you know, the Republicans were, okay, let's slash so social spending, and, and the Democrats say, say no way, and sure. you will end up with a stalemate, and that will be, become the central problem. But that uh, stalemate is again, is, again, primarily political. I mean, if you look at the, the interest as a share of GDP right now, it's a third of what it was in the 1980s, and even if the worst-case scenario projections are true over the next 30 years, we won't even be back to that level of where we were in the 1980s. And in the 80s, the U.S. didn't have trouble borrowing. Right? Interest rates were very high. There was a lot of politics around the borrowing, but the U.S. will be able to borrow. The EU will be able to borrow, um, unless there is a plausible alternative to people wanting to hold dollars and euros. And that gets back to the question about the, the renminbi. If China opened up, if China developed you know, deep, liquid, private financial markets, then there might be a willingness to move out of the dollar and the euro, but that's a, that seems like it's a very long way off. To, two remarks to that. I wouldn't say that the Remimbi is the alternative, digital currencies, other currencies. I mean, it was very interesting to see how when Facebook started to say, we create a digital currency, how all the regulators, all the policymakers around the world really went not went crazy about that and stopped this project. Because this is really the danger if the people lose the trust in our financial system, in our fiat money. So I wouldn't say, and the other thing, I fully agree, is a policy, policy decision. It's a decision by policymakers. The question is, is this a good or a bad decision? Mm -hmm. And we can see that Japan, for example, has mountains of debt, but no growth at all. This is more or less a, a stagnant country for the last years. It's not monoculture, it has not only to do with the debt burden, but you have this crowding out effect. And if all the capital and all the energy is soaked up by the public sector, then there's nothing left for the private sector. And the cyber private sector gets a little bit uh, stagnant and manic. And this is then for sure, I mean, to, to find, I'm fully with you, I mean, to find the right balance To, to have this kind of, that you really still induce the animal spirits of the private sector and have no crowding out effect and use the right money to, but then I think it's right to take some risk, to have this blended finance, to take some anchor investments. You don't have to go full way. And what we now see that we've spent, as I said, I mean, this is this Intel factory. I mean, probably everybody in the room knows about this in Dresden, 20 billions. This Intel gets 20 billion just to build a fab factory, a fab here in Dresden for nothing. Yeah. And it's all technology. I mean, it's not, I'm not an expert, but it's not this, this super, super small thing, but it's more like the, the bulky stuff you can put into cars, for sure. I mean, we, we, we love to have something for our cars, but <laughs> I mean, it's not really that you see, you see. Not state needed. of the art technology. This is a way where I think we should find a better balance. But 
for sure, it's a political decision. And this was a political decision taken by our political, in the name of resilience, in the name of autarky. We need ship production here in Germany and not only in Taiwan. If, especially if we still will be producing cars in 10 years from now, which is another discussion. <laughs> But I see that we have issues that will remain unresolved. I would like to thank all of you very much for your input in uh, the short amount of time. I'm, I'm quite interested to continue the discussion, but maybe this can happen afterwards also with the audience. And before you leave the room, we want to take a picture of the panel, so whoever is on stage, gather wherever Stormy, Stormy tells us to be for the picture. And thank you very much to the audience for listening. I think we'll just rise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the trees are very good. We are in the representation of Baden-Württemberg. Um, and if you have not been there yet, uh, Baden-Württemberg is known for its good food. So, but thank you so much um, for joining us uh, today, Heather. I know that you have an extremely busy schedule. You are at a conference, you are speaking, um, you are triple engaged. Um, then you have um, an election going on, um, a campaign going on. There are so many uh, policies which have to be put onto the ground. Um, and then the Germans come around the corner and want to hear from you all about Bidenomics and how it works and uh, what you do better than us. So thank you so much for joining us um, and give Heather a big applause for being here today. So Heather is a, a member of uh, President Biden's Council of Economic um, Advisors. And um, Heather, before we start, and I hand over to you um, for your introductory remarks, maybe you can tell us what is the Council of Economic Advisors? <laughs> so the, the, the Council of Economic Advisors was founded in 19, as a part of the 1946 Full Employment Act. It created this advisory group for the president to advise him on economic policy issues. That same law also created a somewhat similar group in Congress called the Joint Economic Committee that advises Congress about economic and economic policy issues. But here at the Council of Economic Advisors, we have about 40, 45 um, staff, and most of them are economists from universities and from government all across um, the country and all across different agencies to um, advise the president on some of the most pressing economic issues. And in fact, um, this week, we are releasing our this year's um, economic report of the president, which is required by law that we produce each year. So Heather, you are one of the most vocal and known voices um, in the United States um, on um, inclusive growth. And you have been doing, I mean, uh, from an academic point of view, but also from a practical point of view. Um, what were your first thoughts when President Biden asked you to join his council? Oh, I was, <laughs> I was absolutely thrilled. Um, I had been working with him on the campaign. I was a part of the transition. And the ideas that the president had, how he wanted to, to use his words, change the paradigm about how we thought about economic growth and how we made um, equity a core part of that um, was just so exciting to be able to be a part of that team and to join his administration. And you're just still as excited as in the beginning. <laughs> Well, this president has accomplished amazing things. Um, you know, the last Congress was one of the most productive in generations, um, able to pass legislation in a bipartisan way, but also when he needed to, just with Democrats, um, that are that just game-changing legislation for the United States. And I mean, that's really what I want to talk about with you all today, the American Rescue Plan, the um, Inflation Reduction Act, the Chips and Science Act, and of course the bipartisan infrastructure law that are really reshaping um, the federal government's involvement in the U.S. economy and to a lot of strong effects. We're already seeing uh, in so many ways how this has created an economy that has been more resilient, stronger, and um, seen robust job gains for Americans all across the United States. And with this, I hand over to you, um, and we are very much looking forward to hearing more about what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emma, so much. I'm so excited um, to be able to be a part of this conversation here today. Um, thank you um, to the audience, and I apologize that I can't be with you in person. Um, I'm in Paris um, at the OECD um, uh, talking economics here. Um, so thank you for your indulgence. So let me get right down to it. 
Uh, when the president came into office, uh, we were facing a series of economic crises, just like um, countries all around the world. Of course, we were facing the pandemic and the ensuing recession. But the, but the president also knew that there were a series of longstanding economic challenges, one of which was just referred to the longstanding challenge of inequality. You know, the United States has had over half a century of rising economic inequality across a variety of axes, leaving our um, economy uh, more fragile and our society more vulnerable. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, we had the existential crisis of climate change, which the United States had not been able to make the kind of steps that we knew we needed to make um, on that important and pressing issue. And then you add to that that during the pandemic, one of the things we learned was that, um, or one of the things that we all saw was how fragile our global supply chains were. While some folks, you know, scholars have been studying this, it really came into full view that um, global supply chains were much more fragile and that this was putting, uh, making our economy vulnerable. So in light of these challenges, the president during the campaign laid out a vision to not just build back from the pandemic, to build our economy back from that recession, but to, in his words, build it back better. So he paired um, the short-term challenges of the pandemic and the recession with these longer-term challenges around equity, climate change, um, economic resiliency. And um, he knew that we would not be able to do this alone. So that's the theme of what I want to say this, this, um, say this afternoon. So he did this through passing three, um, uh, or actually four, really important pieces of historic legislation, which I will just again briefly outline. Um, first, of course, is the economic recovery through the American Rescue Plan. You know, the United States has now had an unemployment rate below 4% for a whopping 25 months in a row. That is a longer, longest stretch in time going back over half a century. That is an enormous accomplishment. And we got that unemployment rate down far faster than forecasters were predicting because of the bold and decisive actions that the president took. But that American Rescue Plan was also a down payment on longer term economic change. And through the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is making foundational investments in infrastructure all across the United States, much of which has been um, too long overdue. Um, on top of that, we have these capacity and expanding sector-based investments in semiconductors and, of course, in clean energy through the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. These are designed to enhance um, our productive capacity and to make sure that we are encouraging the private sector to invest in the things that we need the most, um, to be on the cutting edge of new technologies, and so importantly, to build a clean energy economy that will benefit not just those of us across the United States, but around the world, and to use our power and our resources to be able to make that change. So there are three pillars of Bidenomics, and um, I just want to emphasize, and I'll just briefly mention what each of those are. The first is that we're investing in America. So that's those four pieces of game-changing legislation. It's investments that are happening all across the United States. And I do want to just emphasize that it is our view that it is not a choice at this moment whether to invest in clean energy. We know that there are enormous gaps in the amount of resources that need to be invested in clean energy on the public level, but also from the private sector if we're going to meet our um, zero emissions goals, if we're going to meet our climate targets. And so a, a key part of the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and also to some extent the other laws, is to crowd in that private investment. Um, in order to be able to um, push those technologies forward and um, lower costs for these technologies across the board. So again, not just for the United States, but for but uh, around the world. And we do that, um, This again, this first pillar of binomics, investing in America, we are making these investments on both the supply and the demand side. So I think it's really important as we've been thinking about our modern American industrial strategy, it isn't just one tool. It is a host of tools from the um, across the innovation to commercialization pipeline um, and on both supply and demand. So um, we are in incentivizing the on the supply side by investing in goods that have strong positive externalities. We are sending clear demand signals with consumer facing tax credits um, and using the government's purchasing power to change what government is buying because um, uh, the United States is such an important player in so many markets. 
We are solving market failures that include coordination um, problems across complementary investments. For example, there's excellent research out there now showing that consumers, one of the reasons consumers are wary of making the switch to electric vehicles is because they don't see charging um, a charging network out there. So the government is stepping in and making those investments in that charging network alongside helping um, those companies that are making the cars make that transition to producing batteries and electric vehicles. And then on top of helping consumers purchase those and make them more affordable. It's now the case that electric vehicles in the United States are um, about on par and may even start to be lower than the cost of internal combustion engine vehicles. And we do all of this through um, unlocking private capital, reducing credit risks through demonstration projects, loans, loan guarantees to, to, um, to build that bridge to bankability so that firms can be successful in these cutting edge technologies. And um, the benefit of all of this it is, it is that it is able to crowd in private investment through what we call our government-enabled private sector-led approach. Um, you know, our estimates, um, and these are from about a year ago, um, but our estimates are that this, um, this pathway that we've chosen, the Inflation Reduction Act, could lower global um, clean energy costs by about um, 25% for some technologies, benefiting not just the United States, but um, everyone around the world um, through being able to afford these um, uh, easier. Let me briefly go through the other two pillars, and then I want to give you a couple of, um, of success stories. So the second pillar of Bidenomics is that we are empowering and educating workers. And throughout our modern American industrial strategy and throughout our investments in infrastructure, we are doing so with an eye to creating good jobs, to um, encouraging the formation um, where workers want it of unions. This is the most pro-union president, certainly in my lifetime here in the United States, the only president to go to a picket line um, in, uh, in, the, in the historical record. Um, but throughout our policies, we are focused on making sure that workers have the skills and uh, have access to the skills and training they need through partnering with businesses, especially in cutting edge technologies, um, to make sure that they are communicating what those skills that they need are and making sure that we are creating good jobs. Those companies that get tax credits for making investments, they get a bump up, they get a bonus if they make those investments in ways that pay higher wages or use um, what in our country we call registered apprenticeships. I know we've learned a lot from the Germans um, on apprenticeship programs. Um, so that is a really important piece of the puzzle. And one of our one of the president's goals from day one, he did a day one executive order around equity and has been committed to leaving no community behind. And so part of these investments in empowering and educating workers is making sure that we're utilizing place-based policies, um, commitments to help communities that have been too long left behind or might be at risk of being left behind, a focus on energy communities, on um, what we call Justice 40 communities, communities that have been um, left behind in terms of economic and environmental justice, and really focusing on regional hubs. So, um, so that is the second pillar of Bidenomics. Then the third pillar of Bidenomics, so we're investing in America, we're empowering and educating workers, and we're making sure that we do so in ways where markets are fair and competitive. Now, I'm an economist, and I really like this third pillar, and I feel like we don't talk about it enough um, because it's, it's thinking deeply about how markets work. You know, the United States was one of the um, world leaders over, you know, a century and a half ago of putting in place um, what is called antitrust legislation, legislation to break up monopolies, to make sure that markets were competitive. But in, um, in recent decades, in the latter half of the 20th century, there was less and less enforcement of those, um, of those principles. And we saw rising economic concentration across the U.S. economy. And part of the president's commitment has been to make sure that we are thinking about competition, that we are making sure that markets are fair and competitive, and that's benefiting consumers, but also benefiting small businesses and also benefiting workers. There's been a lot of research done in recent decades about how economic concentration leads to worse outcomes for workers. They, they are paid less. They don't have as many options. And so the president has made a real commitment to this and a specific commitment in his industrial policy to focus on those competition issues. So, for example, um, for the very first time, the U.S. government released guidance to agencies as they are putting together rules and regulations 
how to do so with an eye to thinking about market structure and competition issues on the front end, rather than just um, waiting for the antitrust um, legal authorities, the Department of Justice or the, um, the Federal Trade Commission coming in after the fact to break up monopolies, uh, monopolies. really thinking about that in a forward leaning way. Um, and that has also been um, really important as we've thought about, again, going back to uh, the example of electric vehicles, as we thought about the charging networks, how do we make sure that those markets um, have clear standards, they're open, they're fair, and we're not putting our thumb on the dial of anyone or thumb uh, on the scale for any one particular uh, firm. So those are the three pillars of Bidenomics, investing in America, empowering and ed educating workers, making sure that markets are fair and competitive. And we've been doing all of this with, a, with an eye to um, making sure that we are focused on our partners and allies, thinking about how we can create more resiliency across our supply chains through um, what we have called and others have called friendshoring, and to really focus on those positive economic spillovers um, from, the, um, from these investments on the global economy to drive down the cost of clean energy and also to work together to create new global supply chains that can be resilient and, um, and, and effective for all of us. And so having given you the briefest of rundowns of what we're doing on Bidenomics, let me spend a few moments going over um, some of my favorite success stories. Um, so if I was going to show you a bunch of slides, I would show you just a bunch of just jaw-droppingly awesome slides. So let me see if I can describe them to you uh, here um, so you get a sense of just how impressive this economic recovery has been and the strength of what the president has been building for the future. So first, as I already noted, um, we got the unemployment rate down far faster than forecasters expected, and we've been able to keep the unemployment rate below 4%. There were also moments in 2023 where the gap in the unemployment rate between the state in the United States with the highest unemployment rate and the lowest unemployment rate hit a record low. It's really important to the president because that means that we are growing more evenly. It means that no state was um, dis as disproportionately left behind as, as happened in prior economic recoveries. Um, on the president's watch, we've created almost 15 million jobs, and we've had three years of record applications to start new businesses. That is a signal of optimism and hope in the US economy. People are saying, I wanna start a new business, I'm gonna get out there and do that. And um, year after year, we've seen these numbers go up, up all across the country. Um, so that is, um, th those are signs of strength. We've also seen wages outpacing inflation for the better part of a year now. Um, and wage gains continue to be strong um, for those at the bottom end um, of the labor market. Of course, like our like our friends and allies and people around the world, we have seen this um, relatively high inflation. We have been able to get that pace of inflation to come back down. Um, it is not where we need it to be. We know that we still have more work to do. The president talks about this, but that is an important um, uh, it coming that trend coming down is certainly an important accomplishment. The second set of accomplishments are around our investments. Um, one of the things that um, we've been able to see is a skyrocketing increase in the investment of new in the construction of new manufacturing facilities across the United States, um, in um, uh, particularly around um, the production of electronics. So that has increased by over 100%. Um, and it is contributing, it is now contributing more to US economic growth than at any point going back um, to the 1950s. So that is an indication of what's to come. We're making the, we're, we are growing our economy by making this investment in these new structures, and then those jobs and that um, productivity enhancements will come over time. We have seen um, uh, over 40,000 new infrastructure projects announced all across the country in communities um, like covering, if I were to show you a map, it's covered in little dots. This is happening all across the country, and we're seeing those investments in new roads, um, new access to broadband, um, people getting uh, pipes and going to their home that don't have lead, so we're not poisoning our children, um, making sure that every community has sewers, and a whole bunch of other investments, including in the grid. We've also seen um, across the country um, investments totaling almost $650 billion, I think it's $649 billion the last time I looked, in private sector investments in semiconductors, clean energy, electric vehicles, manufacturing. Um, 
And one of the things that's really important about those investments is that they too are happening all across the country and consistent with the president's commitment to leave no community behind, those investments, those private sector investments that have been induced by the public dollars are disproportionately going to communities that need it most. They're going to communities where the the majority of people who live there are disproportionately don't have a college degree. It's going to lower income communities. So that is, again, another testament to this place-based policies. Um, The way that the president has been thinking about his industrial strategy as a place-based policy is showing fruit already. They were seeing these gains across the country, not just in some parts, not just in urban parts, um, but all across the United States. And um, so that is um, that is my whirlwind tour of Bidenomics that I wanted to take you on today. Um, I think I've hit all the high points that I wanted to touch on. Um, I, I want to emphasize one last point before I let you um, uh, uh, ask me some questions. <laughs> Um, and that is that, you know, the president came into office with with a plan, a plan to reshape the U.S. economy, a plan to not just build back from the pandemic, but to build back better and a plan that would allow the United States to play the role that we need to be playing to make the investments, to build um, with our with our partners around the world, to build a clean energy economy and to make sure that we have access to cutting edge technologies that are so important to our economic growth and stability. Um, And it's exciting to see early indications of the success of this, the strong economic growth we've seen, but also this robust investment that will hopefully benefit um, us for decades to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much. So Heather, I don't know if you saw that, but I made a face a couple of times looking up at the ceiling. That was not because of your statement, but because we lost the video for a second. We were able to listen to you for the whole time, but for a few seconds, we couldn't see your picture. And that's why I was um, trying to signal we have to get her back. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, I I, I do have to admit, I would love to have you all by myself asking you a lot of questions, (laughs) but I will share you with the audience immediately immediately, because I know that they do have um, a lot of questions, um, and um, it is not so often that we have the opportunity to actually talk um, with somebody so close to the president, um, giving him advice on a daily basis, and just a few days before your big economic uh, report comes out. So as I said, I'm going to share her with you. So who would like to come in immediately with a question? Maybe we can collect a couple of them, and then I hand it back uh, again to Heather. And now, don't be shy, you know. Yeah, Daniel, please. And if you would stand up and not look at me, but look at the camera so so Heather can see you. (laughs) Oh, do we have the mic? There it comes. Yeah, we need the mic, otherwise we can't hear. Um, Our audience, online audience, can't hear us. Thank you. Um, hi, Heather. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm an economist and a lawyer. And uh, I want to express appreciation for the very structured way you've allowed us um, to gain insight in a split second in, uh, in what is going on. Um, we tend to, uh, you know, look transatlantic these days. Um, but, you know, looking transatlantic forces us to try to understand what our transatlantic friends uh, are doing trans-Pacific and how they look trans-Pacific. Because I think, at least from the distance, there is some potential changes in the policy coming up subtly, uh, sometimes more boldly. But can you help us to understand priorities and focus trans-Pacific and what it means for transatlantic? Heather, thank you. Thank you so much. And there's one up here. Was it Molly? No. Annika? Oh, then I hand over. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm facing backwards up. Where, where's the camera? Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi. My name is Brittany Walters. Um, I'm with the Brunswick Group. And so, apropos, I have a communications question. Um, I know that the Biden administration is doing a great job. And when I speak to my family, what I hear is a lack of understanding for these economic policies. 
And I feel like that's been reflected in some of the coverage of late, that if you ask Americans, they feel like they're not doing better, even though they are markedly doing better. So I was just wondering how you're thinking about communicating that in light of the, the campaign season kicking off and um, how we're moving forward in 2024 with the way that we communicate that message. Um, we, me, being part of the Biden administration. What I meant is as a Democrat. <laughs> um, and I look forward to hearing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, please. In the back wall. Uh, hi, Heather. Uh, my name is Tashar. Uh, I work with the Diplomat magazine in DC. Uh, my question had to do with, you mentioned um, friendshoring, and uh, here we've had a lot of discussions about how to align our investment and economic policy for private companies with the security policies uh, and incentivize, sorry, incentivize uh, private companies to align with that further. I just want to ask what measures have your uh, government taken uh, to try and encourage friendshoring and investment in friendly countries uh, amongst the private sector? Because that does seem to be a big question mark here in Germany. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I was just um, signaled by the team, Heather, that I totally went off script because we did not discuss with your team that I would include the audience. And I hope it is OK. <laughs> I'll answer what I can. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you so much. And with this, I hand uh, back to you again. Yes, um, these are great questions. And I'll, I'll kind of I'm, I'm going to pull my answers together. Um, Listen, I think that, you know, one of the most important things, and um, uh, I think the administration has been, you know, very clear that, you know, we are focused on making sure that our economy is um, it's strong, it's equitable, it's resilient. And, you know, from my perspective as an economist, when you look out and you think about, well, what are some of the challenges that we face, um, uh, the resiliency of global supply chains and what those, those are going to look like in the future is certainly a, a, a front and center issue. So when you ask about how we're thinking about friendshoring or working with allies and, and our relationship with the Pacific, um, you know, making sure that we have stable and resilient um, uh, supply chains is a, is a core goal. Um, and one of the things that we know is that, and this is, you know, I went over the three pillars of, of Bidenomics, investing, in America, empowering and educating workers, and that markets are fair and competitive. And in core parts of the clean energy supply chains, they are um, heavily dominated um, by one country. And that is um, that lead, that creates a, a potential lack of resiliency, real, um, in, in many cases, all, we're seeing real indications of that in, 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 in some ways already. Um, and creates challenges. And so one of the things that we are focused on is making sure that that we all have access to the things that are so important that we need. Um, you know, we are also making sure that for national security reasons, along with all of the cutting edge technology reasons, that we are making these game changing investments in uh, uh, semiconductors so that we are able to have a more uh, resilient global supply of the things that we think matter the most. We all saw what happened during the um, lack of supply of semiconductors, of course, during the pandemic is one example, but of course, there are national security issues there as well. I would say on the issue of understanding, um, this is a question that we get a lot, and um, I would say a couple of things. Um, first, you know, when you look at polls, um, uh, Americans are highly favorable of the specifics of what the president has put in place everything from reducing the price of insulin um, for seniors to negotiating with prescription, um, in negotiating over prescription drug prices with drug companies, the big pharma, um, to you know, cutting costs through a whole host of, of um, ways, including addressing junk fees, to the investments that we're making in infrastructure around the country, um, and the investments that we're making in many of the aspects of the clean energy economy. I think one of the challenges is that when you throw all of these things together in big pieces of legislation, um, I, I don't expect that my mom or, or Americans are, are tracking all the names of different things, but we do know that when people see, oh, this is what he's doing, this is what he stands for, you see time and time again that the polls are highly favorable, and in many cases um, along those, uh, uh, around those specifics on a bipartisan basis. Um, one of the things, though, is that and I, I mean, I will say it this way. We came out of a global pandemic. It was very challenging to people all across the country, all across the world, right? People had someone in their family die. It was very scary. Their lives were upended. 
We also know now that millions of Americans changed their jobs. Some of them, you know, upskilled their jobs. Some of them are starting new businesses. Millions of them also bought new homes. All of these things are um, maybe exciting and fun, but they also make people feel a little insecure. And then, of course, on top of that, we had an economic narrative about a year and a half, two years ago that started to develop that, wow, there was no way that we were going to get through 2023 without a recession. And every news story, for, I felt like for a year, every time I went on television, it was like, when's the recession going to happen? When's the recession going to happen? And we were like, well, actually, we've put a lot of um, resources in place. We put in a lot of policies and we don't think we're going to see a recession. And in fact, this has been the strongest economic recovery um, out of any recession in um, in decades, certainly over my professional career, decades going back um, uh, many, many years. And um, the hard thing, though, is that that's not the way that it was teed up for, for many, many months, years um, in the media. And now I think as we're looking at that in the rearview mirror and saying, oh, actually, growth was quite robust and we have been able to get um, the pace of inflation down. I think people are starting to realize that we've actually had a number of months now of consumer confidence going up. And again, people are very favorable about the specifics. And now um, all of these new investments that we're making, they take time. Um, and this, I think, also has an international component as well. These investments aren't they um, they aren't going to happen overnight. It takes time to develop the um, uh, uh, not just the investment in a single factory, but in that new new ecosystem around it, in those new supply chains that it needs. There's a lot of like uh, new challenges when you're building real things and um, helping people see what that looks like in their community, what those investments look like. That's you know what, what my colleagues, the president, the cabinet officials and myself, what we are all doing each and every day to go out and communicate that to people. It's one of the reasons I wanted to be able to make time to talk to you all today is to talk about what our economic vision is. And um, and we need you all to um, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, to also help us communicate this to the public who may feel a little anxious or nervous um, about these big changes that are happening um, in their life that may make them feel a little insecure. But I think what this president tries to say every day is that he has a plan and he has been putting in place policies that are benefiting the American people and are creating greater economic security and, in his words, building the economy from the middle out. Thank you very, very much. We know that you have to go and we will let you go in just a second. But maybe you can tell us, because we had quite a few OECD representatives with us over the course of the last two days, and also WTO representatives and some others. What are you actually doing at the OECD in Paris right now? <laughs> Um, actually, today, um, I, I, I'm here with the team um, uh, uh, sort of focused on the micro issues, the, the working party one. And we're actually having a retreat to talk about what this what this group um, at the OECD should be prioritizing. Um, they have been prioritizing issues around AI and climate change and green jobs and housing and um, competitiveness issues. It's a wonderful, rich agenda. We're going to spend the next two days talking about it. And then importantly, tomorrow, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about industrial policy mm. um, uh, and, you know, and the really important role that economists and experts at the OECD play in helping us understand this toolbox that we are using to build a clean energy economy um, and what that means around the world and how we can think about measuring economic success. Well, thank you so very, very much. And also for being such a good sport um, for going off um, the, uh, the, the pre-discussed line <laughs> of this event. Thank you so much. And next time we would love to have you here whenever you uh, decide that you want to go to Paris and not just to Paris, but also make the diversion via Berlin. And I always say Berlin might not be as pretty as Paris, but we are really exciting. Um, so <laughs> um, <laughs> let us know. We would love to have you. Um, and some of us, um, apart for doing our work at Aspen or at policy making or in the business community are also teaching. Um, and I know that you are a great role model um, for lots of lots of uh, us uh, in the teaching world. And we would love to have you as a role model also to our students. So please let us know. <laughs> oh, Stormy, thank you so much. That's so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so um, that, that wonderful. Thank you so much. And with us, we let you go and have well, good luck for all the uh, discussions at the OECD. Thank you.
So, um, this is wonderful, um, and um, we are coming close to the end of our conference already. Um, I don't know where the last one and a half days really went, they went so fast, um, but we still have a really important uh, panel coming up. And uh, maybe um, uh, we can change the stage. Um, because now we want to dig a little bit deeper into the issue of sustainability and the global economy. And we also want to talk about solutions. Um, I mean, we talked a lot of problems um, in the last couple of days. Um, we also had the opportunity in our breakout sessions to already talk about sustainable supply chains with a close focus on human rights issues, but also uh, the environment. We had a finance panel um, where we also talked about um, sustainability standards for the financial sector and for companies. And now we want to all bind it together. Um, and uh, we called it thinking outside the box, and I hope that we are going to be able um, to do so. Because if we are looking um, into the world, we see a multi, really a polar crisis, right? I mean, um, we feel very strongly the, all those new conflicts around the world, and not just conflicts, but also wars. And if you look at the Heidelberg barometer for conflicts, for example, you see that there is a real increase of uh, the number of conflicts. Um, so it's not just something we feel, but which takes place in reality. Um, but we also have not overcome the repercussions um, of the pandemic yet. I mean, a lot of countries are still struggling massively um, with uh, recovering. Um, and while we are already pretty well off, um, there are many countries in, and we had a panel on that as well, the Global South, um, who are still struggling immensely. Um, and many of them are highly indebted also something we talked about earlier. And the resources are very small to do the necessary investments. At the same time, we have climate change going on um, with massive requirements for investment um, to mitigate, but also to um, adapt. And we have the digital revolution going on, um, which uh, has a lot of potential, but at the same time creates also quite a few anxieties. And then all of those political developments and trends within our countries. So there is actually a lot to do at the same time. And, um, and that is a struggle for companies, but, it's, uh, but certainly also for policymakers. Um, and um, Maybe we come up with some creative solutions um, on this panel. And uh, for this, let me introduce um, our panelists. And uh, the first one, who I would also then like to, uh, to invite to come to the stage, um, is Sibylle Gabler. Sibylle is member of the management board, external relations divisions, uh, division of Dean. Sibylle, give her a big applause. So, the Villas, thank you for being here, um, and thank you for also supporting this conference the second time in a row. Um, pleasure. What does sustainability mean to you? Well, obviously, I'm always going to talk about the solutions that come from standards. And, um, well, uh, I will give a few examples when we, when we start the discussion, um, how standards can um, facilitate sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, it is a big topic for Dean. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> This, uh, please take a seat wherever you want to sit. <laughs> the next one who I would love to, uh, to invite to come up here is uh, Christina Gomlich. She is head of Berlin Office Corporate Government Relations of BASF, also one of our supporting partners. And we've known each other also for a long time since um, our work um, at BDI. So thank you so much for joining us and give her also a big applause. <laughs> So no, 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 don't sit. No, 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 no. The spiel, the spiel is first a question, then ah, sitting. Okay. Ah, okay. So you have to. <laughs> I'm very sorry. So, ah. so the same to you. Um, what does sustainability mean to you? Well, I obviously also have to speak for my, um, for my company um, um, and for BSF. Um, it's our purpose. Um, so we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And um, it's basically um, the nucleus of the business that we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. The next one who I would like to ask to come and join me, where is she, um, is Natalie uh, Martin Hübner. Where, there she comes. Give her a big applause. <laughs> 
she is uh, head of government affairs at uh, Robert Bosch. So you are responsible for the representation here in Berlin, but also for all of Europe and the international affairs of Bosch and government relations. Yes, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you have quite a portfolio. Yeah. Uh, oh, not only on, uh, in the products, but also uh, with the topics uh, which come along with products and the services we, and, uh, we have. And sustainability comes in how in your daily work? Um, I think it's one of the greatest challenges we have at the moment. Uh, but I think as well that there is a bunch of engineers in our company that want to make the world better. And that's why I'm very confident that we have got something to offer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and let's hear a little bit more about this, uh, this later. So I would also like to ask uh, Hubertus Petto, um, president um, of the German Agriculture Society. So please uh, join us also here on the stage. <laughs> And now you might ask, or our audience might ask, why did we um, in, uh, invite somebody from the agricultural sector? Um, and um, for you, it is pretty obvious how much sustainability is involved, but maybe you can also tell our audience. Yes, that's easy because <laughs> I'm not only the president of DLG, but I'm also a farmer on myself. And I have children, and uh, obviously I want to do everything I can that my children can do the same job as I do, uh, successful in the future for a long time and help creating food for people. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. May I ask you a cheeky question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were you um, one of those in the big tractors on the streets of Berlin? No, no. 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 <laughs> no. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That, that's not GLG style. Yeah. We okay. Are a scientific organization, yes. Mm. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for yes. joining us. Um, and last but not least, um, I also would like to, where is he, invite uh, Loyal Campbell to come up here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> also, give him a big applause. You are a research fellow um, at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Yes. Um, we had already quite a few um, fellows from the uh, DGRP, mm -hmm. which isn't surprising because it's one of Germany's uh, biggest and oldest foreign policy think tanks. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, what, is the, well, what are you currently writing on? Um, th yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be participating here. I'm currently working on... Um, Geoeconomic policy, uh, specifically focusing on electric vehicles and what that might mean, and uh, Germany and Europe's role in multilateral initiatives uh, covering re renewable energies. So sustainability has something to do with geopolitics and Absolutely. economics? Absolutely. Okay, I think we want to learn a little bit more about this. Um, but first, also the question to you, sustainability means what? Um, sustainability, uh, for me, it means something that's socially, environmentally uh, sustainable. So there's the, for me, I have a very, very emphasized the social, the social part. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So if you want to join us as well. Um, and why I ask all of you to say something about sustainability in the beginning is uh, to set the stage, but also to say what we are talking about when we talk about sustainability. And maybe we can get a little bit more deep uh, into this, um, because some might think sustainability is all around environmental issues, right? Um, some might say it's all about labor and social issues. Um, and some might say it is mostly about economic issues. But I guess it's listening to you, it's all three of this. Um, so um, maybe I can start out um, with a question uh, to you, Natalie, to get a little bit more deeply into, into the issue of all three aspects um, of sustainability. Um, I started my introductory words by painting a pretty grim picture about the world and all the, all the crises we are currently um, facing. Um, what does this mean for, for the business, for the actual business practices? So how do you maneuver in this, in this field? Yes, I think I already mentioned it. I, uh, we are a company of 420,000 associates uh, who really strive for making the world better uh, with the products and the services we offer. Uh, with a large research and uh, development department. So I think um, there is really much we can have and make. And I think innovation is really key 
um, to make this world or to, to bring in sustainable uh, technologies which help uh, to give the entire population of the world the possibility to contribute, uh, to make more energy efficient uh, cooking or uh, to have electri electrified uh, vehicles or um, to be um, sustainably digitized, to have a more efficient um, autonomous driving or automated uh, manufacturing and so on. So I think, as I said, we have a very large portfolio and many services to offer. So that's one side of, of the coin. Um, on the other side, or oh, well, on the same side of the coin, we have a policy that gives the trend and gives incentives and pushes industry into a direction uh, which is necessary because uh, if civil society doesn't change uh, the, the mindset, uh, nobody would be interested in the products we offer. So I think regulation is again key to bring the framework where in which the products are uh, uh, fine consumers and I think that's uh, very important. But one of the main challenges at the moment we uh, see is that regulation is somehow conflicting. It's not harmonized, it's not standardized, and uh, we have got the problem that we act in a global environment, and in this global environment we have a very, very fragmented um, framework, and uh, it's really difficult to see how to get through uh, the regulatory uh, situation, and um, competitive systems instead of cooperative systems. Mm. And uh, that's my last sentence. I think if we really want to resolve uh, the climate change problem, then we should uh, standardize and cooperate instead of being too competitive. Mm -hmm. And Natalie, you and your company um, are um, very active on both sides of the Atlantic. So you do have uh, different mm -hmm. standard sets. Um, and looking at climate change or climate protection policies, they differ a little bit. <laughs> so yeah. we are now, in, um, we in the EU have um, the border adjustment mechanism mm -hmm. um, being in the implementation phase. Um, in the US, you have more the investment side. Um, is that an issue for Bosch? Yes, uh, it is an issue uh, because we have to adapt to the different systems. So on both uh, sides of the Atlantic we have a different system. But I think we welcome very much the Inflation Reduction Act because we, have, we see many opportunities and I think the system is really... Um, it brings a large bunch of incentives, so uh, you uh, address on the same side the uh, consumers with tax um, incentives and with investment incentives at the same time. And uh, that's why we have been in discussions with the um, American government as well on some investments we made as a company. So I think we, we are able to... Um, take both offers and we see in the European Union as well that we need to, um, to, to, to stay on eye level, we need those carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms because if not you have a um, very unfair competition and you risk uh, the single market situation. Mm. So I think that's... Mm. But we are very agile, so <laughs> we deal with it, but I, I think we would be very happy if, if it would be more harmonized instead of being fragmented. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And we will come back to the two climate policies um, in a second. Um, what I didn't ask all my panelists before we started, um, at Aspen we go by first name very quickly. May I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, so, looking at transatlantic climate and uh, especially energy uh, topics, we see some divergence there as well. Right. Um, so what does this, um, from your point of view and what you're working, working on, maybe you can tell us a little bit where we come closer hmm. together and where we are diverging a little bit more and what, if that is a problem or if maybe it's also good to have a little bit of competition. 
Um, yeah, no, I, th I think, uh, thank you very much for your question. I, I think the, the interesting thing is with having a divergence in paths is one can learn from one another. So um, the, 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 the real magic of the US IRA is that it's actually quite simple. Tax incentives and you know, uh, rebates, it's, it's really not as complicated as something that would come out of Brussels. Brussels and the European Union in general and all of the European member states have spent a large amount of money supporting um, green industry and supporting renewable energies, but a lot of it, getting access to that money is a lot more complicated. And regulations and qualifications, I mean, if you just look at the whole entire negotiation around the color of hydrogen and all of these things, it's the criteria are much more complicated than you have within the United States. And this is because energy is a, is a, is a national competence. You have divergence between the position on nuclear energy, between you know, say France and Germany, it's mm -hmm. quite stark. The position previously on Russian gas, again, quite stark. So the difference in energy policy, it really, really complicates the European decision in, the, in, this, in this space, whereas the United States is a little bit more flexible and a little more agile because there is, there is definitely discrepancies in, with, with, between the Democrat and Republican camp, but you, en you end up generally with this c consensus to support most types of energy, and there's, there's less discrimin there's, it's not there's discrimination, but there's more uh, acceptance of multiple energy types, which is, which is helpful because it simplifies the process. But there are lots of other spaces where there is room to learn from one another because, I mean, a good example is the supply chain due diligence kind of going through with uh, the solar things, examples like the solar stewardship initiative being supported by Solar Power Europe to try and bring environmental and social considerations into the supply chain, especially for, um, in this case, solar panels and solar panel components so that Europe uh, or countries like Europe or the United States kind of get... Um, credit, for think, credit for the investments they make in socially and environmentally mindful product, produced goods. Whereas you know, China, for example, doesn't really usually have a very good human rights track record or a very good environmental footprint with a lot of their manufacturing. So in this case, you can see different approaches to improve the supply chain and kind of, it's not that it per, is pursuing a competitive advantage, but you're internalizing um, conditions that your companies are, that are operating within Europe already observe. You know, a company in Sweden already observes Deserves better social practices than a company in China. A company in Sweden, powered mostly by hydropower, is probably already observing, um, you know, more investments in clean energy than you would be in, uh, in within China. So you're kind of bringing that cost within to the within to the scope of manufacturing. Um, but within the within the scope of electric vehicles, you do have this kind of uh, convergence of points between de-risking and decoupling and what that might look like, and what does that look like in the green supply chain, what that looks like in different technologies or different elements of the green supply chain. Uh, the, the interesting word of de-risking is this began in, within the European space, and this is normally within uh, foreign policy, you have a lot of big ideas and big terms and concepts coming from Washington and then coming to Europe from Washington, but in this case you have a very interesting where it goes in the opposite direction, where de-risking was really a European Thing, and that kind of moved back, moved over towards the Atlantic, and now you hear that rhetoric coming a bit more out of the, the U.S. administration. Um, but what does de-risking look like within the space? It's very hard to find, especially within the energy policy, um, to completely move investment uh, from energy, new energy products um, from China. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a clear-cut picture. Uh, because you can cooperate with Chinese companies outside of China. There is there's a lot of opportunity for this. You can have Chinese companies that are producing world-class batteries like BYD or CATL uh, co make a joint venture and co-produce batteries within Germany or co-produce mm -hmm. batteries within the European Union. But the issue with the United States has a different approach. We have the foreign entity of concern uh, identified within the IRA, or is it either within the IRA or the Build Back Better legislation. But it's 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 still one of those one of those pe one of those caveats that makes it a lot more complicated to have a component that could be potentially mm -hmm. sourced from China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's 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 both. I, actually, mm -hmm. I think it's actually also on the Chips mm -hmm. Act. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but we come back to to uh, the issue of uh, resilient mm -hmm. uh, supply chains a little bit later and okay. de-risking um, and decoupling. Okay. Um, and um, since you mentioned um, energy quite a bit from different points of view, um, I think it would be really good to hand over now to Christina, because you need <laughs> energy for production um, and you need uh, gas as an input as well. Um, so your company was hit pretty hard. Um, uh, by the by, by sanctions on Russia, but also um, decoupling strategies um, or de-risking strategies. But at the same time, um, you also have to massively deal with the green transition and uh, regulations coming out of uh, Brussels. So um, and and your 
your company has also faced some criticism, <laughs> but it is certainly also one, um, a strong pillar of the German economy, really strong pillar, an important pillar. So how do you maneuver that environment? What is, your, what, what is the company's strategy <laughs> <laughs> to deal with all those challenges at the same time? <laughs> um, basically, stiff upper lip and just, just stiff go upper lip. through it, um, um, to be honest. No, um, I mean, we, we obviously, yes, we're challenged, um, obviously. I mean, um, we're, we're um, a German-based company, um, but a global player, so, um, obviously, so, so we have um, lots of production in all regions of the world. Because for us, I, mean, that, I think that's the key to how we manage this, um, where they're where our customers are. So um, our customer base, um, insofar as it's European, um, we're in Europe. Um, for the US, we're in the US. In Asia, we're in Asia. Or in China, we're in China. And um, that is, um, and, and um, I think part of the challenge that we're seeing is um, that apart from, 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 from the very real changes in um, challenges to our competitiveness that we experience here in Europe um, due to the extremely um, yeah the shift in energy prices um, due to um, due to the to Russia's war on Ukraine um, but we also see um, a shift in the balance um, of markets and um, the largest chemical market um, is China and um, and and will be China it will be huge it will be 50 percent of the world market in a couple of years And um, if you're not there, um, as you say, if, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So the question um, is not um, if, <laughs> are we in China? The question is, are we enough in China? And, um, and the question is, um, is, is simply due to the fact that if we're not there, others will do the business there. Others will get the market share and they will grow and they will not stay in China. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, so unless you really um, ramp up the walls, um, um, to Europe, um, which will not work, protectionism doesn't work, um, then we will face an enormous um, competition from Asia, from China, from the US, um, which are also not sleeping. In fact, they're very um, much, um, well, catching up um, when it comes to um, competitiveness of green products. And um, yeah, and in Europe, we'll lose out. So um, what we do is um, we adapt. We have to, and um, we adapt, um, first of all, by adapting our operations, um, but we also, of course, adapt um, by advocating for better, um, um, b better, better frame conditions um, here in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where overregulation comes in, and um, I mean, and actually where, where, where the question is, um, is of the business case comes in. And I think that's um, at the center also of um, how to really transform, tra transform our, our industry or even the economy towards sustainability, it's we need a business case. Sustainability needs to be a business case. And um, at the moment, um, it's difficult. Um, because in order to be, to, to at least to be carbon neutral, and that's one of our goals, I mean, we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, um, and um, we want to reduce um, 25% of our um, CO2 um, emissions um, by 2030. Yeah, by 25% by 2030 compared to 2018. So, but in order to do that, we have to electrify. Electrification means, um, yeah, means renewables, means extremely high cost, um, and not only production cost, but also um, the, the, the whole network cost um, that are now um, added onto this. And um, at the moment, we still don't have consumers that really, that, that really pay for this. Mm. Um, and um, you can try again to adapt by pulling up walls around Europe and with a CBAM, which will not work. It will simply not work. It will have huge bureaucracy and the system will not work. Um, or you can try to, um, yeah, um, or, or you can try to do this by somehow creating a level playing field. And I think that's where um, mm. Transatlantic comes in. Mm. Okay, so you posed two questions to the whole panel, which we need to answer. Um, how uh, can we turn sustainability for the business sector into a business case um, so that it is worth investing, um, so that it comes naturally? Um, and the second question um, to all of our panelists we need to answer here is how we do it in a competitive way. Um, and how we stay competitive um, in the international markets. So I will not let you go from this panel before we answer all those two questions. I have good answers to this. Um, now I would like to, to look um, at a sector which is very close to all of us because we 
eat every day, <laughs> and um, the agriculture sector. Um, but, and, and so everybody has an opinion on it, right? Um, and you told us that you are um, both on the policy side, um, you're on the association side, but you're also a farmer. Um, the sector has huge implications for sustainability. Um, if not managed well, um, it can have a not so sustainable impact. Um, if it is managed well, it could have a huge impact um, for climate change, but also for social sustainability. So tell us a little bit about the challenges, but also the solutions. Yes, I try. Um, I think. Uh uh, the, the most important challenge you haven't mentioned, uh, because when we look at climate change, agricultural sector, food production, has the uh, 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 biggest challenge in adoption to climate change, because climate change will happen. We can do what we want, it will increase, the world's uh, temperature will increase by at least two degrees. And that's a big challenge for food production around the world. Uh, and that's my first point. And, um, you have uh, asked the question in the, in the briefing, um, what can we learn from agriculture? I, I'm not really sure whether agriculture is quite ahead when it comes to sustainability, um, yes, uh, increasing sustainability of the production. And um, there are a few reasons for that, and these reasons will show us um, the direction to the solution. Um, what we need uh, as, um, when we try to manage the um, sustainability of agricultural production better is uh, indicators. Mm -hmm. That's uh, not really a sexy thing, indicators. It has to do with science. You have to, to collect data and you have to write down the things you do. But it's really important because what I cannot measure, I cannot manage. That's an old, old um, truth. And uh, these indicators, they have to be um, outcome-oriented. That is one thing that is really important, but because at the moment we look at indicators when it comes to agricultural production that are input-oriented. We look at what amount of fertilizer we put into the system. But what is really interesting when it comes to sustainability is what is the impact on nature, on ecology, on, on social, of, of these uh, things we do. And so we have to try to evolve, um, um, to develop indicators that are more outcome or impact-oriented. And we have to standardize these indicators <laughs> around the world because farming is a global business. And when you, and that's the second thing, when you try to use these indicators to put a price tag, a sustainability price tag on the product, then you have to make sure that this price tag is the same around the world. Because when we uh, just say, okay, I have this German um, corn, and this ha it has this sustainability footprint, and I have this U.S. corn, and it's ha it has also a footprint, but it is based on different indicators, then we have no level playing field, and then we will uh, not uh, in evolve um, sustainability in a competitive way, because we need competition. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the last topic. We need the markets to, to um, make sure that the allocation of, of uh, sustainability efforts is best. And uh, we always in Germany talk about sustainability politics and that we can try to, to solve our sustainability challenges by Ordnungsrecht. That won't work. Uh, when mm -hmm. sustainability uh, becomes a business model for the, for the, for the um, companies and for the farmers, of course, then, um, then it uh, will uh, begin to be successful. And one, one um, example for this is organic farming. Uh, we all know organic farming has its own challenges, but organic farming is, is a, a system that puts a sustainability price tag on the product and the consumers, uh, they pay this price tag for the more sustainable quality of the products. And that's a, a thing that we can think about uh, also when it comes to, to different products. It, is it possible to, to uh, create a, a, a label for a product that uh, clearly uh, shows the sustainability impact of mm. this product? And is it possible to, to convince the consumers 
to pay the price for the production of this sustainable price. Mm -hmm. And that's the main challenge, and, uh, and we have to do this globally. It's not enough to do this in the, in the EU. We, we cannot um, yes, put a wall around Europe and, and say, okay, we are all fine with sustainability because we have to do global trade, um, uh, even in food systems. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for also sharing um, already a couple of ideas. Um, the price tech for sustainability, which the consumers, um, in a transparent way, um, then also pay for, which would create a business case um, to go more into sustainability. You also um, told us about standards and standardization, which is an important issue. Um, and I can tell you, um, you, you, you know this, um, but our audience uh, doesn't, not all of them at least, do know this. We do have a transatlantic farmer's program where we bring together eight farmers from the US and eight farmers from Germany um, to spend the year together virtually and physically to work on a specific topic. And last year we looked at climate change um, and they did talk a lot about standards. Not so much actually about sanitary and future sanitary standards. So if something is... Um, well, we don't need to get into this, but um, so everything around um, uh, f food or GMOs or hormone-treated beef. Um, what they really wanted to talk about was standards and measurements, how you measure, for example, CO2 content in the soil and CO2 binding capacity of the soil and how to create certificates and then how to trade them and how to make also money from this. So I found that very interesting. So thank you so much for bringing this in. And it's also the perfect lead over um, to Sibylle because um, you, well, we, we all know standard setting is your business. <laughs> you do it uh, trend within the EU. Um, you do it transatlantically, you do it internationally. Um, and you do it for many different sectors, also the agriculture sector, the smart uh, farming initiative, for example. Um, we also heard um, from Loyal about uh, China, um, and China is a player becoming more and more important standard setting. Um, so tell us a little bit about how much you can really influence sustainability with standards. Well, let me maybe take up the yes, smart, smart farming first, because that's, uh, it's actually a very nice um, example for how uh, transatlantic cooperation does work very nicely. We do have some example in standardization where it's, it's not working so nicely, but here um, an initiative goes actually back to um, a common conference Dean has with uh, our um, American colleagues, and um, we have that's a few years ago, where we have identified smart farming as an upcoming important topic. And at this stage, a few years later, we have um, a strategic advisory group at, at ISO, the International Standardization Organization, um, 40 different um, member organizations, so national standards bodies participating in that. They have come up with a recommendations paper, and there is a uh, technical committee on ISO level working on data-driven uh, agriculture. I think that's the, the official term. So this, this all relates to, to, to what you're saying. I hope they work on indicators. I'm, I'm <laughs> quite sure they are. Um, but that's really good news that we come together right on international uh, level, and I think we're also closely connected to, to the mm -hmm. uh, initiative you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. um, to your, to your, actually, I, I might also take up the question you, that you raised because it's uh, probably a good, good way to, to raise a little bit uh, understanding of what standards can, can do for you. Standards um, or sustainability as a, as a business case because one of my favorite stories from uh, past months is um, this, this guy who's um, a startup, uh, uh, you know, has, has a startup and he's trading uh, plastic recyclers, so recycled materials. Mm. And of course here, having a startup and having, you know, coming into um, an area where there's still quite some insecurity, trust is, is very important. And 
Um, here, um, standards can play a really uh, a positive role, and um, this guy has initiated a, a standard uh, or a specification under the roof of Dean. Uh, we have created a consortia, and um, they have come up with a standard. I have to, I have to read this. Um, classification of recycled plastics based on data quality levels for use and digital trading. So that's a very basic um, standard of how to... Um, yeah, put a quality level on, on pl plastic uh, materials. And, and with this, he was able to actually go out there and, and uh, create trust and start his, his business. And um, now, this standard will be used in, in Europe um, as part of how to roll out the uh, plastics strategy, the European plastic strategy. So this is an ideal example how you know, a bottom-up approach, a business-driven approach, can also you know, have some impact uh, in, in European policy and, and, and strategy. Um, so that's, that's very particular uh, um, uh, examples. Um, to your broader question, um, I mean, obviously, as, as we already said, uh, coming from Dean, I speak for the um, system that um, includes the European standardization organizations and, and ISO and IC on international level. And um, ISA particular, and I think IC has done the same, has taken a look at um, the, their body of standards. I mean, we're talking more than 20,000 technical uh, specifications and standards, and actually made a mapping um, uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so that, there's a, there's a Registry, you can you can look at look it up online. Um, which standard actually helps fulfill which goal? And just to give one example for SDG 13, um, mitigating climate change, combating climate change, um, they found uh, I think was it um, 1,095 standards that help uh, uh, fighting climate change. So. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people think, you know, standards are very much about, you know, uh, details, technical details. That is true for the individual standard. But when it comes to standardization as a whole, uh, or the, the, you know, the body of standards, they're, they're really a powerful tool to help us uh, uh, for in, the, in our quest for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and just a follow-up question to you. I mean... Standards are not set by one country alone, um, right? Um, they are also set on the international level. But I know that you have been in Washington also quite a bit, um, talking to your counterparts on the other side of the um, Atlantic. How well is standard setting for sustainability work internationally? I mean, is China signing up? Is India signing up? China and India are signing up. I mean, the, this, the standards uh, system is... Um, is a bit complicated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let Natalie me is laughing, so we are handing <laughs> over to her in a second. Let me, I mean, if you look at it transatlantically first, um, uh, let me try to put it in, 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 in fast words. I mean, in, in Germany, we have DIN and German stakeholders, German industry believes in the primacy of international standards. So they believe international standards should come first, then European standards, then national standards. And that's how we work. We also facilitate work and, and international standardization, where we meet China, India, uh, all kinds of other nations, including, of course, the U US. So uh, standardization is, is uh, primarily you know, business-driven, um, but with, in Europe, an added value of having a very close connection to regulation. Mm -hmm. I could go deeper into that if that's of interest. Um, so that's, that's the, the philosophy we have in Germany and Europe. Uh, in the US, there's a bit of a different philosophy where um, it's also business-driven, but also standardization itself is a business. So in the US, they believe the best standard uh, will prevail. Um, and that's a, that's a different attitude, obviously. And um, we've spent a lot of time in past years in trying to explain to each other the different systems. I think now with TTC, we've, you know, we've come a bit... Uh, yes, uh, we've proceeded to, to actually talk about uh, concrete topics. But um, in an ideal world, from a German point of view, we should all meet at, at ISO and IEC, where we do actually meet India, China, and so on. 
and they do invest a lot there in, in standardization. They, they do participate a lot. Um, but the bad news, that's the good news. The bad mm -hmm. is, news is uh, China is also doing their own standards on top of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Dean has committees in which companies take part. Um, and I think BASF and Bosch are both taking part in these committees. And was this one of the reasons why you were laughing when uh, Sevilla said it's complicated? <laughs> No, actually, um, no, no, I mean, of course it's complicated. I mean, what wouldn't be, um, especially when it comes to standardizing and in, in this multi-layered system, but no, no but I, I think it's great that we speak about standardization because um, that's something that has been a bit out of focus um, for the past years um, and um, because, because it's, uh, it's a long game. And, um, and, and building standards means um, you have to really look at business cases and products um, like five to ten years into the future, because with standards you also open and close markets, and um, which is also part of the charm, but of course also part of the problem, because um, as we understand it, um, the heavy involvement of, of China and India, especially China, um, especially when it comes to electronic standards, um, means that they are in fact, um, well, defining their own standards, their own markets, and if they have the products which prevail on the market, then we're out, and um, and then well, we have to adapt to their standards, which means that some of the investments, some of the ideas that we have here, will probably not be an international standard. So, um, and I think this is now. I think governments have started to understand that. Um, German government, we've spoken to them, and um, well, we, but the industry has spoken to them. And um, I think it's getting there, and we're also getting there in, in within the company to say that we really need to invest these resources in these standardization bodies, even though there is no immediate return on investment. Um, but um, that it's, yeah, that as we're in it for the long game, um, it's, it's something we need to look at, and we need to look at it in, especially in the transatlantic arena, because of course it's huge joint market. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's something where, um, yeah, where we, yeah, where, where there's, um, yeah, potential to reap, I think, um, for business and also for um, the transnational friendship. Mm -hmm. Natalie, do you also want to come in on that point? Yes, <clears throat> I think uh, Christina already mentioned uh, the most important things. Uh, the main question really is uh, the size of the market. And if you look at India or China, um, it's a closed shop in the end. So I think, and that's why it is so interesting if you say um, the best standard prevails, I think another, um, another quality comes in. It's, it's, it's a question of quantity. If, if you have got the biggest market, then you make the standards. Uh, and it's not perhaps the standard which is uh, the best. Um, but technical regulation is part of my uh, governmental affairs team, and I know that, in fact, uh, 10 years from now to the future, they are really discussing with the colleagues from all over the world on those uh, standards. And um, I think we, the, the solution is somewhere in the middle. Um, but the complexity which is behind it is not really known uh, by the public, and I think that's something, and that's, I, I would lead back to your question, how we will be able to um, distribute or to, to have success with uh, success, uh, sustainable products, and I think it's creating awareness. I think at the moment the problem is that um, people feel like um, overwhelmed of complexity and problems and things. And if you don't create a mindset which understands um, parts of the complexity and which changes or helps to change the mindset, you will never be convincing with a product. Because if the product is more expensive and... Um, um, Christoph, Christian, uh, sorry, Hubertus. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the, the consumer needs to be um, disposed, able, willing to pay the price for it. But if you don't have the awareness and you don't know why you have to pay the price, 
I think then we have a problem. So mm. I think sustainability gets along with a lot of information and change of mindset, willingness of the consumer, because without the consumer, you can't build a business case, in my mm. opinion. Mm. Christina, you want yeah, to I just wanted to add one thing, because I think there's one, <coughs> when it comes to, for example, CO2 standardization, how do you measure how much carbon is in a product? That's a huge, unanswered question. There is no international standards. I mean, we've developed something for us, um, and um, which we're using, which we're driving, but there are other standards out there, and that's also one of the problems that CBAM has. I mean, how much CO2 is in a nail that is imported from India into Europe, and that is what you have to measure, because that's what you want to tax. Mm -hmm. And there is no standard, so, um, so, so, so how, do you, how do you measure scope three? Um, if you talk about CO2 emissions, that's huge. And um, as long as there is no, and, and the second we have such a standard, however it may de um, develop, and I really hope it will be business driven in a way um, um, that, that it's developed and not um, imposed top down by governments, because then it will probably not be pragmatic. And I think it will develop, um, it needs to develop and be dynamic um, in the way it's defined. But, um, but, but, but that is like crucial in or and as soon as we have that standard, I think lots of things will kind of fall into place along the value chain for energy consumption, um, but at the moment um, doesn't exist and it really creates huge problems. Mm. I do want to bring in the audience as well, but I, yes. Sibylle so and Hubertus I, also I, I wanted to come I must say in. this backfires, the way you're, you're talking. You, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> please correct me because I'm not, uh, yeah, please do. It, it, it backfires because our doors are open, so just come yeah. join us. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm sure BASF, uh, I mean, is yeah. very active in, and as is Bosch. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, I know Bosch is, but um, saying uh, as a company, I hope uh, it will be business driven. Is of course, you know, you you have it in your hand uh, to know, come yeah. and and join and and work on the standard. Mm -hmm. And there is plenty of work on carbon uh, footprint for products, uh, but of course it's millions of products, and it's you know different, uh, probably different solutions uh, for different products, but. Um, we're talking here about solutions, and that's mm -hmm. just a general remark I wanted to make because we've been starting a little bit about the challenges in standardization. I think, um, or I want to make it clear that uh, standards are there to reduce complexity. You also talked about complexity, to to give solutions. To um, I mean, what what are standards for? They they are um, they are for comparing test methods, for measurement, for terminology, for um, making, st making products comparable and so on. So these are, they're all giving solutions and um, they're best if the companies who use them are actually involved in making them. Mm. Hubertus. Yes. I think when it comes to, to the, the sustainability footprint of products, um, we have these diversity of standards and I don't think that we can solve this problem uh, from the markets or from the, from the companies. It has to be done politically. Because um, you, have, um, you have always um, the chance of a single producer to use a different standard uh, to his own uh, advantage. And as long as uh, this is possible, uh, you won't have one single standard for, for carbon footprint. And when we... Uh, uh, to try to implement things like like uh, emission trade system also for for food chain what is i think the only solution to to cut down uh, carbon emissions from food systems uh, then you have an international standard how to measure this footprint and this uh, has to be based on an international political agreement mm. not yeah. on company initiatives mm. i um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there goes my moderation um, but please <laughs> natalie if, if i may yeah. Um, I think I, I fully agree with you, but I think <clears throat> it's a question of homologization uh, or certification because you need to make a reality check with the industry. Mm. It's impossible without the consultancy of the industry to bundle all the interests. And that's what's happening at the moment. I think we're really suffering, especially in the EU, from think tanks that think, <laughs> as the, the name uh, says, without making the reality check that 
you can implement things, and that's against society, that's against the consumer, that's against the industry, and in the end, you need consumers who have the financial strength to pay for the sustainable products. And what's happening at the moment, it's really it's disruptive because it's risking industry at the moment. And that's why I fully agree that you need like the WTO to give the framework and to say that's now in the end what we want, what we all want, fully agree but don't do it without industrial expertise, because you are going to fail without. It's not you <laughs> that is failing, but I think that's really the, the worst problem at the moment, that we have two fractions who think that they have the better um, idea on something, and you need to debate on it, and in the end you have got the result, and that probably can work. Yeah, so we need no, no, no. We do need to hear from the thinker on the yeah. from the think tankler thinker. <laughs> I'm, 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 so, I'm so sorry about being part of the, the the problem in this case, maybe. But um, I wanted to urge, uh, also push back against the idea of accepting a 2.0 degree scenario because that that is still. Uh, um, undetermined. Ten years ago, we were looking at a six-degree scenario, but IPCC projections show that we're, I mean, 2.0, we're still reasonably optimistic, but I think we've done a pretty significant level of deployment for renewables within the past decade, especially with the accomplishments from COP28, the triple up and double down targets. I mean, this is a sectoral target covering power and seeing all of the price breakthroughs in terms of batteries and EVs and all of these things. I really think that it's whether or not we hit 2.0, or I hope we're well below that, but I think that the conversation of seeing that it's acceptable that we're going to exceed past it, I think that's not, I think that that's still undetermined. I think that there's still a lot of room to have a conversation about that. I hope so. But uh, <laughs> yeah, me, me as well. But I think um, going back to the, the conversation of standards, I think the European Union and the North American markets are a huge segment of the global economy, but they're not where most of the growth is happening. Most of the growth is happening within Africa, within Latin America, within Southeast Asia, and South Asia, Central Asia. So how do we get these countries involved? Well, other than China, how do we get these countries to buy into the standards? And I think this is a really, really interesting conversation because the US and EU, if they just enforce standards that are even agreed on the transatlantic level, then how do you make sure you're selling products to other, other, other countries? How do you get them interested in being compliant with your standards? And this is trying to make sure that your standards that you're developing are at least enforceable in jurisdictions or other jurisdictions are interested in adopting these standards and making sure that they're meeting them as well. And this is where I think it's a really, really interesting opportunity for the, to go back to the European Union's uh, investigation into anti-subsidy uh, uh, the anti-subsidy investigation into Chinese electric vehicles, is there's a lot of other countries that are really interested in standing up to China on trade, especially around green tech. Within the EV space, Brazil, for example, uh, recently launched uh, some investigation into Chinese electric vehicles. So I think, and, and there are other countries that are kind of following this path. So I do think there is a lot of opportunity for countries like the United States, Germany, and the EU more broadly to work together and to, to not become protectionist because you know there are provisions of the IRA that do that are, that do kind of veer in this way, but can try and find some way to bring the fragments or fractions of the uh, the existing WTO system, the existing trade system, by getting other major emerging markets on the same page by standing up to China. And this isn't to entirely decouple from China, but it's able to, to use trade policy and push back a bit, rather than just becoming protectionist and isolationist, and also rather than just being run over by Chinese green tech. Because I think it, there, is, there is a way to find a balance, and it's kind of trying to find a balance between standing up to China, but also being willing to, to deal with China. Because being too hawkish on this position as well is not exactly ideal either. And I think that, yeah, so, so this is my, my thinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think we only have time Agreed. for a, a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so please come on in, raise your hand. And again, don't be shy. I know that a lot of you are working on sustainability issues. And I know that also a lot of you are interested in standards. They are all tired. Ah, uh, there, there, there they come. First Annika and then Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the EU and sustainability, but also standardization, the EU just passed the AI Act, which kind of pushed forward this whole question of AI and sustainability. But what I'm wondering is, for AI, it's pretty hard to get substantial data, and I'm my question would be how can we 
push forward standardization regarding AI and sustainability while having not really a lot of data and with companies that kind of not share this data, what would be your way forward? Gosh, Annika, hardball in the, in the <laughs> end. And over to Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, just, yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert in your field. So uh, with great interest, I understand uh, the, the, the width and the depths of complexity. Going back to Stormy's um, ambition at the very beginning, so how to um, elevate this to a meta, to a type of meta level, so we understand how the solution can look, uh, can look like. I like the notion of, that was made a couple of times, a business case. So meaning that for small uh, enterprises, medium enterprises, large caps, it, it all needs to be the same. It needs to be, there needs to be a payback. There needs, it, it needs to come natural as part of a business case, meaning it cannot be preventive or prohibitive from competitiveness to act according to those rules. How do we get there? Thank you, because that was also my last ending question. <laughs> so with this, um, I hand it back to our panelists. And um, Hubertus, maybe you can start us yes. off. Yes, it's, it's a really good question. I, am, I have no clue about AI, so I, <laughs> I start with this question. We, um, we had a commission in, in Germany about the future of agriculture, and uh, uh, the outcome of this commission was a, was a report, and one of the main, main outcomes of this report was that the, um, the sustainability transition of food systems only can happen when everything to do to achieve this transition has to be economically attractive for every farmer, for every person in the food chain, and also for the consumer. And you ask, how can we achieve this? Uh, our story is that we say we need public money to make this true, to, to make this a business case, but the amount of public money we need to create these business cases is much lower than the amount we have to pay when we do nothing and stay in the way we uh, are used to and risk climate change uh, above 2.0 or 3 degrees and, and have all this pollution we have today. And so, okay, it's, it's not a really uh, smart story, but it works with public money, but it's cheaper than doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sibylle. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm trying to address your, <laughs> your question. Um, the connection between AI, circular economy, and standardization. I mean, you've been asking about data. I'm not quite sure how, um, um, if my answer will satisfy you, but the, um, the way we, in, at Dean at least, we um, start in a new technology field or a new field like circular economy, we um, invite stakeholders. And in both fields, we have actually, um, we're very successful in, in in uh, inviting hundreds of stakeholders that came to us and worked with us on what we call standardization roadmap. So that means for both AI and circular economy and smart farming, in fact, and also currently hydrogen, um, we look uh, with stakeholders at um, what is already there in standards that help um, for proceeding that technology um, and what is still missing. So we find the necessities uh, for people then to, to work on standards. And um, this, is, you know, this, this can be found on our homepage, and it's, it's probably quite interesting reading to see you know, what, what is there already and what can be worked with and where um, extra work or where the, the work is going to. Um, and with AI, we, we, I think we talked with, about that um, yesterday also, the, um, that the AI Act is now uh, ahead. And this is one example of, of many examples in the EU where there's a pretty neat um, division of labor between the regulator um, and private standardization. So the regulator sets the requirements, the central requirements, the level of protection, what have you, and then tells us, the private standardization organizations, to 
together with our stakeholders, the experts obviously, to make standards that give the solutions. And we are starting work on AI and have already started, obviously, on circular economy. Thank you so much, Christina. <coughs> Christina. Okay. Um, I think the way to the business case is, first of all, to be for, for the regulators to be less prescriptive. Because I think business will find a way, if you set us goals, um, if you tell us we need to be carbon neutral by, and I mean, it's 2040, 2050, um, business will find a way because we are innovative, we have, ca we, we have cash, um, we will innovate, um, but what we need is tech openness, and we don't have technological openness, at least not in Europe, um, which is why um, I personally think that the IRA um, is going the right way because it is, it, it sets goals, it gives... Oper it, it, it subsidizes operating expenditures, so actually the business case, um, whereas um, the EU um, subsidizes iron in the ground, um, it, it subsidizes certain technologies, it prescribes which, which, which technologies um, can be subsidized, and then we, then, then, then we build electrolyzers in, in Nutrixhafen for, with lots of public money, and so we try out the technology here, but in the end, this will not produce a single ton of hydrogen, which is competitive, due to the energy prices that we have currently in Europe. And that's crazy. So, I mean, let, 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 us, let, let's t let us take the risk for the technology, let us do the bets um, on what will finally drive sustainability, and, and then kind of open us, have market pool measures in a way that we can, uh, that incentivize the products. So um, tax incentives or operating expenditures, um, um, maybe also innovation grants for, for, some, for something. But again, technologically as open as possible, because I don't know that regulators have the right way. EVs, yes, are probably the right way. Are they really? I don't know. Um, so, um, and, but, but we will never know, because at least um, in Europe, um, we said that's the only way. And um, we're not in the EV business in that way, but it's just one of the. It's, 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 no, I know, but it's just one of the, the one of the crazy things um, where, where we say, well, that's the way. Do they know? I don't know. So um, openness, <laughs> um, pull measures, oh, and then I forgot infrastructure. If they want to put money in somewhere, then in infrastructure, because that is where it's roads, it's glass fiber, and it's electricity networks. That's where public money needs to go because if we have world-class infrastructure, investments will come. That's what pulled us here out of the, uh, after the war. That's what pulled South Korea um, and um, had, their, had their growth drive. And that's where we're losing out at the moment. And the second we have world-class infrastructure again, that's the rivers of the past, that's the, the, the Roman, what, what was it, Via, via Appia, um, and um, that, that's actually what pulls trade. Thank so, um, so much. that would be my way to more sustainable business case. Thank you so much, Natalie, Natalie your sustainable business case. I think it's up to case. me to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I dare um, to answer the question on the AI Act. And um, I think you alluded to the Chinese project, the screening projects, uh, where uh, we see a large competi competition on... Um, screening lots of data without the permission of the data owner. And I think the AI Act doesn't say that you can't use um, data, um, but it gives standards, but not technical standards, but perhaps somehow um, either technical standards to and I think that's the key word to make transparent what's going to happen with the data. And um, I think that's a key question as well to give the faith to the users to contribute or to, be, to deliver their data in order to make them accessible for use of AI. I think that's something which is very important in Europe because I think it's a question or a matter of trust and it's a question as well, perhaps it's a label or it's a way of making transparent that for some products uh, AI is used. Um, and I have got one anecdote on it because 
Uh, I went to a conference where uh, we had a soft drink and it was labeled with, uh, made with AI. It was disgusting, by the way, but I think this has nothing to do with the AI which was used for it. But I think that's important for the user and that's why we have this kind of legislation in Europe. Because I think we, we depart from another, um, from another side and we don't take data without asking the data owner. I think we try to build trust to make the owner giving us uh, its data. At least that's how mm. our company deals with it, because if you imagine mm. automotive driving without, without uh, tons of data, which can be um, processed with AI as well, I think we have to make it transparent, but if we wouldn't use those data, we wouldn't be able to have uh, real-time automated driving. So I think it gets together if you want to be a competitive industry. Thank you so much. And last but not least, you've been waiting very patiently. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you for the floor. I really wanted to build off the, the comment to invest in infrastructure, but I, you forgot to mention ports. Import, ports are important. Uh, sorry yeah, for that's that. True. But uh, <laughs> especially in the case of offshore wind, I mean, European <laughs> offshore wind companies are world leaders in many, many regards, but because they hadn't been supported uh, as needed, they're not as competitive as they once were globally. I mean, they're, they're losing out to China in African markets, in the Gulf markets, in uh, Southeast Asia, and potentially in Latin America on the horizon. So I do think there has to be a degree of strategic support for industries that that do offer a lot, and it, it's about finding the balance and what that support mechanism looks like. I think finding a support mechanism that is, is as least onerous as possible, but without being uh, too wasteful with public funding as well, because you do want to encourage that that fiscal discipline and, and to, to spur competition, but you also want to be fair competition. And this is where I think that I, I go back to the example with with, uh, with Chinese EVs in the case of Brazil and other countries coming along, is how do you get countries to observe the standards that you really want to enforce? How do you get them to get buy-in? And I think it's about showing uh, uh, other markets that, that there is um, there is ground to be gained by, you know, by standing up to China, not to, I mean, referring to China a lot here, but I think that there, this is, a, there is, there is plenty for them to gain from gaining value. And this is uh, something you can see within the, the German climate foreign policy strategy, the German national security strategy, and other strategic documents that talk about creating um, fair partnerships that are just and et cetera, or even you can even see it within uh, US partnerships that are, are coming across uh, in different countries within Africa about kind of creating value within these countries as well and trying to have different, different kinds of relationships than they had previously had. And I think this is one way to get other countries to be a little more on board with, uh, with standards so that they, they can get some value of it rather than just being an extractive zone. But this goes into a much more complicated space than just transatlanticism. But within the transatlantic space, I do think there can be some kind of, I mean, the JHPS, so the Just Energy Transition Partnership, are, it's, they're not as being as successful as they could have been. But this is one example where you can have government partnership across the Atlantic to try and create a new partnership or a new, new alternative development model for, for other countries. But this goes beyond, slightly beyond the scope of trade. But I, I, think, it, I think it's important to try to find a buy-in to make other governments and outside of China, the Europe and the United States to have buy-in to, to support the existing systems that uh, honor kind of tr uh, standards and rules that are set within the international system that exists. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much. There are so many other issues we uh, could, could have talked about. It turned a little bit into a standard setting uh, panel. <laughs> Sibylle, what did you do? <laughs> but it is such an important aspect, um, both nationally, transatlantically and internationally. Um, there are other aspects we, we could have and should have probably brought in. We are going to do that next time talking about also education and the labor market and these aspects. I know that it's really important for the um, agriculture sector, but certainly also for production. Um, and uh, we keep that for another time, because while all other panels were very disciplined and all other moderators were very good in keeping time, I wasn't, and I already <laughs> kept you too long up here. So thank you very, very much. For all of you, don't run out yet, because there's a closing section, and for that I want all of you in here. But first of all, give our panelists a big applause for being here and for sharing so many insights. <laughs> and we take a very quick group picture, so if you would join me up here. <coughs> Thank you.
Okay. So huddle up again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we just do it very quickly. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. So this already concludes um, our trade and tech conference. Um, and I certainly hope that we are going to do it next year again. Um, and first of all, I want to um, express a really big thank you to our host, uh, the Landesvertretung Baden-Württemberg. And there are so many people to thank. Um, so first of all, I thank the organization and policy team. So where are you? Can you come up and join me here on the stage? Where are they? <laughs> So maybe they thought that it's going to come a little bit later. Anyways, so I also thank the, um, uh, all those people um, up there in the regie and also um, the technical team. That was really fantastic that we didn't have any glitches. So thank you very much. And although they are also not in the room, um, I want to thank all of those um, who you um, do not see so much, but who make um, our whole um, conference and life really work. Um, and, and those are all those who cooked for us and who did the service and um, who were so nice um, to serve us for the whole one, one and a half day. So also thank you very, very much to them uh, as well. I also want to thank um, our supporters and sponsors. Um, so thank you very, very much uh, to, the, um, to, to Bosch, the US Embassy, Meta, Microsoft, BASF, the Friedrich Naumann Stiftung, SAP, Association um, of the German Trade Fair Industry, Allianz, um, Adalan AI, and Dean. And there are many others who are supporting the Aspen Institute, um, both from the government side as well as the uh, business side, and also our members um, of the the Aspen Institute, both here in Germany as well as in the United States. Um, one of them is sitting right there. Um, he is um, chairing the Friends of Aspen United States. Um, so if you are convinced that what we do might make sense, um, we are wide open um, for new members. Um, so talk to us or talk to our friends um, and let us tell you a little bit about, a little more what we do, because we do have lots of programs these big conferences are just one part of it, but we also do smaller um, discussion rounds where we bring together different actors um, in, a, in a trustful manner to find uh, new solutions. And I also want to thank our media partners. Um, I want to thank um, Internationale Politik Quarterly, Tagesspiegel, Background Cybersecurity, and certainly also um, Politico. So, and who I really also very, very much want to thank is um, my team, because they worked I mean, so hard to put, this, uh, to put this up and on the ground. So my digital team, Molly and um, Driss and Annika. So please join me up here. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, just, just, just a second. So this is the inner circle. We are going <laughs> to expand it in a second. But I want to know from you, how was it? Good. <laughs> oh, do we have a mic? Molly, any, any personal highlight? <laughs> we didn't it talk just, about this before. It, it was all just so amazing. It's hard to pick one moment that really stood out above the rest. Um, obviously, for me, a personal moment was the debate yesterday, uh, jumping in at the last minute and getting the chance to stand on stage and kind of seeing what all this looks like from this perspective uh, was really great and a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Molly. Annika, your personal highlight? Um, I will say a personal, very unprofessional highlight, but of course, the Maultaschen. <laughs> <laughs> um, working with an incredible team. I mean, it's, it's us really, uh, it's not just us, that's the thing we have. Uh, it's an all-hands effort to put this thing together. So uh, thank you to all, everyone from Stormy, of mm -hmm. course, from all of us to mm -hmm. our interns. Uh, we needed all of you guys, and I hope this worked out for 
the best of all of us, and yeah. uh, we had a great conference together. Thank you. So these three are the more seniors in our team, but what Espen also stands for um, is um, having um, very, really very engaged and very enthusiastic um, uh, team members who are still studying while working also for us, which is sometimes quite a challenge, especially if you have to do these big conferences. And that's why I wanted to give Pablo and Emma um, an extra opportunity to come up here, because I think um, you are really, come on up here, um, lighthouses <laughs> in doing it all. <laughs> in doing it all. Um, and with this, I want to ask, the, I mean, it's all in team effort, the whole of Aspen team to come up here. So come on up. All, all our interns, our assistants, those who work on our agriculture team, raise your hand, Katja. Um, <laughs> those who work on our labs of democracy, raise your hand. Uh, Emily, yeah, 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 yeah you, you did. Our Balkans team. There she is, um, those who make the, the whole team running. Where is Katrin? There she is. Um, and also, um, as I said, our interns. Raise your hand. <laughs> That's them. So this is, this is Aspen. This is what, uh, what we stand for. It's an amazing team. I'm just so proud. <laughs> and with this, give them a big applause. <laughs> So there is still some, if I'm not mistaken, something to drink out there. So stay a little, mingle, um, have a drink, um, enjoy the evening. Um, and that concludes um, our German-American Trade and Tech Conference. And I hope to see you soon again. So. <laughs>